Chapter One of the Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One The Affair at Tavora. It is established beyond doubt that Mr. Butler was drunk at the time. This rests upon the evidence of Sergeant Flanagan and the troopers who accompanied him, and it rests upon Mr. Butler's own word, as we shall see. And let me add here and now that however wild and irresponsible a rascal he may have been, yet by his own lights he was a man of honor, incapable of falsehood, even though it were calculated to save his skin. I do not deny that Sir Thomas Picton has described him as a thieving blackguard. But I am sure that this was merely the downright, rather extravagant manner of censure peculiar to that distinguished general, and that those who have taken the expression at its purely literal value have been lacking at once in charity and in knowledge of the caustic, uncompromising terms of speech of General Picton, whom Lord Wellington, you will remember, called a rough, foul-mouthed devil. In further extenuation, it may truthfully be urged that the whole hideous and odious affair was the result of a misapprehension, although I cannot go so far as one of Lieutenant Butler's apologists and accept the view that he was the victim of a deliberate plot on the part of his too genial host at Regoa. That is a misconception easily explained. This host's name happened to be Sousa, and the apologist in question has very rashly leapt at the conclusion that he was a member of the notoriously intriguing family of which the chief members were the principal Sousa of the Council of Regency at Lisbon and the Chevalier Sousa, Portuguese minister to the court of St. James. Unacquainted with Portugal, our apologist was evidently in ignorance of the fact that the name of Sousa is almost as common in that country as the name of Smith in this. He may also have been misled by the fact that Principal Sousa did not neglect to make the utmost capital out of the affair, thereby increasing the difficulties with which Lord Wellington was already contending as a result of incompetence and deliberate malice on the part both of the ministry at home and of the administration in Lisbon. Indeed, but for these factors it is unlikely that the affair could ever have taken place at all if there had been more energy on the part of Mr. Percival and the members of the cabinet, if there had been less bad faith and self-seeking on the part of the opposition, Lord Wellington's campaign would not have been starved as it was, and if there had been less bad faith and self-seeking of an even more stupid and flagrant kind on the part of the Portuguese Council of Regency, the British expeditionary force would not have been left without the stipulated supplies and otherwise hindered at every step. Lord Wellington might have experienced the mental agony of Sir John Moore under similar circumstances fifteen months earlier. That he did suffer, and was to suffer yet more, his correspondence shows. But his iron will prevented that suffering from disturbing the equanimity of his mind. The Council of Regency, in its concern to court popularity with the aristocracy of Portugal, might balk his measures by its deliberate supineness. Echoes might reach him of the voices at St. Stephen's that loudly dubbed his dispositions rash, presumptuous, and silly. Catch halfpenny journalists at home, and men of the stamp of Lord Grey might exploit their abysmal military ignorance in reckless criticism and censure of his operations. He knew what a passionate storm of anger and denunciations had arisen from the opposition when he had been raised to the peerage some months earlier, after the glorious victory of Talavera, and how, that victory notwithstanding, it had been proclaimed that his conduct of the campaign was so incompetent as to deserve, not reward, but punishment, and he was aware of the growing unpopularity of the war in England, knew that the government, ignorant of what he was so laboriously preparing, was chafing at his inactivity of the past few months, so that a member of the cabinet wrote to him exasperatedly, incredibly, and fatuously, for God's sake, do something, anything, so that blood be spilt. A heart less stout might have been broken, 
a genius less mighty stifled in this evil tangle of stupidity incompetence and malignity that sprang up and flourished about him on every hand a man less single-minded must have succumbed to exasperation thrown up his command and taken ship for home inviting some of his innumerable critics to take his place at the head of the troops and give free rein to the military genius that inspired their critical dissertations wellington however had been rightly termed of iron and never did he show himself more of iron than in those trying days of eighteen ten stern but with a passionless sternness he pursued his way towards the goal he had set himself allowing no criticism no censure no invective so much as to give him pause in his majestic progress unfortunately the lofty calm of the commander-in-chief was not shared by his lieutenants the light division was quartered along the river aguda watching the spanish frontier beyond which marshal ney was demonstrating against ciudad rodrigo and for lack of funds its fiery-tempered commander sir robert crawford found himself at last unable to feed his troops exasperated by these circumstances sir robert was betrayed into an act of rashness he seized some church plate at pinhell that he might convert it into rations it was an act which considering the general state of public feeling in the country at the time might have had the gravest consequences and sir robert was subsequently forced to do penance and afford redress that however is another story i but mention the incident here because the affair of tavora with which i am concerned might be taken to have arisen directly out of it and sir robert's behaviour might be construed as setting an example and thus as affording yet another extenuation of lieutenant butler's offence our lieutenant was sent upon a foraging expedition into the valley of the upper duaro at the head of half a troop of the eighth dragoons two squadrons of which were attached at the time to the light division to be more precise he was to purchase and bring into pinhell a hundred head of cattle intended some for slaughter and some for draught his instructions were to proceed as far as regoa and there report himself to one bartholomew beersley a prosperous and influential english wine-grower whose father had acquired considerable vineyards in the duaro he was reminded of the almost hostile dispositions of the peasantry in certain districts warned to handle them with tact and to suffer no straggling on the part of his troopers and advised to place himself in the hands of mr beersley for all that related to the purchase of the cattle let it be admitted at once that had sir robert crawford been acquainted with mr butler's feather-brained irresponsible nature he would have selected any officer rather than our lieutenant to command that expedition but the irish dragoons had only lately come to pinhell and the general himself was not immediately concerned lieutenant butler set out on a blustering day of march at the head of his troopers accompanied by cornet o'rourke and two sergeants and at pesquera he was further reinforced by a portuguese guide they found quarters that night at Ervadoza and early on the morning they were in the saddle again riding along the heights above the cachoa de valeria through which the yellow swollen river swirled and foamed along its rocky way the prospect formidable even in the full bloom of fruitful and luxuriant summer was forbidding and menacing now as some imagined gorge of the nether regions the towering granite heights along the turgid stream were shrouded in mist and sweeping rain and from the leaden heavens overhead the downpour was of a sullen and merciless steadiness starting at every step a miniature torrent to go swell the roaring waters in the gorge and drenching the troop alike in body and spirit ahead swathed to the chin in his blue cavalry cloak the water streaming from his leather helmet rode lieutenant butler cursing the weather the country the light division and everything else that occurred to him as contributing to his present discomfort beside him astride of a mule rode the portuguese guide in a caped cloak of thatched straw which made him look for all the world like a bottle of his native wine in its straw sheath conversation between the two was out of the question for the guide spoke no english and the lieutenant's knowledge of portuguese was very far from conversational 
Presently the ground sloped, and the troop descended from the heights by a road flanked with dripping pine woods, black and melancholy, that for a while screened them off from the remainder of the sodden world. Thence they emerged near the head of the bridge that spanned the swollen river, and led them directly into the town of Regoa, through the mud and clay of the deserted, narrow, unpaved streets, the dragoons squelched their way, under a super-deluge, for the rain was now reinforced by steady and overwhelming sheets of water, descending on either side from the gutter-shaped tiles that roofed the houses. Inquisitive faces showed here and there behind the blurred windows. Odd doors were opened that a peasant family might stare in questioning wonder, and perhaps in some concern, at the sodden pageant that was passing. But in the streets themselves the troopers met no living thing, all the world having scurried to shelter from the pitiless downpour. Beyond the town they were brought by their guide to a walled garden, and halted at a gateway. Beyond this could be seen a fair white house set in the foreground of the vineyards that rose in terraces up the hillside, until they were lost from sight in the lowering veils of mist carved on the granite lintel of that gateway the lieutenant beheld the inscription bartholomew beersley seventeen forty four and knew himself at his destination at the gates of the son or grandson he knew not which nor cared of the original tenant of that wine farm mr beersley however was from home the lieutenant was informed of this by mr beersley's steward a portly, genial, rather priestly gentleman in smooth black broadcloth, whose name was Souza, a name which, as I have said, has given rise to some misconceptions. Mr. Beersley himself had lately left for England, there to wait until the disturbed state of Portugal should be happily repaired. He had been a considerable sufferer from the French invasion under Soult, and none may blame him for wishing to avoid a repetition of what already he had undergone, especially now that it was rumored that the emperor in person would lead the army gathering for conquest on the frontiers. But had Mr. Beersley been at home, the dragoons could have received no warmer welcome than that which was extended to them by Fernando Souza. Greeting the lieutenant in intelligible English, he implored him, in the florid manner of the peninsula, to count the house and all within it his own property, and to command whatever he might desire. The troopers found accommodation in the kitchen and in the spacious hall, where great fires of pine logs were piled up for their comfort, and for the remainder of the day they abode there in various states of nakedness, relieved by blankets and straw capotes. What time the house was filled with the steam and stench of their drying garments, Rations had been short of late on the Aguda, and, in addition, their weary ride through the rain had made the men sharp-set. Abundance of food was placed before them by the solicitude of Fernando Souza, and they feasted, as they had not feasted for many months, upon roast kid, boiled rice and golden maize bread, washed down by a copious supply of a rough and not too heady wine, that the discreet and discriminating steward judged appropriate for their palats and capable of supporting some abuse akin to the treatment of the troopers in hall and kitchen but on a nobler scale was the treatment of lieutenant butler and cornet o'rourke in the dining-room for them a well-roasted turkey took the place of kid and souza went down himself to explore the cellars for a well-sunned and time-ripened duaro table wine which he vowed and our dragoons agreed with him would put the noblest burgundy to shame. And then with the dessert there was a port the like of which Mr. Butler, who was always of a nice taste in wine, and who was coming into some knowledge of port from his residence in the country, had never dreamed existed. For four and twenty hours the dragoons abode at Mr. Beersley's quinta, thanking God for the discomforts that had brought them to such comfort, feasting in this land of plenty, as only those can feast who have kept a rigid lint nor was this all the benign souza was determined that the sojourn there of these representatives of his country's deliverers should be a complete rest and holiday not for mr butler to journey to the uplands in this matter of, of a herd of bullocks fernando souza had at command a regiment of laborers who were idle at this time of year 
and whom his good nature would engage on behalf of his English guests. Let the lieutenant do no more than provide the necessary money for the cattle, and the rest should happen as by enchantment, and Sousa himself would see to it that the price was fair and proper. The lieutenant asked no better. He had no great opinion of himself as cattle dealer or cattle drover, nor did his ambitions beget in him any desire to excel as one or the other, so he was well content that his host should have the bullocks fetched to Regoa for him. The herd was driven in on the following afternoon, by when the rain had ceased, and our lieutenant had every reason to be pleased when he beheld the solid beast procured. Having dispersed the amount demanded, an amount more reasonable far than he had been prepared to pay, Mr. Butler would have set out forthwith to return to Pinhell, knowing how urgent was the need of the division, and with what impatience the choleric General Crawford would be waiting him. "'Why, so you shall, so you shall,' said the priestly soothing Sousa. "'But first you'll dine. There is good dinner. Ah, but what good dinner! That I have order, and there is wine. Ah, but you shall give me news of that wine.' Mr. Butler hesitated. Cornet O'Rourke watched him anxiously, praying that he might succumb to the temptation, and attempted suasion in the form of a murmured blessing upon Sousa's hospitality. "'Sir Robert will be impatient,' demurred the lieutenant. "'But half-hour,' protested Sousa. "'What is half-hour? And in half-hour you will have dine.' "'True,' ventured the cornet and it's the devil himself knows that we may dine again and the dinner is ready it can be served this instant it shall said Sousa with finality and pulled the bell rope mr butler never dreaming as indeed how could he that fate was taking a hand in this business gave way and they sat down to dinner henceforth you see him the sport of pitiless circumstance they dined within the half-hour, as Sousa had promised, and they dined exceedingly well. If yesterday the steward had been able, without warning of their coming, to spread at short notice so excellent a feast, conceive what had been accomplished now by preparation, emptying his fourth and final bumper of rich red duaro, Mr. Butler paid his host the compliment of a sigh, and pushed back his chair, but Sousa detained him waving a hand that trembled with anxiety, and with anxiety stamped upon his benignly rotund and shaven countenance. "'An instant yet,' he implored. "'Mr. Beersley would never pardon me. Did I let you go without what he call a stirrup-cup to keep you from the ills that lurk in the wind of the Sierra? A glass but one of that port you tasted yesterday. I say but a glass.' yet I hope you will do the honor to the bottle. But a glass at least, at least. He implored it almost with tears. Mr. Butler had reached that state of delicious torpor in which to take the road is the last agony. But duty was duty, and Sir Robert Crawford had the fiend's own temper. Torn thus between consciousness of duty and the weakness of the flesh, he looked at O'Rourke. O'Rourke, a cherubic fellow, who had for his years a very pretty taste in wine, returned the glance with a moist eye and licked his lips. "'In your place I should let myself be tempted,' says he. "'It's an excellent wine, and ten minutes more or less is no great matter.' The lieutenant, discovering a middle way which permitted him to take a prompt decision creditable to his military instincts, but revealing a disgraceful, though quite characteristic selfishness, "'Very well,' he said. "'Leave Sergeant Flanagan and ten men to wait for me, O'Rourke, "'and do you set out at once with the rest of the troop, "'and take the cattle with you. "'I shall overtake you before you have gone very far.' "'O'Rourke's crestfallen air stirred the sympathetic Sousa's pity. "'But, Captain,' he besought, "'will you not allow the lieutenant?' "'Mr. Butler cut him short. "'Duty,' said he sententiously, "'is duty.' Be off, O'Rourke. And O'Rourke, clicking his heels viciously, saluted and departed. Came presently the bottles in a basket, 
Not one, as Sousa had said, but three, and when the first was done, Butler reflected that since O'Rourke and the cattle were already well upon the road, there need no longer be any hurry about his own departure. A herd of bullocks does not travel very quickly, and even with a few hours' start in a forty-mile journey is easily overtaken by a troop of horse traveling without encumbrance. You understand, then, how easily our lieutenant yielded himself to the luxurious circumstances, and disposed himself to savor the second bottle of that nectar distilled from the very sunshine of the Duaro. The phrase is his own. The steward produced a box of very choice cigars, and although the lieutenant was not an habitual smoker, he permitted himself on this exceptional occasion to be further tempted. Stretched in a deep chair, beside the roaring fire of pine logs, he sipped and smoked and drowsed away the greater part of that wintry afternoon. Soon the third bottle had gone the way of the second, and Mr. Beersley's steward, being a man of extremely temperate habit, it follows that most of the wine had found its way down the lieutenant's thirsty gullet. It was perhaps a more potent vintage than he had at first suspected, and as the torpor produced by the dinner and the earlier, fuller wine was wearing off, it was succeeded by an exhilaration that played havoc with the few wits that Mr. Butler could call his own. The steward was deeply learned in wines and wine-growing, and in very little besides, Consequently, the talk was almost confined to that subject in its many branches, and he could be interesting enough, like all enthusiasts. To a fresh burst of praise from Butler of the ruby vintage to which he had been introduced, the steward presently responded with a sigh. Indeed, as you say, Captain, a great wine. But we had a greater. Impossible, by God, swore Butler with a hiccup. You may say so, but it is the truth. We had a greater, a wonderful, clear vintage. It was of the year 1798, a famous year on the Duaro, the quite most famous year that we have ever known. Mr. Beersley sells some pipes to the monks at Tavora, who have bottled it and keep it. I beg him at the time not to sell knowing the value it must come to have one day. But he sell all the time. Ah, oh, Mutius! The steward clasped his hands and raised rather prominent eyes to the ceiling, protesting to his maker against his master's folly. He say we have plenty, and now... He spread fat hands in a gesture of despair. And now we have none. Some sons of dogs of French who came with Marshal Soult Happened this way on a forage, they discover the wine, and they guzzle it like pigs. He swore, and his benignity was eclipsed by wrathful memory. He heaved himself up in a passion. Think of that so priceless vintage, drink like hogwash, as Mr. Beersley say, by those goddamn French swine. Not a drop, not a spoonful remain. But the monks at Tavora still have much of what they buy, I'm told. They treasure it for they know good wine. All priests know good wine. Ah, yes, goddamn. He fell into deep reflection. Lieutenant Butler stirred and became sympathetic. San infernal shame, said he indignantly. I'll no forget it when I meet the French. Then he too fell into reflection. He was a good Catholic, and moreover a Catholic who did not take things for granted, the sloth and self-indulgence of the clergy in Portugal, being his first glimpse of conventuals in Latin countries, had deeply shocked him. The vows of a monastic poverty that was kept carefully behind the walls of the monastery offended his sense of propriety, that men who had vowed themselves to pauperism, who wore coarse garments and went barefoot, should batten upon rich food and store up wines that gold could not purchase, struck him as a hideous incongruity. And the monks drink this nectar, he said aloud and laughed sneeringly. I know the breed, the fair found belly with fat cup and lined. That's your poverty stricken capuchin. Sousa looked at him in sudden alarm, 
bethinking himself that all Englishmen were heretics, and knowing nothing of subtle distinctions between English and Irish. In silence, Butler finished the third and last bottle, and his thoughts fixed themselves with increasing insistence upon a wine reputed better than this, of which there was great store in the cellars of the convent of Tavora. Abruptly he asked, "'Where's Tavora?' He was thinking, perhaps, of the comfort that such wine would bring to a company of war-worn soldiers in the valley of the Aguda. "'Some ten leagues from here,' answered Souza, and pointed to a map that hung upon the wall. The lieutenant rose and rolled a thought unsteadily across the room. He was a tall, loose-limbed fellow, blue-eyed, fair-complexioned, with a thatch of fiery red hair, excellently suited to his temperament. He halted before the map, and with legs wide apart, to afford him the steadying support of a broad basis, the course of the Duaro, fumbling about the district of Rigoa, and finally hit upon the place he sought. Why, he said, seems to me as if we should have come that way, a surer road to Pesquero than by the river. As the bird fly, said Souza, but the roads be bad, just mule tracks, while by the river the road is tolerably good. Yet, said the lieutenant, I think I shall go back that way. The fumes of the wine were mounting steadily to addle his indifferent brains. Every moment he was seeing things in proportions more and more false. His resentment against priests, who, worn to self-abnegation, hoarded good wine, while soldiers sent to keep harm from priests' fat carcasses were left to suffer cold and even hunger, was increasing with every moment. He would sample that wine at Tavora, and he would bear some of it away that his brother officers at Pinhill might sample it. He would buy it, oh yes, there should be no plundering, no irregularity, no disregard of general orders. He would buy the wine and pay for it. But himself he would fix the price, and see that the monks of Tavora made no profit out of their defenders. Thus he thought as he considered the map, presently when having taken leave of Fernando Souza, that prince of hosts, Mr. Butler was riding down through the town with Sergeant Flanagan and ten troopers at his heels. His purpose deepened and became more fierce. I think the change of temperature must have been to blame. It was a chill, bleak evening. Overhead, across a background of faded blue, scudded ragged banks of clouds, the lingering flotsam of the shattered rainstorm of yesterday, and a cavalry cloak afforded but indifferent protection against the wind that blew hard and sharp from the Atlantic. Coming from the genial warmth of Mr. Sousa's parlor into this, the evaporation of the wine within him was quickened, its fumes mounted now overwhelmingly to his brain, and from comfortably intoxicated that he had been hitherto. The lieutenant now became furiously drunk, and the transition was a very rapid one. It was now that he looked upon the business he had in hand in the light of a crusade. A sort of religious fanaticism began to actuate him. The souls of these wretched monks must be saved. The temptation to self-indulgence, which spelt perdition for them, must be removed from their midst. It was a Christian duty. He no longer thought of buying the wine and paying for it. His one aim now was to obtain possession of it, not merely a part of it, but all of it, and carry it off, thereby accomplishing two equally praiseworthy ends, to rescue a convent full of monks from damnation, and to regale the much-enduring, half-starved campaigners of the Aguda. Thus reasoned Mr. Butler, with admirable, if drunken, logic, and reasoning thus he led the way over the bridge, and kept straight on when he had crossed it, much to the dismay of Sergeant Flanagan, who, perceiving the lieutenant's condition, conceived that he was missing his way. This the sergeant ventured to point out, reminding his officer that they had come by the road along the river. So we did, said Butler shortly. But we go back by way of Tavora. They had no guide. The one who had conducted them to Rigoa had returned with O'Rourke, and although Souza had urged upon the lieutenant at parting, that he should take one of the men from the Quinta, 
Butler, with wit enough to see that this was not desirable under the circumstances, had preferred to find his way alone. His confused mind strove now to revisualize the map which he had consulted in Sousa's parlor. He discovered, naturally enough, that the task was altogether beyond his powers. Meanwhile, night was descending. They were, however, upon the mule track, which went up and round the shoulder of a hill, and by this they came at dark upon a hamlet. Sergeant Flanagan was a shrewd fellow, and perhaps the most sober man in the troop, for the wine had run very freely in Sousa's kitchen, too, and the men, whilst awaiting their commander's pleasure, had taken the fullest advantage of an opportunity that was all too rare upon that campaign. Now Sergeant Flanagan began to grow anxious. He knew the peninsula from the days of Sir John Moore, and he knew as much of the ways of the peasantry of Portugal as any man. He knew of the brutal ferocity with which the peasantry was capable. He had seen evidence more than once of the unspeakable fate of French stragglers from the retreating army of Marshal Soult. He knew of crucifixions, mutilations, and hideous abominations practiced upon them in these remote hill districts by the merciless men into whose hands they happened to fall, and he knew that it was not upon French soldiers alone that these abominations had been practiced. Some of those fierce peasants had been unable to discriminate between invader and deliverer. To them a foreigner was a foreigner, and no more. Others who were capable of discriminating were in the position of having come to look upon French and English with almost equal execration. It is true that whilst the emperor's troops made war on the maxim that an army must support itself upon the country it traverses, thereby achieving a greater mobility, since it was thus permitted to travel comparatively light, the British law was that all things requisitioned must be paid for. Wellington maintained this law in spite of all difficulties at all times with an unrelaxing rigidity, and punished with the utmost vigor those who offended against it. Nevertheless, breaches were continual. Men broke out here and there, often, be it said, under stress of circumstances for which the Portuguese were themselves responsible. Plunder and outrage took place and provoked indiscriminating rancor, with consequences at times as terrible to stragglers from the British army of deliverance as to those from the French army of oppressors. Then, too, there was the Portuguese Militia Act, recently enforced by Wellington, acting through the Portuguese government, deeply resented by the peasantry upon whom it bore, and rendering them disposed to avenge it upon such stray British soldiers as might fall into their hands. Knowing all this, Sergeant Flanagan did not at all relish this night excursion into the hill fastnesses, where at any moment, as it seemed to him, they might miss their way. After all, they were but twelve men, all told, and he accounted it a stupid thing to attempt to take a short cut across the hills for the purpose of overtaking an encumbered troop that must of necessity be moving at a very much slower pace. This was the way not to overtake, but to outdistance. Yet since it was not for him to remonstrate with the lieutenant, he kept his peace and hoped anxiously for the best. At the mean wine-shop of that hamlet, Mr. Butler inquired his way by the simple expedient of shouting, Tavora! with a strong interrogative inflection. The vintner made it plain by gestures, accompanied by a rattling musketry of incomprehensible speech, that their way lay straight ahead, and straight ahead they went, following that mule-track for some five or six miles, until it began to slope gently towards the plain again. Below them they presently beheld a cluster of twinkling lights to advertise a township. They dropped swiftly down, and in the outskirts overtook a belated bullock cart, whose ungreased axle was arousing the hillside echoes with its plangent wail. Of the vigorous young woman who marched barefoot beside it, shouldering her goad as if it were a pike staff, Mr. Butler inquired, by his usual method, if this were Tavora, to receive an answer which, though voluble, was unmistakably affirmative. Convento Dominicano was his next inquiry, made after they had gone some little way. 
The woman pointed with her goad to a massive dark building, flanked by a little church, which stood just across the square they were entering. A moment later the sergeant, by Mr. Butler's orders, was knocking upon the iron-studded main door. They waited a while in vain. None came to answer the knock. No light showed anywhere upon the dark face of the convent. The sergeant knocked again, more vigorously than before. Presently came timid, shuffling steps. A shutter opened in the door, and the grill thus disclosed was pierced by a shaft of feeble yellow light. A quavering, aged voice demanded to know who knocked. "'English soldiers!' answered the lieutenant in Portuguese. "'Open!' A faint exclamation, suggestive of dismay, was the answer. The shutter closed again with a snap. The shuffling steps retreated, and unbroken silence followed. "'Now, where the devil may this mean?' growled Mr. Butler. Drugged wits, like stupid ones, are readily suspicious. "'Where are they hatching in here, that they are afraid of luring British soldiers see? Knock again, Flanagan! Louder, man!' The sergeant beat the door with the butt of his carabine. The blows gave out a hollow echo, but evoked no more answer than if they had fallen upon the door of a mausoleum. Mr. Butler completely lost his temper. "'Seems to me that we stumbled upon a hobbit of treason. Hobbit of treason,' he repeated, as if pleased with the phrase. "'That's where it is,' and he added peremptorily, "'Break down the door.' "'But, sir,' began the sergeant in protest, greatly daring. "'Break down the door,' repeated Mr. Butler. "'Lur us be after seeing why these monks are afraid of showing us.' I've notions they're hiding more than where wine. Some of the troopers carried axes precisely against such an emergency as this. Dismounting, they fell upon the door with a will, but the oak was stout, fortified by bands of iron and great iron studs, and it resisted long. The thud of the axes and the crash of rending timbers could be heard from one end of Tavora to the other. Yet from the convent it evoked no slightest response. But presently, as the door began to yield to the onslaught, there came another sound to arouse the town. From the belfry of the little church a bell suddenly gave tongue, upon a frantic, hurried note that spoke unmistakably of alarm. Ding, 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 it went, a tocsin summoning the assistance of all true sons of Mother Church. Mr. Butler, however, paid little heed to it. The door was down at last and followed by his troopers he rode under the massive gateway into the spacious close. Dismounting there, and leaving the woeful, anxious sergeant and a couple of men to guard the horses, the lieutenant led the way along the cloisters, faintly revealed by a new-risen moon, towards a gaping doorway whence a feeble light was gleaming. He stumbled over the step into a hall, dimly lighted by a lantern swinging from the ceiling. He found a chair, mounted it, and cut the lantern down, then led the way again along an endless corridor, stone-flagged and flanked on either side by rows of cells. Many of the doors stood open, as if in silent token of the tenant's hurried flight, showing what a panic had been spread by the sudden advent of this troop. Mr. Butler became more and more deeply intrigued, more and more deeply suspicious that here all was not well. Why should a community of loyal monks take flight in this fashion from British soldiers? Bad luck to them, he growled as he stumbled on. They may hide as they will, but it's myself will run the shavelings to earth. They were brought up short at the end of that long chill gallery by closed double doors. Beyond these an organ was pealing, and overhead the clapper of the alarm bell was beating more furiously than ever. All realized that they stood upon the threshold of the chapel, and that the conventuals had taken refuge there. Mr. Butler checked upon a sudden suspicion. "'Maybe, after all, they've taken us for French,' said he. A trooper ventured to answer him. "'Best let them see we're not, before we have the whole village about our ears.' "'Damn that bell,' said the lieutenant, and added, "'Put your shoulders to the door.' Its fastenings were but crazy ones, 
and it yielded almost instantly to their pressure, yielded so suddenly that Mr. Butler, who himself had been foremost in straining against it, shot forward half a dozen yards into the chapel and measured his length upon its cold flags. Simultaneously from the chancel came a great cry, Libera nos domine, followed by a shuddering murmur of prayer. The lieutenant picked himself up, recovered the lantern that had rolled from his grasp, and lurched forward around the angle that hid the chancel from his view. There, huddled before the main altar like a flock of scared and stupid sheep, he beheld the conventuals, some two score of them, perhaps, and in the dim light of the heavy altar lamp above them he could make out the black and white habit of the Order of St. Dominic. He came to a halt, raised his lantern aloft, and called to them peremptorily. Ho there! The organ ceased abruptly, but the bell overhead went clattering on. Mr. Butler addressed them in the best French he could command. What do you fear? Why do you flee? We are friends, English soldiers, seeking quarters for the night. A vague alarm was stirring in him. It began to penetrate his obfuscated mind that perhaps he had been rash, that this forcible rape of a convent was a serious matter. Therefore he attempted this peaceful explanation. From that huddled group a figure rose, and advanced with a solemn stately grace, there was a faint swish of robes, the faint rattle of rosary beads. Something about that figure caught the lieutenant's attention sharply. He craned forward, half sobered by the sudden fear that clutched him, his eyes bulging in his face. "'I had thought,' said a gentle, melancholy woman's voice, "'that the seals of a nunnery were sacred to British soldiers.' For a moment Mr. Butler seemed to be laboring for breath. Fully sobered now, understanding of his ghastly error reached him at the gallop. "'My God!' he gasped, and incontinently turned to flee. But as he fled in horror of his sacrilege, he still kept his head turned, staring over his shoulder at the stately figure of the abbess, either in fascination or with some lingering doubt of what he had seen and heard. Running thus, he crashed headlong into a pillar, and stunned by the blow, he reeled and sank unconscious to the ground. This the troopers had not seen, for they had not lingered. Understanding on their own part the horrible blunder, they had turned even as their leader turned, and they had raced madly back the way they had come, conceiving that he followed, there was reason for their haste other than their anxiety to set a term to the sacrilege of their presence from the cloistered garden of the convent uproar reached them and the metallic voice of sergeant flanagan calling loudly for help the alarm bell of the convent had done its work the villagers were up enraged by the outrage and armed with sticks and scythes and billhooks an army of them was charging to avenge this infamy the troopers reached the close no more than in time. Sergeant Flanagan, only half understanding the reason for so much anger, but understanding that this anger was very real and very dangerous, was desperately defending the horses with his two companions against the vanguard of the assailants. There was a swift rush of the dragoons, and in an instant they were in the saddle, all but the lieutenant, of whose absence they were suddenly made conscious. Flanagan would have gone back for him, and he had, in fact, begun to issue an order with that object when a sudden surge of the swelling, roaring crowd cut off the dragoons from the door through which they had emerged. Sitting their horses, the little troop came together, their sabres drawn, solid as a rock in that angry human sea that surged about them. The moon, riding now clear overhead, irradiated that scene of impending strife. Flanagan, standing in his stirrups, attempted to harangue the mob, but he was at a loss what to say that would appease them, nor able to speak a language they could understand. An angry peasant made a slash at him with a billhook. He parried the blow on his sabre, and with the flat of it knocked his assailant senseless. Then the storm burst, and the mob flung itself upon the dragoons. 
"'Bad cess to you!' cried Flanagan. "'Will ye listen to me, ye murthering villains?' Then in despair, "'Charge!' he roared, and headed for the gateway. The troopers attempted in vain to reach it. The mob hemmed them about too closely, and then a horrid hand-to-hand -hand fight began. Under the cold light of the moon, in that garden consecrated to peace and piety, two saddles had been emptied and the exasperated troopers were slashing now at their assailants with the edge, intent upon cutting away out of that murderous press. It is doubtful if a man of them would have survived, for the odds were fully ten to one against them. To their aid came now the abbess. She stood on a balcony above and called upon the people to desist and hear her. Thence she harangued them for some moments, commanding them to allow the soldiers to depart. They obeyed with obvious reluctance, and at last a lane was opened in that solid, seething mass of angry clods. But Flanagan hesitated to pass down this lane and so depart. Three of his troopers were down by now, and his lieutenant was missing. He was exercised to resolve where his duty lay. Behind him the mob was solid, cutting off the dragoons from their fallen comrades. An attempt to go back might be misunderstood and resisted leading to a renewal of the combat, and surely in vain, for he could not doubt that the fallen troopers had been finished outright. Similarly, the mob stood as solid between him and the door that led to the interior of the convent, where Mr. Butler was lingering, alive or dead. A number of peasants had already invaded the actual building, so that in that connection, too, the sergeant concluded that there was little reason to hope that the lieutenant should have escaped the fate his own rashness had invoked. He had his remaining seven men to think of, and he concluded that it was his duty under all the circumstances to bring these off alive, and not procure their massacre by attempting fruitless quiotries. So forward, roared the voice of Sergeant Flanagan, and forward went the seven through the passage that had opened out before them, in that hooting, angry mob. Beyond the convent walls they found fresh assailants awaiting them, enemies these who had not been soothed by the gentle, reassuring voice of the abbess. But here there was more room to maneuver. Trot, the sergeant commanded, and soon that trot became a gallop. A shower of stones followed them as they thundered out of Tavora, and the sergeant himself had a lump as large as a duck egg in the middle of his head. When next day he reported himself at Pesquiera to Cornet O'Rourke, whom he overtook there. When eventually Sir Robert Crawford heard the story of the affair, he was as angry as only Sir Robert could be, to have lost four dragoons, and to have set a match to a train that might end in a conflagration was reason and to spare. How came such a mistake to be made? he inquired, a scowl upon his full red countenance. Mr. O'Rourke had been investigating, and was primed with knowledge. It appears, sir, that at Tavora there is a convent of Dominican nuns, as well as a monastery of Dominican friars. Mr. Butler will have used the word convento, which more particularly applies to the nunnery, and so he was directed to the wrong house. And you say that the sergeant has reason to believe that Mr. Butler did not survive his folly? I am afraid there can be no hope, sir. It's perhaps just as well, said Sir Robert, for Lord Wellington would certainly have had him shot. And there you have the true account of this stupid affair of Tavora, which was to produce, as we shall see, such far-reaching effects upon persons no wise concerned in it. End of chapter 1 Read by Peter Strom in Ecuador On... February 13th, 2019. Chapter 2 of The Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 The Ultimatum. News of the affair at Tavora reached Sir Terence O'Moy, the adjutant general at Lisbon, about a week later in dispatches from headquarters. 
These informed him that in the course of the humble apology and explanation of the regrettable occurrence offered by the colonel of the Eighth Dragoons in person to the mother abbess, it had transpired that Lieutenant Butler had left the convent alive, but that nevertheless he continued absent from his regiment. Those dispatches contained other unpleasant matters of a totally different nature, with which Sir Terence must proceed to deal at once, but their gravity was completely outweighed in the adjutant's mind by this deplorable affair of Lieutenant Butler's. Without wishing to convey an impression that the blunt and downright Omoy was gifted with any undue measure of shrewdness, it must nevertheless be said that he was quick to perceive what fresh thorns the occurrence was likely to throw in the path of what was already thorny enough in all conscious, what a semblance of justification it must give to the hostility of the intriguers on the Council of Regency, what a formidable weapon it must place in the hands of Principal Souza and his partisans. In itself this was enough to trouble a man in O'Moy's position, but there was more. Lieutenant Butler happened to be his brother-in-law, owned brother to O'Moy's lovely frivolous wife. Irresponsibility ran strongly in that branch of the Butler family. For the sake of the young wife whom he loved with a passionate and fearful jealousy, such as is not uncommon in a man of O'Moy's temperament, when at his age he was approaching his forty-sixth birthday, he marries a girl of half his years. The adjutant had pulled his brother-in-law out of many a difficulty, shielded him on many an occasion from the proper consequences of his uncurable rashness. This affair of the convent, however, transcended anything that had gone before, and proved altogether too much for O'Moy. It angered him as much as it afflicted him. Yet when he took his head in his hands and groaned, it was only his sorrow that he was expressing, and it was a sorrow entirely concerned with his wife. The groan attracted the attention of his military secretary, Captain Tremaine, of Fletcher's Engineers, who sat at work at a littered writing table, placed in the window recess. He looked up sharply, sudden concern in the strong young face and the steady gray eyes he bent upon his chief. The sight of O'Moy's hunched attitude brought him instantly to his feet. "'Whatever is the matter, sir?' "'It's that damn fool, Richard,' growled O'Moy. "'He's broken out again.' The captain looked relieved. "'And is that all?' O'Moy looked at him, white-faced, and in his blue eyes a blaze of that swift passion that had made his name a byword in the army. "'All?' he roared. "'You'll say it's enough, by God, when you hear what the fool's been at this time.' violation of a nunnery no less and he brought his massive fist down with a crash upon the document that had conveyed the information with a detachment of dragoons he broke into the convent of the dominican nuns at tavora one night a week ago the alarm bell was sounded and the village turned out to avenge the outrage consequences three troopers killed five peasants sabred to death, and seven other casualties. Dick himself missing and reported to have escaped from the convent, but understood to remain in hiding, so that he adds desertion to the other crime, as if that in itself were not enough to hang him. That's all, as you say, and I hope you considered enough even for Dick Butler. Bad luck to him. My God, said Captain Tremaine. I'm glad that you agree with me. Captain Tremaine stared at his chief, the utmost dismay upon his fine young face. But surely, sir, I mean, sir, if this report is correct, some explanation... He broke down, utterly at fault. To be sure there's an explanation. You may always depend upon a most elegant explanation for anything that Dick Butler does. His life is made up of mistakes and explanations. He spoke bitterly. He broke into the nunnery under a misapprehension, according to the account of the sergeant who accompanied him, 
and Sir Terence read out that part of the report. But how is that to help him, and at such a time as this, with public feeling as it is, and Wellington in his present temper about it? The provost's men are beating the country for the black guard. When they find him, it's a firing party he'll have to face. Tremaine turned slowly to the window and looked down the fair prospect of the hillside over a forest of cork oaks alive with fresh green shoots to the silver sheen of the river a mile away. The storms of the preceding week had spent their fury. The travail that had attended the birth of spring and the day was as fair as a day of June in England. Weaned forth by the general sunshine, the burgeoning of vine and fig, of olive and cork, went on apace, and the skeletons of trees, which a fortnight since had stood gaunt and bare, were already fleshed in tender green. From the window of this fine conventual house on the heights of Monsanto, above the suburb of Alcantara, where the adjutant general had taken up his quarters, Captain Tremaine stood a moment considering the panorama spread to his gaze from the red-brown roofs of Lisbon on his left, that city which boasted with Rome that it was built upon a cluster of seven hills, to the lines of embarkation that were building about the fort of St. Julian to his left. Then he turned, facing again the spacious handsome room with its heavy ecclesiastical furniture and Sir Terence, who hunched in his chair at the ponderously carved black writing-table, scowling fiercely at nothing. "'What are you going to do, sir?' he inquired. Sir Terence shrugged impatiently and heaved himself up in his chair. "'Nothing!' he growled. "'Nothing!' The interrogation, which seemed almost to cover a reproach, irritated the adjutant. "'And what the devil can I do?' he rapped. "'You've pulled Dick out of scrapes before now.' I have, that seems to have been my principal occupation, ever since I married his sister. But this time he's gone too far. What can I do? Lord Wellington is fond of you, suggested Captain Tremaine. He was your imperturbable young man, and he remained as calm now as O'Moy was excited, although by some twenty years, the adjutant's junior. There was between O'Moy and himself, as well as between Tremaine and the butler family, with which he was remotely connected, a strong friendship, which was largely responsible for the captain's present appointment as Sir Terence's military secretary. O'Boy looked at him and looked away. Yes, he agreed, but he's still fonder of law and order and military discipline, and I should only be imperiling our friendship by pleading with him for this young blackguard. The young blackguard is your brother-in-law, Tremaine reminded him. Bad luck to you, Tremaine. Don't I know it? Besides, what is there I can do? He asked again, and ended testily. Faith, man, I don't know what you're thinking of. I'm thinking of Una, said Captain Tremaine in that composed way of his, and the words fell like cold water upon the hot iron of O'Moy's anger. The man who can receive with patience a reproach, implicit or explicit, of being wanting in consideration towards his wife is comparatively rare, and never a man of O'Moy's temperament and circumstances. Tremaine's reminder stung him sharply, and the more sharply because of the strong friendship that existed between Tremaine and Lady O'Moy. That friendship had in the past been a thorn in O'Moy's flesh. In the days of his courtship, he had known a fierce jealousy of Tremaine, beholding in him for a time a rival who, with the strong advantage of youth, must in the end prevail. But when O'Moy, putting his fortunes to the test, had declared himself and been accepted by Una Butler, there had been an end to the jealousy, and the old relations of cordial friendship between the men had been resumed. O'Moy had conceived that jealousy of his to have been slain, but there had been times when from its faint, uneasy stirrings he should have taken warning, that it did no more than slumber. Like most warm-hearted, generous, big-natured men, O'Moy was of a singular humility where women were concerned, and this humility of his would often breathe a doubt lest in choosing between himself and Tremaine, Una might have been guided by her head rather than her heart, by ambition rather than affection and that in taking himself 
she had taken the man who could give her by far the more assured and affluent position. He had crushed down such thoughts as disloyal to his young wife, as ungrateful and unworthy, and at such times he would fall into self-contempt for having entertained them. Then Una herself had revived those doubts three months ago, when she had suggested that Ned Tremaine, who was then at Torres Vedras with Colonel Fletcher, was the very man to fill the vacant place of military secretary to the adjutant, if he would accept it. In the reaction of self-contempt, and in a curious surge of pride almost as perverse as his humility, O'Moy had adopted her suggestion, and thereafter, in the past three months, that is to say, the unreasonable devil of O'Moy's jealousy had slept, almost forgotten, now by a chance remark whose indiscretion Tremaine could not realize, since he did not so much as suspect the existence of that devil, he had suddenly prodded him into wakefulness. That Tremaine should show himself tender of Lady O'Moy's feelings, in a matter in which O'Moy himself must seem neglectful of them, was gall and wormwood to the adjutant. He dissembled it, however, out of a natural disinclination to appear in the ridiculous role of the jealous husband. What, he said, is the matter with you? That, he said, is a matter that you may safely leave to me. And his lips closed tightly upon the words when they were uttered. Oh, quite so, said Tremaine, no whit abashed. He persisted, nevertheless. You know Una's feelings for Dick. When I married Una, the adjutant cut in sharply, I did not marry the entire butler family. It hardened him unreasonably against Dick to have the family cause pleaded in this way. It's sick to death I am of Master Richard and his escapades. He can get himself out of this mess, or he can stay in it. You mean that you'll not lift a hand to help him? Devil a finger, said O'Moy, and Tremaine, looking straight into the adjutant's faintly smoldering blue eyes, beheld there a fierce and rancorous determination which he was at a loss to understand, but which he attributed to something outside his own knowledge that must lie between O'Moy and his brother-in-law. I am sorry, he said gravely, since that is how you feel. It is to be hoped that Dick Butler may not survive to be taken. The alternative would weigh so cruelly upon Una that I do not care to contemplate it. And who the devil asks you to contemplate it? snapped O'Moy. I am not aware that it is any concern of yours at all. My dear O'Moy, it was an exclamation of protest, something between pain and indignation, under the stress of which Tremaine stepped entirely outside of the official relations that prevailed between himself and the adjutant. And the exclamation was accompanied by such a look of dismay and wounded sensibilities that O'Moy, meeting this, and noting the honest manliness of Tremaine's bearing and countenance, was there and then the victim of reaction. His warm-hearted and impulsive nature made him at once profoundly ashamed of himself. He stood up, a tall martial figure, and his ruggedly handsome shaven countenance reddened under its tan. He held out a hand to Tremaine. My dear boy, I beg your pardon. It's so utterly annoyed I am that the savage in me will be breaking out. Sure, it isn't as if it were only this affair of Dick's. That is almost the least part of the unpleasantness contained in this dispatch. Here, in God's name, read it for yourself, and judge for yourself whether it's in human nature to be patient under so much. With a shrug and a smile to show that he was entirely mollified, Captain Tremaine took the papers to his desk and sat down to con them. As he did so, his face grew more and more grave. Before he had reached the end, there was a tap at the door. An orderly entered with the announcement that Dom Miguel Forges had just driven up to Monsanto to wait upon the adjutant general. Ha! said O'Moy shortly, and exchanged a glance with his secretary. Show the gentleman up. As the orderly withdrew, Tremaine came over and placed the dispatch on the adjutant's desk. He arrives very opportunely, he said. So opportunely as to be suspicious, bedad, said O'Moy. He had brightened suddenly, his Irish blood quickening at the immediate prospect of strife which this visit boded. 
May the devil admire me, but there's a warm morning in store for Mr. Forges, Ned. Shall I leave you? By no means. The door opened, and the orderly admitted Miguel Forges, the Portuguese Secretary of State. He was a slight dapper gentleman, all in black, from his silk stockings and steel-buckled shoes to his satin stock. His keen aquiline face was swarthy, and the razor had left his chin and cheeks blue-black. His sleek hair was iron-gray. A portentous gravity invested him this morning as he bowed with profound deference, first to the adjutant, and then to the secretary. "'Your excellencies,' he said. He spoke an English that was smooth and fluent for all its foreign accent. "'Your excellencies, this is a terrible affair.' To what affair will your excellency be alluding? wondered O'Moy. Have you not received news of what has happened at Tavora? Of the violation of a convent by a party of British soldiers? Of the fight that took place between these soldiers and the peasants who went to succor the nuns? Oh, and is that all? said O'Moy. For a moment I imagined your excellency referred to other matters. I have news of more terrible affairs than the convent business with which to entertain you this morning. That, if you will pardon me, Sir Terence, is quite impossible. You may think so, but you shall judge, bedad. A chair, Dom Miguel. The Secretary of State sat down crossed his knees and placed his hat in his lap. The other two resumed their seats, O'Moy leaning forward, his elbows on the writing table, immediately facing Signor Forges. First, however, he said, to deal with this affair of Tavora. The Council of Regency will, no doubt, have been informed of all the circumstances. You will be aware, therefore, that this very deplorable business was the result of a misapprehension, and that the nuns of Tavora might very well have avoided all this trouble had they behaved in a sensible, reasonable manner. If instead of shutting themselves up in the chapel and ringing the alarm bell, the mother abbess or one of the sisters had gone to the wicket and answered the demand of admittance from the officer commanding the detachment, he would instantly have realized his mistake and withdrawn. What does your excellency suggest was this mistake? inquired the secretary. You have had your report, sir, and surely it was complete. You must know that he conceived himself to be knocking at the gates of the monastery of the Dominican fathers. Can your excellency tell me what was this officer's business at the monastery of the Dominican fathers? quoth the secretary, his manner frostily hostile. I am without information on that point, O'Moy admitted. No doubt because the officer in question is missing, as you will also have been informed. But I have no reason to doubt that, whatever his business may have been, it was concerned with the interests which are common alike to the British and the Portuguese nation. That is a charitable assumption, Sir Terence. Perhaps you will inform me, Don Miguel, of the uncharitable assumption which the principal Souza prefers, snapped O'Moy, whose temper began to simmer. A faint color kindled in the cheeks of the Portuguese minister, but his manner remained unruffled. I speak, sir, not with the voice of principal Souza, but with that of the entire Council of Regency and the council has formed the opinion which your own words confirm that his excellency lord wellington is skilled in finding excuses for the misdemeanors of the troops under his command that said o'moy who would never have kept his temper in control but for the pleasant consciousness that he held a hand of trumps with which he would presently overwhelm this representative of the Portuguese government. That is an opinion for which the council may presently like to apologize, admitting its entire falsehood. 
Senor Forges started as if he had been stung. He uncrossed his black silk legs and made as if to rise. Falsehood, sir, he cried in a scandalized voice. It is as well that we should be plain, so as to be avoiding all misconceptions, said O'Moy. You must know, sir, and your council must know, that wherever armies move there must be reason for complaint. The British army does not claim in this respect to be superior to others, although I don't say, mark me, that it might not claim it with perfect justice. But we do claim for ourselves that our laws against plunder and outrage are as strict as they well can be, and that where these things take place punishment inevitably follows. Out of your own knowledge, sir, you must admit that what I say is true. True, certainly, where the offenders are men from the ranks. But in this case, where the offender is an officer, it does not transpire that justice has been administered with the same impartial hand that sir answered o'moy sharply testily is because he is missing the secretary's thin lips permitted themselves to curve into the faintest ghost of a smile precisely he said for answer o'moy red in the face thrust forward the dispatch he had received relating to the affair read sir read for yourself that you may report exactly to the council of regency the terms of the report that has just reached me from headquarters you will be able to announce that diligent search is being made for the offender forges perused the document carefully and returned it that is very good he said and the council will be glad to hear of it it will enable us to appease the popular resentment in some degree but it does not say here that when taken this officer will not be excused upon the grounds which yourself you have urged to me it does not but considering that he has since been guilty of desertion there can be no doubt all else apart that the finding of a court-martial will result in his being shot. Very well, said Forges. I will accept your assurance, and the council will be relieved to hear of it. He rose to take his leave. I am desired by the council to express to Lord Wellington the hope that he will take measures to preserve better order among his troops and to avoid the recurrence of such extremely painful incidents a moment said o'moy and rising waved his guest back into his chair then resumed his own seat under a more or less calm exterior he was a seething cauldron of passion the matter is not quite at an end as your excellency supposes from your last observation and from a variety of other evidence, I infer that the council is far from satisfied with Lord Wellington's conduct of the campaign. That is an inference which I cannot venture to contradict. You will understand, General, that I do not speak for myself, but for the council, when I say that many of his measures seem to us not merely unnecessary, but detrimental the power having been placed in the hands of lord wellington the council hardly feels itself able to interfere with his dispositions but it nevertheless deplores the destruction of the mills and the devastation of the country recommended and insisted upon by his lordship it feels that this is not warfare as the council understands warfare and the people share the feelings of the council it is felt that it would be worthier and more commendable if lord wellington were to measure himself in battle with the french making a definite attempt to stem the tide of invasion on the frontiers quite so 
His hand was clenching and unclenching, and Tremaine, who watched him, wondered how long it would be before the storm burst. Quite so, and because the council disapproves of the very measures which at Lord Wellington's instigation it has publicly recommended, it does not trouble to see that those measures are carried out. As you say, it does not feel itself able to interfere with his dispositions, but it does not scruple to mark its disapproval by passively hindering him at every turn magistrates are left to neglect these enactments and because he added with bitter sarcasm portuguese valor is so red-hot and so devilish set on battle the militia acts calling all men to the colors are forgotten as soon as published there is no one either to compel the recalcitrant to take up arms or to punish the desertions of those who have been driven into taking them up yet you want battles you want your frontiers defended a moment sir there is no need for heat no need for any words the matter may be said to be at an end he smiled a thought viciously be it confessed and then played his trump card hurled his bombshell. Since the views of your council are in such utter opposition to the views of the commander-in-chief, you will no doubt welcome Lord Wellington's proposal to withdraw from this country and to advise His Majesty's government to withdraw the assistance which it is affording you. There followed a long spell of silence. O'Moy sitting back in his chair, his chin in his hands, to observe the result of his words nor was he in the least disappointed. Don Miguel's mouth fell open. The color slowly ebbed from his cheeks, leaving them an ivory yellow. His eyes dilated and protruded. He was consternation incarnate. My God! He contrived to gasp at last, and his shaking hands clutched at the carved arms of his chair. Ye don't seem as pleased as I expected ventured o'moy but general surely surely his excellency cannot mean to take so so terrible a step terrible to whom sir wondered o'moy terrible to us all forges rose in his agitation he came to lean upon o'moy's writing-table facing the adjutant surely sir our interests england's interests and portugal's are one in this to be sure but england's interests can be defended elsewhere than in portugal and it is lord wellington's view that they shall be he has already warned the council of regency that since his majesty and the prince regent have entrusted him with the command of the british and portuguese armies he will not suffer the council or any of its members to interfere with his conduct of the military operations or suffer any criticism or suggestion of theirs to alter system formed upon mature consideration but when finding their criticisms fail the members of the council in their wrong-headedness in their anxiety to allow private interest to triumph over public duty go the length of thwarting the measures of which they do not approve the end of lord wellington's patience has been reached i am giving your excellency his own words he feels that it is futile to remain in a country whose government is determined to undermine his every endeavor to bring this campaign to a successful issue yourself sir you appear to be distressed but the council of regency will no doubt take a different view it will rejoice in the departure of a man whose military operations it finds so detestable you will no doubt discover this when you come to lay lord wellington's decision before the council as i now invite you to do bewildered and undecided forjas stood there for a moment vainly seeking words is this really lord wellington's last word he asked in tones of profoundest consternation there is one alternative only one said o'moy slowly and that instantly forjas was all eagerness o'moy considered him 
faith, I hesitate to state it. No, no, please, please. I feel that it is idle. Let the council judge, I implore you, General. Let the council judge. Very well. Omoy shrugged and took up a sheet of the dispatch which lay before him. You will admit, sir, I think, that the beginning of these troubles coincided with the advent of the Principal Sousa upon the Council of Regency. He waited in vain for a reply. Forjas, the diplomat, preserved an uncompromising silence, in which presently Omoy proceeded. From this and from other evidence of which indeed there is no lack, Lord Wellington has come to the conclusion that all the resistance, passive and active, which he has encountered results from the principal Sousa's influence upon the council. You will not, I think, trouble to deny it, sir. Forjas spread his hands. You will remember, General, he answered in tones of conciliatory regret, that the principal Sousa represents a class upon whom Lord Wellington's measures peculiarly hard. You mean that he represents the Portuguese nobility and landed gentry, who, putting their own interests above those of the state, have determined to oppose and resist the devastation of the country which Lord Wellington recommends. You put it very bluntly, Forjas admitted. You will find Lord Wellington's own words even more blunt, said O'Moy with a grim smile, and turned to the dispatch, he said, let me read you exactly what he writes. As for Principal Souza, I beg you to tell him for me that as I have had no satisfaction in transacting the business of this country since he has become a member of the government, no power on earth shall induce me to remain in the peninsula if he is either to remain a member of the government or to continue in Lisbon. Either he must quit the country or I will do so and this immediately after I have obtained His Majesty's permission to resign my charge. The adjutant put down the letter and looked expectantly at the Secretary of State, who returned the look with one of utter dismay. Never in all his career had the diplomat been so completely dumbfounded, as he was now by the simple directness of the man of action. In himself, Dom Miguel Forges was both shrewd and honest. He was shrewd enough to apprehend to the full the military genius of the British commander-in-chief, fruits of which he had already witnessed. He knew that the withdrawal of Junot's army from Lisbon two years ago resulted mainly from the operations of Sir Arthur Wellesley, as he was then, before his supersession in the supreme command of the first expedition, and he more than suspected that but for the supersession the defeat of the first French army of invasion might have been even more signal. He had witnessed the masterly campaign of 1809, the Battle of the Duaro, and the relentless operations which had culminated in hurling the shattered fragments of Soult's magnificent army over the Portuguese frontier, thus liberating that country for the second time from the thrall of the mighty French invader. And he knew that the, unless this man and the troops under his command remained in Portugal, and enjoyed complete liberty of action, that there could be no hope of stemming the third invasion, for which Messina, the ablest of all the emperor's marshals, was now gathering his divisions in the north. If Wellington were to execute his threat and withdraw with his army, Forges beheld nothing but ruin for his country. The irresistible French would sweep forward in devastating conquest and Portuguese independence would be ground to dust under the heel of the terrible emperor. All this the clear-sighted Don Miguel Forjas now perceived. To do him full justice, he had feared for some time that the unreasonable conduct of his government might ultimately bring about some such desperate situation. But it was not for him to voice those fears. He was the servant of the government the mere instrument and mouthpiece of the Council of Regency. This, he said at length in a voice that was odd, is an ultimatum. It is that, 
O'Moy admitted readily. Forges sighed, shook his dark head, and drew himself up like a man who has chosen his part. Being shrewd, he saw the immediate necessity of choosing, and being honest. He chose honestly. Perhaps it is well, he said. That Lord Wellington should go, cried O'Moy. That Lord Wellington should announce intentions of going, Forges explained and having admitted so much he now stripped off the official mask completely he spoke with his own voice and not with that of the council whose mouthpiece he was of course it will never be permitted lord wellington has been entrusted with the defence of the country by the prince regent consequently it is the duty of every portuguese to ensure that at all costs he shall continue in that office. O'Moy was mystified. Only a knowledge of the minister's inmost thoughts could have explained this oddly sudden change of manner. But your excellency understands the terms, the only terms upon which his lordship will so continue? Perfectly. I shall hasten to convey those terms to the council. It is also quite clear, is it not, that I may convey to my government, and indeed publish your complete assurance that the officer responsible for the raid on the convent at Tavora will be shot when taken? Looking intently into Omoy's face, Dom Miguel saw the clear blue eyes flicker under his gaze. He beheld a gray shadow slowly overspreading the adjutant's ruddy cheek. Knowing nothing of the relation between O'Moy and the offender, unable to guess the sources of the hesitation of which he now beheld such unmistakable signs, the minister naturally misunderstood it. "'There must be no flinching in this, General,' he cried. "'Let me speak to you for a moment.' quite frankly and in confidence not as the secretary of state of the council of regency but as a portuguese patriot who places his country and his country's welfare above every other consideration you have issued your ultimatum it may be harsh it may be arbitrary with that i have no concern the interests the feelings of principal souza or of any other individual however high placed are without weight when the interests of the nation hang against them in the balance better that an injustice be done to one man than that the whole country should suffer. Therefore I do not argue with you upon the rights and wrongs of Lord Wellington's ultimatum. That is a matter apart. Lord Wellington demands the removal of Principal Souza from the government, or, in the alternative, proposes himself to withdraw from Portugal. In the national interest, the government can come to only one decision. I am frank with you, General. Myself, I shall stand ranged on the side of the national interest, and what my influence in the council can do, it shall do. But if you know Principal Souza, at all you must know that he will not relinquish his position without a fight he has friends and influence the patriarch of lisbon and many of the nobility will be on his side i warn you solemnly against leaving any weapon in his hands he paused impressively but O'Moy, gray-faced now and haggard, waited in silence for him to continue. 
from the message I brought you, Forjas resumed, you will have perceived how Principal Souza has fastened upon this business at Tavora to support his general censure of Lord Wellington's conduct of the campaign. That is the weapon to which my warning refers. You must, if we who place the national interest supreme are to prevail, you must disarm him by the assurance that I ask for. You will perceive that I am disloyal to a member of my council, so that I may be loyal to my country. But I repeat, I speak to you in confidence. This officer has committed a gross outrage, which must bring the British army into odium with the people. Unless we have your assurance that the British army is the first to censure and to punish the offender with the utmost rigor, give me now that I may publish everywhere your official assurance that this man will be shot, and on my side I assure you that Principal Souza, thus deprived of his stoutest weapon, must succumb in the struggle that awaits us. I hope, said O'Moy slowly, his head bowed, his voice dull and even unsteady. I hope that I am not behind you in placing public duty above private consideration. You may publish my official assurance that the officer in question will be shot when taken. General, I thank you. My country thanks you. You may be confident of this issue. He bowed gravely to O'Moy, and then to Tremaine. Your Excellencies, I have the honor to wish you good day. He was shown out by the orderly who had admitted him, and he departed well satisfied in his patriotic heart that the crisis which he had always known to be inevitable, should have been reached at last. Yet as he went, he wondered why the adjutant general had looked so downcast, why his voice had broken when he pledged his word that justice should be done upon the offending British officer. That, however, was no concern of Don Miguel's, and there was more than enough to engage his thoughts. When he came to consider the ultimatum to his government, with which he was charged. End of chapter 2 Read by Peter Strom in Ecuador February 26, 2019Across the frontier in the northwest was gathering the third army of invasion, some sixty thousand strong, commanded by Marshal Messina, Prince of Esslingen, the most skillful and fortunate of all Napoleon's generals, a leader who, because he had never known defeat, had come to be surnamed by his emperor, the dear child of victory. Wellington, at the head of a British force of little more than one-third of the French host, watched and waited, maturing his stupendous strategic plan, which those in whose interests it had been conceived had done so much to thwart. That plan was inspired by, and based upon, the Emperor's maxim, that war should support itself, that an army on the march must not be hampered and immobilized by its commissariat, but that it must draw its supplies from the country it is invading, that it must, in short, live upon that country. Behind the British army and immediately to the north of Lisbon, in an arc some thirty miles long, following the inflection of the hills from the sea at the mouth of the Zizandre to the broad waters of the Tagus at Alhandra, the lines of Torres Vedras were being constructed under the direction of Colonel Fletcher, and this so secretly and with such careful measures 
as to remain unknown to British and Portuguese alike. Even those employed upon the works knew of nothing save the section upon which they happened to be engaged, and had no conception of the stupendous and impregnable whole that was preparing. To these lines it was the British commander's plan to effect a slow retreat before the French flood when it should sweep forward, thus luring the enemy onward into a country which he had commanded should be laid relentlessly waste, that there that enemy might fast be starved and afterwards destroyed. To this end had his proclamations gone forth, commanding that all the land lying between the rivers Tagus and Mondego, in short, the whole of the country between Biera and Torres Vedras, should be stripped naked, converted into a desert as stark and empty as the Sahara. Not a head of cattle, not a grain of corn, not a skin of wine, not a flask of oil, not a crumb of anything affording nourishment should be left behind. The very mills were to be rendered useless, bridges were to be broken down, the houses emptied of all property, which the refugees were to carry away with them from the line of invasion. Such was his terrible demand upon the country for its own salvation, but such, as we have seen, was not war as Principal Souza and some of his adherents understood it. They had not the foresight to perceive the inevitable result of this strategic plan, if effectively and thoroughly executed. They did not even realize that the devastation had better be effected by the British in this defensive, and in its results at the same time overwhelmingly offensive manner, than by the French in the course of a conquering onslaught. They did not realize these things partly because they did not enjoy Wellington's full confidence, and in a greater measure because they were blinded by self-interest, because, as O'Moy told Forges, they placed private considerations above public duty. The northern nobles, whose lands must suffer, opposed the measure violently. They even opposed the withdrawal of labor from those lands which the Militia Act had rendered necessary and Antonio de Souza made himself their champion until he was broken by Wellington's ultimatum to the council, for broken he was, the nation had come to a parting of the ways. It had been brought to the necessity of choosing, and however much the principal, voicing the outcry of his party, might argue that the British plan was as detestable and ruinous as a French invasion, the nation preferred to place its confidence in the conqueror of Vimiero and the Duro. Suzo quitted the government and the capital as had been demanded, but if Wellington hoped that he would quit intriguing, he misjudged his man. He was a fellow of monstrous vanity, pride and self-sufficiency, of the sort than which there is none more dangerous to offend. His wounded pride demanded a salve to be procured at any cost, the wound had been administered by Wellington, and must be returned with interest, so that he ruined Wellington it mattered nothing to Antonio de Souza that he should ruin himself and his own country at the same time. He was like some blinded, ferocious, and unreasoning beast, ready, even eager, to sacrifice its own life, so that in dying it can destroy its enemy and slake its bloodthirst. In that mood he passes out of the councils of the Portuguese government into a brooding and secretly active retirement, of which the fruits shall presently be shown. With his departure the Council of Regency, rudely shaken by the ultimatum which had driven him forth, became more docile and active. For a season the measures enjoined by the commander-in-chief were pursued with some show of earnestness. As a result of all this life at Monsanto became easier, and O'Moy was able to breathe more freely, and to devote more of his time to matters concerning the fortifications which Wellington had left largely in his charge. Then, too, as the weeks passed, the shadow overhanging him with regard to Richard Butler gradually lifted. No further word had there been of the missing lieutenant, and by the end of May both O'Moy and Tremaine had fallen to the conclusion that he must have fallen into the hands of some of the ferocious mountaineers to whom a soldier, whether his uniform were British or French, was a thing to be done to death. 
For his wife's sake, O'Moy came thankfully to that conclusion. Under the circumstances, it was the best possible termination to the episode. She must be told of her brother's death presently, when evidence of it was forthcoming. She would mourn him passionately, no doubt, for her attachment to him was deep, extraordinarily deep for so shallow a woman, but at least she would be spared the pain and shame she must inevitably have felt had he been taken and shot. Meanwhile, however, the lack of news from him, in another sense, would have to be explained to Una, sooner or later, for a fitful correspondence was maintained between brother and sister, and O'Moy dreaded the moment when this explanation must be made. Lacking invention, he applied to Tremaine for assistance, and Tremaine glumly supplied him with the necessary lie that should meet Lady O'Moy's inquiries when they came. In the end, however, he was spared the necessity of falsehood, for the truth itself reached Lady O'Moy in an unexpected manner. It came about a month after that day when O'Moy had first received the news of the escapade at Tavora. It was a resplendent morning of early June, and the adjutant was detained a few moments from breakfast by the arrival of a mail bag from headquarters, now established at Vizieu. Leaving Captain Tremaine to deal with it, Sir Terence went down to breakfast, bearing with him only a few letters of a personal character which had reached him from friends on the frontier. The architecture of the house at Monsanto was of a semi-claustral character. Three sides of it enclosed a sheltered, luxuriant garden, whilst on the fourth side a connecting corridor, completing the quadrangle, spanned bridgewise the spacious archway, through which admittance was gained directly from the parklands that sloped gently to Alcantara. This archway, closed at night by enormous wooden doors, opened wide during the day upon a grassy terrace bounded by a baluster of white marble that gleamed now in the brilliant sunshine. It was O'Moy's practice to breakfast out of doors in that genial climate, and during April, before the sun had reached its present intensity, the table had been spread out there upon the terrace. Now, however, it was wiser, even in the early morning, to seek the shade and breakfast was served within the quadrangle, under a trellis of vine supported in the Portuguese manner by rough-hewn granite columns. It was a delicious spot, cool and fragrant, secluded without being enclosed, since through the broad archway it commanded a view of the Tagus and the hills of Alamtijo. Here O'Moy found himself impatiently awaited that morning by his wife and her cousin, Sylvia Armitage, more recently arrived from England. "'You are very late,' Lady O'Moy greeted him petulantly. Since she spent her life in keeping other people waiting, it naturally fretted her to discover unpunctuality in others. Her portrait by Rayburn, which now adorns the National Gallery, had been painted in the previous year. You will have seen it, or at least you will have seen one of its numerous replicas and you will have remarked its singular, delicate, rose-petal loveliness, the gleaming golden head, the flawless outline of face and feature, the immaculate skin, the dark blue eyes with their look of innocence awakening. Thus was she now in her artfully simple gown of flowered muslin, with its white fichu folded across her neck, that was but a shade less whiter. Thus was she, just as Rayburn had painted her, saving, of course, that her expression matching her words, was petulant. "'I was detained by the arrival of a mail-bag from Vizieu. Sir Terence excused himself as he took the chair which Mullins, the elderly pontifical butler, drew out for him. "'Ned is attending to it, and will be kept for a few moments yet.' Lady O'Moy's expression quickened. "'Are there no letters for me?' "'None, my dear, I believe.' no word from dick again there was that note of ever-ready petulance it is too provoking he should know that he must make me anxious by his silence dick is so thoughtless so careless of other people's feelings i shall write to him severely the adjutant paused in the act of unfolding his napkin the prepared explanation trembled on his lips but its falsehood repellent to him was not uttered 
I should certainly do so, my dear, was all he said, and addressed himself to his breakfast. What news from headquarters? Miss Armitage asked him. Are things going well? Much better now that Principal Sousa's influence is at an end. Cotton reports that the destruction of the mills in the Mondego Valley is being carried out systematically. Miss Armitage's dark, thoughtful eyes became wistful. Do you know, Terence, she said, that I am not without some sympathy for the Portuguese resistance to Lord Wellington's decrees. They must bear so terribly hard upon the people. To be compelled with their own hands to destroy their homes and lay waste the lands upon which they have labored. What could be more cruel? War can never be anything but cruel, he answered gravely. God help the people over whose lands it sweeps. Devastation is often the least of the horrors marching in its train. Why must war be? she asked him, in intelligent rebellion against that most monstrous and infamous of all human madnesses. O'Moy proceeded to do his best to explain the unexplainable, and since, himself a professional soldier, he could not take the sane view of his sane young questioner, hot argument ensued between them to the infinite weariness of Lady O'Moy, who out of self-protection gave herself to the study of the latest fashion plates from London, and the consideration of a gown for the ball which the Count of Redondo was giving in the following week. It was thus in all things, for these cousins represented the two poles of womanhood, Miss Armitage, without any of Lady O'Moy's insistent and excessive femininity, was nevertheless feminine to the core, but hers was the Diana type of womanliness. She was tall and of a clean-limbed, supple grace, now emphasized by the riding habit which she was wearing, for she had been in the saddle during the hour which Lady O'Moy had consecrated to the rites of toilet and devotions done before her mirror. Dark-haired, dark-eyed, vivacity and intelligence lent her countenance an attraction very different from the allurement of her cousin's delicate loveliness, and because her countenance was a true mirror of her mind, she argued shrewdly now, so shrewdly that she drove O'Moy to entrench himself behind generalizations. "'My dear Sylvia!' war is most merciful where it is most merciless he assured her with the irish gift for paradox at home in the government itself there are plenty who argue as you argue and who are wondering when we shall embark for england that is because they are intellectuals and war is a thing beyond the understanding of intellectuals it is not intellect but brute instinct and brute force that will help humanity in such a crisis as the present therefore let me tell you child that a government of intellectual men is the worst possible government for a nation engaged in a war this was far from satisfying miss armitage lord wellington himself was an intellectual she objected nobody could deny it there was the work he had done as irish secretary and there was the calculating genius he had displayed at vimiero at oporto at talavera and then, observing her husband to be in distress, Lady O'Moy put down her fashion plate and brought up her heavy artillery to relieve him. Sylvia, dear, she interpolated, I wonder that you will forever be arguing about things you don't understand. Miss Armitage laughed good-humouredly. She was not easily put out of countenance. What woman doesn't? she asked. I don't, and I am a woman, surely. Ah, but an exceptional woman! Her cousin rallied her affectionately, tapping the shapely white arm that protruded from a foam of lace. And Lady O'Moy, to whom words never had any but a literal meaning, set herself to purr precisely as one would have expected. Complacently she discoursed upon the perfection of her own endowments, appealing ever and anon to her husband for confirmation. And O'Moy, who loved her with all the passionate reverence which nature working inscrutably to her ends so often inspires in such strong essentially masculine men for just such fragile and excessively feminine women afforded this confirmation with all the enthusiasm of sincere conviction thus until mullins broke in upon them with the announcement of a visit from count samoval 
an announcement more welcome to Lady O'Moy than to either of her companions. The Portuguese nobleman was introduced. He had attained to a degree of familiarity in the adjutant's household that permitted of his being received without ceremony there at the breakfast table spread in the open. He was a slender, handsome, swarthy man of thirty, scrupulously dressed as graceful and elegant in his movements as a fencing master which indeed he might have been for his skill with the foils was a matter of pride to himself and notoriety to all the world nor was it by any means the only skill he might have boasted for geronimo de samoval was in many things a very subtle supple gentleman his friendship with the omois now some three months old, had been considerably strengthened of late by the fact that he had unexpectedly become one of the most hostile critics of the Council of Regency, as lately constituted, and one of the most ardent supporters of the Wellingtonian policy. He bowed with supremest grace to the ladies, ventured to kiss the fair, smooth hand of his hostess, undeterred by the frosty stare of Amoy's blue eyes, whose approval of all men was in inverse proportion to their approval of his wife, and finally proffered her the armful of early roses that he brought. These poor roses of Portugal, to their sister from England, said his softly caressing tenor voice. You're a poet, said O'Moy tartly. Having found Castilia here, said the Count, shall i not drink its limpid waters not i hope while there's an agreeable vintage of port on the table a morning wet samoval o'moy invited him taking up the decanter two fingers then no more it is not my custom in the morning but here to drink your lady's health and yours miss armitage with a graceful flourish of his glass he pledged them both and sipped delicately then took the chair that O'Moy was proffering. Good news, I hear, General. Antonio de Souza's removal from the government is already bearing fruit. The mills in the valley of the Mondego are being effectively destroyed at last. You're very well informed, grunted O'Moy, who himself had but received the news. As well informed, indeed, as I am myself. There was a note almost of suspicion in the words, and he was vexed that matters, which it was desirable he kept screened as much as possible from general knowledge, should so soon be put abroad. Naturally, and with reason, was the answer, delivered with a rueful smile. Am I not interested? Is not some of my property in question? Samoval sighed. But I bow to the necessities of war. At least it cannot be said of me, as was said of those whose interests Sousa represented, that I put private considerations above public duty. That is the phrase, I think. The individual must suffer that the nation may triumph. A Roman maxim, my dear general. And a British one, said O'Moy, to whom Britain was a second Rome. Ho, oh, admitted replied the amiable Samoval. You proved it by your uncompromising firmness in the affair of Tavora. What was that? inquired Miss Armitage. Have you not heard? cried Samoval in astonishment. Of course not, snapped O'Moy, who had broken into a cold perspiration. Hardly a subject for the ladies, Count. Rebuked for his intention, Samoval submitted instantly. Perhaps not, perhaps not, he agreed, as if dismissing it, whereupon O'Moy recovered from his momentary breathlessness. But in your own interest, my dear general, I trust there will be no weakening when this Lieutenant Butler is caught, and... Who? Sharp and stridently came that single word from her ladyship. Desperately O'Moy sought to defend the breach. Nothing to do with Dick, my dear, a fellow named Philip Butler, who... But the too well-informed Samoval corrected him. Not Philip, General. Richard Butler. I had the name but yesterday from Forges. 
In the scared hush that followed, the Count perceived that he had stumbled headlong into a mystery. He saw Lady O'Moy's face turn whiter and whiter, saw her sapphire eyes dilating as they regarded him. "'Richard Butler,' she echoed. "'What of Richard Butler? Tell me, tell me at once.' Hesitating before such signs of distress, Samoval looked at O'Moy to meet a dejected scowl. Lady O'Moy turned to her husband. "'What is it?' she demanded. "'You know something about Dick, and you are keeping it from me. Dick is in trouble.' "'He is,' O'Moy admitted, "'in great trouble.' "'What has he done? You speak of an affair at Evora or Tavora, which is not to be mentioned before ladies.' I demand to know. Her affection and anxiety for her brother invested her for a moment with a certain dignity, lent her a force that was but rarely displayed by her. Seeing the man stricken speechless, Samoval from bewildered astonishment, O'Moy from distress, she jumped to the conclusion, after what had been said, that motives of modesty accounted for their silence. Leave us, Sylvia, dear she said. Forgive me, dear, but you see they will not mention these things while you are present. She made a piteous little figure as she stood trembling there, her fingers tearing in agitation at one of Samoval's roses. She waited until the obedient and discreet Miss Armitage had passed from view into the wing that contained the adjutant's private quarters, then sinking limp and nerveless to her chair. Now, she bade them, please tell me and o'moy with a sigh of regret for the lie so laboriously concocted which would never now be uttered delivered himself huskily of the hideous truth end of chapter three read by peter strom in porto Cayo, ecuador on february fifteenth two thousand nineteen Chapter Four of the Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. Count Samoval. Miss Armitage's own notions of what might be fit and proper for her virginal ears were by no means coincident with Lady O'Moy's. Thus, although you have seen her pass into the private quarters of the adjutant's establishment, and although in fact she did withdraw to her own room. She found it impossible to abide there a prey to doubt and misgivings as to what Dick Butler might have done. Doubt and misgivings, be it understood, entertained purely on Una's account, and not at all on Dick's. By the corridor spanning the archway on the southern side of the quadrangle, and serving as a connecting bridge between the adjutant's private and official quarters, Miss Armitage took her way to Sir Terence's workroom knowing that she would find Captain Tremaine there, and assuming that he would be alone. "'May I come in?' she asked him from the doorway. He sprang to his feet. "'Why, certainly, Miss Armitage. For so imperturbable a young man, he seemed oddly breathless in his eagerness to welcome her. Are you looking for O'Moy? He left me nearly half an hour ago to go to breakfast, and I was just about to follow.' I scarce dare detain you, then. On the contrary, I mean, not at all, but were you wanting me? She closed the door and came forward into the room, moving with that supple grace peculiarly her own. I want you to tell me something, Captain Tremaine, and I want you to be frank with me. I hope I could never be anything else. I want you to treat me as you would treat a man, a friend of your own sex. Tremaine sighed. He had recovered from the surprise of her coming, and was again his imperturbable self. I assure you that is the last way in which I desire to treat you. But if you insist... I do. She had frowned slightly at the earlier part of his speech, with its subtle, half-jesting gallantry, and she spoke sharply now. I bow to your will, said Captain Tremaine. What has Dick Butler been doing? He looked into her face with sharply questioning eyes. What was it that happened at Tavora? He continued to look at her. What have you heard? He asked at last. 
only that he has done something at Tavora, for which the consequences, I gather, may be grave. I am anxious for Una's sake to know what it is. Does Una know? She is being told now. Count Samoval let slip just what I have outlined, and she has insisted upon being told everything. Then why did you not remain to hear? Because they sent me away on the plea that, oh, on the silly plea of my youth and innocence, which were not to be offended. But which you expect me to offend? No, because I can trust you to tell me without offending. Sylvia! It was a curious exclamation of satisfaction and of gratitude for the implied confidence. We must admit that it betrayed a selfish forgetfulness of Dick Butler and his troubles. But it is by no means clear that it was upon such grounds that it offended her. She stiffened perceptibly. Really, Captain Tremaine. I beg your pardon, said he, but you seem to imply. He checked at a loss. Her color rose. Well, sir, what do you suggest that I implied or seem to imply? But as suddenly her manner changed. I think we are too concerned with trifles where the matter on which I have sought you is a serious one. It is one of the utmost seriousness, he admitted gravely. Won't you tell me what it is? He told her quite simply the whole story, not forgetting to give prominence to the circumstances, extenuating it in Butler's favor. She listened with a deepening frown, rather pale, her head bowed. And when he is taken, she asked, what, what will happen to him? Let us hope that he will not be taken. But if he is, if he is, she insisted almost impatiently. Captain Tremaine turned aside and looked out of the window. I should welcome the news that he is dead, he said softly, for if he is taken he will find no mercy at the hands of his own people. You mean that he will be shot? Horror changed her voice, dilated her eyes. Inevitably. A shudder ran through her, and she covered her face with her hands. When she withdrew them, Tremaine beheld the lovely countenance transformed. It was white and drawn. But surely Terence can save him, she cried piteously. He shook his head, his lips tight-pressed. There is no man less able to do so. What do you mean? Why do you say that? He looked at her, hesitating for a moment, then answered, O'Moy has pledged his word to the Portuguese government that Dick Butler shall be shot when taken. Terence did that? He was compelled to it. Honor and duty demanded no less of him. I alone, who was present and witnessed the undertaking, know what it cost him and what he suffered. But he was forced to sink all private considerations. It was a sacrifice rendered necessary, inevitable for the success of this campaign. And he proceeded to explain to her all the circumstances that were interwoven with Lieutenant Butler's ill-timed offense. Thus you see that from Terence you can hope for nothing. His honor will not admit of his wavering in this matter. Honor! She uttered the word almost with contempt. And what of Una? I was thinking of Una when I said I should welcome the news of Dick's death somewhere in the hills. It is the best that can be hoped for. I thought you were Dick's friend, Captain Tremaine. Why, so I have been, so I am. Perhaps that is another reason why I should hope that he is dead. Is it no reason why you should do what you can to save him? He looked at her steadily for an instant, calm under the reproach of her eyes. Believe me, Miss Armitage, if I saw a way to save him, to do anything to help him, I would seize it both for the sake of my friendship for himself and because of my affection for Una. Since you yourself are interested in him, that is an added reason for me. But it is one thing to admit willingness to help, and another thing actually to afford help. What is there that I can do? I assure you that I have thought of the matter. Indeed, for days I have thought of little else. But I can see no light. I await events. Perhaps a chance may come. 
Her expression had softened. I see, she put out a hand generously to ask forgiveness. I was presumptuous, and I had no right to speak as I did. He took the hand. I should never question your rights to speak to me in any way that seemed good to you, he assured her. I had better go to Una. She will be needing me, poor child. I am grateful to you, Captain Tremaine, for your confidence and for telling me. And thus she left him very thoughtful, as concerned for Una as she was herself. Now Una O'Moy was the natural product of such treatment. There had ever been something so appealing in her lovely helplessness and fragility that all her life others had been concerned to shelter her from every wind that blew. Because it was so, she was what she was, and because she was what she was, it would continue to be so. But Lady O'Moy at the moment did not stand in such urgent need of Miss Armitage as Miss Armitage imagined. She had heard the appalling story of her brother's escapade, but she had been unable to perceive in what it was so terrible as it was declared. He had made a mistake. He had invaded the convent under a misapprehension, for which it was ridiculous to blame him. It was a mistake which any man might have made in a foreign country. Lives had been lost, it is true, but that was owing to the stupidity of other people, of the nuns who had run for shelter when no danger threatened, save in their own silly imaginations, and of the peasants who had come blundering to their assistance, where no assistance was required. The latter were the people responsible for the bloodshed, since they had attacked the dragoons. Could it be expected of the dragoons that they should tamely suffer themselves to be massacred? Thus Lady O'Moy upon the whole affair of Tavora. The whole thing appeared to her to be rather silly, and she refused seriously to consider that it could have any grave consequences for Dick. His continued absence made her anxious, but if he should come to be taken, surely his punishment would be merely a formal matter. At the worst he might be sent home, which would be a very good thing, for after all the climate of the peninsula had never quite suited him. In this fashion she nimbly pursued a train of vitiated logic, passing from inconsequence to inconsequence. And O'Moy, thankful that she should take such a view as this, mercifully hopeful that the last had been heard of his piquant and vexatious brother-in-law, content more than content to leave her comforted such illusions and then while she was still discussing the matter in terms of comparative calm came an orderly to summon him away so that he left her in the company of samoval the count had been deeply shocked by the discovery that dick butler was lady o'moy's brother and a little confused that he himself in his ignorance should have been the means of bringing to her knowledge a painful matter that touched her so closely and that hitherto had been so carefully concealed from her by her husband he was thankful that she should take so optimistic a view and quick to perceive o'moy's charitable desire to leave her optimism undispelled but he was no less quick to perceive the opportunities which the circumstances afforded him to further a certain deep intrigue upon which he was engaged Therefore he did not take his leave just yet. He sauntered with Lady O'Moy on the terrace above the wooded slopes that screened the village of Alcantara, and there discovered her mind to be even more frivolous and unstable than his perspicuity had hitherto suspected. Under stress, Lady O'Moy could convey the sense that she felt deeply. She could be almost theatrical in her displays of emotion, but these were as transient as they were intense. Nothing that was not immediately present to her senses was ever capable of a deep impression upon her spirit, and she had the facility characteristic of the self-loving and self-indulgent of putting aside any matter that was unpleasant. Thus easily persuaded, as we have seen, that this escapade of Richard's was not to be regarded too seriously, and that its consequences were not likely to be grave. She chattered with gay inconsequence of other things, of the dinner-party last week at the house of the Marquis of Minas, 
that prominent member of the Council of Regency, of the forthcoming ball to be given by the Count of Redondo, of the latest news from home, the latest fashion and the latest scandal, the amours of the Duke of York, and the shortcomings of Mr. Percival. Samoval, however, did not intend that the matter of her brother should be so entirely forgotten, so lightly treated. Deliberately, at last, he revived it. Considering her as she leant upon the granite balustrade, her pink sunshade aslant over her shoulders, her flimsy lace shawl festooned from the crook of either arm, and floating behind her, a wisp of cloudy vapor, Samoval permitted himself a sigh. She flashed him a sidelong glance, arch and rallying. "'You are melancholy, sir. A poor compliment,' she told him. "'But do not misunderstand her. Hers was an almost childish coquetry, inevitable fruit of her intense femininity, craving ever the worship of the sterner sex and the incense of its flattery. And Samoval, after all, young, noble, handsome, with a half-sinister reputation— was something of a figure of romance, as a good many women had discovered to their cost. He fingered his snowy stock, and bent upon her eyes of glowing adoration. Dear Lady O'Moy, his tenor voice was soft and soothing as a caress, I sigh to think that one so adorable, so entirely made for life's sunshine and gladness, should have cause for a moment's uneasiness, perhaps for secret grief, at the thought of the peril of her brother. Her glance clouded under this reminder, then she pouted and made a little gesture of impatience. Dick is not in peril, she answered. He is foolish to remain so long in hiding, and of course he will have to face unpleasantness when he is found, but to say that he is in peril is just nonsense. Terence said nothing of peril. He agreed with me that Dick will probably be sent home. Surely you don't think— No, no. He looked down, studying his hessians for a moment. Then his dark eyes returned to meet her own. I shall see to it that he is in no danger. You may depend upon me, who ask but the happy chance to serve you. Should there be any trouble, let me know at once, and I will see to it that all is well. Your brother must not suffer, since he is your brother. He is very blessed and enviable in that. She stared at him, her brows knitting. But I don't understand. Is it not plain? Whatever happens, you must not suffer, Lady O'Moy. No man of feeling, and I least of any, could endure it. And since, if your brother were to suffer, that must bring suffering to you. You may count upon me to shield him. You are very good, Count, but shield him from what? From whatever may threaten. The Portuguese government may demand in self-protection to appease the clamor of the people stupidly outraged by this affair that an example shall be made of the offender. Oh, but how could they? With what reason? She displayed a vague alarm and a less vague impatience of such hypothesis. He shrugged. The people are like that, a fierce, vengeful god to whom appeasing sacrifices must be offered from time to time. If the people demand a scapegoat, Governments usually provide one, but be comforted. In his eagerness, in his eagerness of reassurance, he caught her delicate mittened hand in his own, and her anxiety rendering her heedless, she allowed it to lie there, gently imprisoned. Be comforted. I shall be here to guard him. There is much that I can do, and you may depend upon me to do it. For your sake, dear lady, the government will listen to me. I would not have you imagine me capable of boasting. I have influence with the government, that is all. And I give you my word that so far as the Portuguese government is concerned, 
Your brother shall take no harm. She looked at him for a long moment with moist eyes, moved and flattered by his earnestness and intensity of homage. I take this very kindly in you, sir. I have no thanks that are worthy, she said, her voice trembling a little. I have no means of repaying you. You have made me very happy, Count. He bent low over the frail hand he was holding. Your assurance that I have made you happy repays me very fully, since your happiness is my tenderest concern. Believe me, dear lady, you may ever count Geronimo de Samoval, your most devoted and obedient slave. He bore the hand to his lips and held it to them for a long moment, whilst with heightened color and eyes that sparkled, more be it confessed from excitement than from gratitude, she stood passively considering his bowed dark head. As he came erect again, a movement under the archway caught his eye, and turning he found himself confronting Sir Terence and Miss Armitage, who were approaching. If it vexed him to have been caught by a husband notoriously jealous in an attitude not altogether uncompromising, Samoval betrayed no sign of it. With smooth self-possession he hailed O'Moy. General, you come in time to enable me to take my leave of you. I was on the point of going. So I perceived, said O'Moy tartly. He had almost said, so I had hoped. His frosty manner would have imposed constraint upon any man less master of himself than Samoval, but the Count ignored it, and ignoring it delayed a moment to exchange amiabilities politely with Miss Armitage, before taking at last an unhurried and unperturbed departure. But no sooner was he gone than O'Moy expressed himself full frankly to his wife. I think Samoval is becoming too attentive and too assiduous. He is a dear, said Lady O'Moy. That is what I mean, replied Sir Terence grimly. He has undertaken that if there should be any trouble with the Portuguese government about Dick's silly affair, he will put it right. Oh, said O'Moy, that was it. And out of his tender consideration for her, said no more. But Sylvia Armitage, knowing what she knew from Captain Tremaine, was not content to leave the matter there. She reverted to it presently, as she was going indoors alone with her cousin. Una, she said gently, I should not place too much faith in Count Samoval and his promises. What do you mean? Lady O'Moy was never very tolerant of advice, especially from an inexperienced young girl. I do not altogether trust him, nor does Terence. Pooh! Terence mistrusts every man who looks at me. My dear, never marry a jealous man, she added with her inevitable inconsequence. He is the last man, the Count, I mean, to whom in your place I should go for assistance if there is trouble about Dick. She was thinking of what Tremaine had told her of the attitude of the Portuguese government, and her clear-sighted mind perceived an obvious peril in permitting Count Samoval to become aware of Dick's whereabouts should they ever be discovered. What nonsense, Sylvia! You conceive the oddest and most foolish notions sometimes, but of course you have no experience of the world. And beyond that she refused to discuss the matter, nor did the wise Sylvia insist. End of chapter 4 Read by Peter Strom in Ecuador On February 16th, 2019might continue missing in the flesh. In the spirit, he and his miserable affair seem to have been ever-present and ubiquitous, and a most fruitful source of trouble. 
it would be at about this time that there befell in lisbon the deplorable event that nipped in the bud the career of that most promising young officer major berkeley of the famous diehards the twenty-ninth foot coming into lisbon on leave from his regiment which was stationed at abrantes and formed part of the division under sir rowland hill the major happened into a company that contained at least one member who was hostile to lord wellington's conduct of the campaign or rather to the measures which it entailed as in the case of the principal souza prejudice drove him to take up any weapon that came to his hand by means of which he could strike a blow at a system he deplored since we are concerned only indirectly with the affair it may be stated very briefly the young gentleman in question was a portuguese officer and a nephew of the patriarch of lisbon and the particular criticism to which major berkeley took such just exception concerned the very troublesome dick butler our patrician ventured to comment with sneers and innuendos upon the fact that the lieutenant of dragoons continued missing and he went so far as to indulge in a sarcastic prophecy that he never would be found major berkeley stung by the slur thus slyly cast upon british honour invited the young gentleman to make himself more explicit i had thought that i was explicit enough says young impudence leering at the stalwart red-coat but if you want it more clearly still then i mean that the undertaking to punish this ravisher of nunneries is one that you english have never intended to carry out to save your faces you will take good care that lieutenant butler is never found indeed i doubt if he was ever really missing major berkeley was quite uncompromising and downright i am afraid he had none of the graces that can exalt one of these affairs you're just a very foolish liar sir and you deserve a good caning was all he said but the way in which he took his cane from under his arm was so suggestive of more to follow there and then that several of the company laid preventive hands upon him instantly the patriarch's nephew very white and very fierce to hear himself addressed in terms which out of respect for his august and powerful uncle had never been used to him before demanded instant satisfaction he got it next morning in the shape of half an ounce of lead through his foolish brain and a terrible uproar ensued to appease it a scapegoat was necessary as samoval so truly said the mob is a ferocious god to whom sacrifices must be made in this instance the sacrifice of course was major berkeley he was broken and sent home to cut his pigtail the adornment still clung to by the twenty-ninth and retire into private life whereby the british army was deprived of an officer of singularly brilliant promise thus you see the score against poor richard butler that foolish victim of wine and circumstance went on increasing but in my haste to usher major berkeley out of a narrative which he touches merely as a tangent i am guilty of violating the chronological order of the events the ship in which major berkeley went home to england and the rural life was the frigate telemachus and the telemachus had but dropped anchor in the tagus at the date with which i am immediately concerned she came with certain stores and a heavy load of mails for the troops and it would be a full fortnight before she would sail again for home her officers would be ashore during the time the welcome guests of the officers of the garrison bearing their share in the gaieties with which the latter strove to kill the time of waiting for events and marcus glenny the captain of the frigate an old friend of tremaine's was by virtue of that friendship an almost daily visitor at the adjutant's quarters but there again i am anticipating the telemachus came to her moorings in the tagus at which for the present we may leave her on the morning of the day that was to close with count redondo's semi-official ball lady o'moy had risen late taking from one end of the day 
what she must relinquish to the other, that thus fully rested she might look her best that night. The greater part of the afternoon was devoted to preparation. It was amazing, even to herself, what an amount of detail there was to be considered, and from Sylvia she received but very indifferent assistance. There were times when she regretfully suspected in Sylvia a lack of proper womanliness, a taint almost of masculinity. There was to Lady O'Moy's mind something very wrong about a woman who preferred a canter to a waltz. It was unnatural. It was suspicious. She was not quite sure that it wasn't vaguely immoral. At last there had been dinner, to which she came a full half-hour late but of so ravishing and angelic an appearance that the sight of her was sufficient to mollify Sir Terence's impatience and stifle the withering sarcasm he had been laboriously preparing. After dinner, which was taken at six o'clock, there was still an hour to spare before the carriage would come to take them into Lisbon. Sir Terence pleaded stress of work, occasioned by the arrival of the Telemachus that morning, and withdrew with Tremaine to the official quarters, to spend that hour in disposing of some of the many matters awaiting his attention. Sylvia, who to Lady O'Moy's exasperation, seemed now for the first time to give a thought of what she should wear that night, went off in haste to gown herself, and so Lady O'Moy was left to her own resources, which I assure you were few indeed. The evening being calm and warm, she sauntered out into the open. She was more or less annoyed with everybody, with Sir Terence and Tremaine for their assiduity to duty, and with Sylvia for postponing all thought of dressing until this eleventh hour, when she might have been better employed in beguiling her ladyship's loneliness. In this petulant mood, Lady O'Moy crossed the quadrangle, loitered a moment by the table and chairs, placed under the trellis, and considered sitting there to await the others. Finally, however, attracted by the glory of the sunset behind the hills towards Abrantes, she sauntered out onto the terrace, to the intense thankfulness of a poor wretch who had waited there for the past ten hours in the almost despairing hope that precisely such a thing might happen. She was leaning upon the balustrade when a rustle in the pines below drew her attention. The rustle worked swiftly upwards and round to the bushes on her right, and her eyes, faintly startled, followed its career, what time she stood tense and vaguely frightened. Then the bushes parted, and a limping figure that leaned heavily upon a stick disclosed itself, a shaggy, red-bearded man in the garb of a peasant, and marvel of marvels, this figure spoke her name sharply, warningly almost before she had time to think of screaming. Yuna, Yuna, don't move. The voice was certainly the voice of Mr. Butler, but how came that voice into the body of this peasant? Terrified with the drumming pulses, yet obedient to the injunction, she remained without speech or movement, whilst crouching so as to keep below the level of the balustrade. The man crept forward until he was immediately before and below her. She stared into that haggard face, and through the half-mask of stubbly beard gradually made out the features of her brother. Richard! The name broke from her in a scream. Shh! He waved his hands in wild alarm to repress her. For God's sake, be quiet. It's a ruined man I am if they find me here. You'll have heard what's happened to me. She nodded, and uttered a half-strangled, Yes. Is there anywhere you can hide me? Can you get me into the house without being seen? I am almost starving, and my leg is on fire. I was wounded three days ago to make matters worse than they were already. I have been lying in the woods there watching for the chance to find you alone since sunrise this morning, and it's devil a bite or sup I've had since this time yesterday. Poor, poor Richard. She leaned down towards him in an attitude of compassionate, ministering grace. But why, why did you not come up to the house and ask for me? No one would have recognized you. Terence would if he had seen me. 
but terence wouldn't have mattered terence will help you terence he almost laughed under excessive bitterness laboring under an egotistical sense of wrong he's the last man i should wish to meet as i have good reason to know if it hadn't been for that i should have come to you a month ago immediately after this trouble of mine as it is i kept away until despair left me no other choice una on no account a word of my presence to terence but he's my husband sure and he's also adjutant-general and if i know him at all he's the very man to place official duty and honor and all the rest of it above family considerations oh richard how little you know terence how wrong you are to misjudge him like this right or wrong i'd prefer not to take the risk it might end in my being shot one fine morning before long richard for god's sake less of your richard it's all the world will be hearing you can you hide me do you think for a day or two if you can't i'll be after shifting for myself as best i can i've been playing the part of an english overseer from beersley's wine farm and it has brought me all the way from the duaro in safety but the strain of it and the eternal fear of discovery are beginning to break me and now there's this infernal wound i was assaulted by a footpad near abrantes as if i was worth robbing anyway i gave the fellow more than i took unless i have rest i think i shall go mad and give myself up to the provost marshal to be shot and done with why do you talk of being shot you have done nothing to deserve that why should you fear it now mr butler was aware having gathered the information lately on his travels of the undertaking given by the british to the council of regency with regard to himself but irresponsible egotist though he might be yet in common with others he was actuated by the desire which his sister's fragile loveliness inspired in every one to spare her unnecessary pain or anxiety it's not myself will take any risks he said again we are at war and when men are at war killing becomes a sort of habit and one life more or less is neither here nor there and upon that he renewed his plea that she should hide him if she could and that on no account should she tell a single soul and sir terence least of any of his presence having driven him to the verge of frenzy by the waste of precious moments in vain argument she gave him at last the promise he required go back to the bushes there she bade him and wait until i come for you i will make sure that the coast is clear contiguous to her dressing-room which overlooked the quadrangle there was a small alcove which had been converted into a storeroom for the array of trunks and dress-boxes that lady o'moy had brought from england a room opening directly from her dressing-room communicated with this alcove and of that door bridget her maid was in possession of the key as she hurried now indoors she happened to meet bridget on the stairs the maid announced herself on her way to supper in the servants quarters and apologized for her presumption in assuming that her ladyship would no further require her services that evening but since it fell in so admirably with her ladyship's own wishes she insisted with quite unusual solicitude with vehemence almost that bridget should proceed upon her way just give me the key of the alcove she said there are one or two things i want to get can't i get them your ladyship thank you bridget i prefer to get them myself there was no more to be said bridget produced a bunch of keys which she surrendered to her mistress having picked out for her the one required lady o'moy went up to come down again the moment that bridget had disappeared the quadrangle was deserted the household disposed of and it wanted yet half an hour to the time for which the carriage was ordered no moment could have been more propitious but in any case no concealment was attempted since if detected it must have provoked suspicions hardly likely to be aroused in any other way when lady o'moy returned indoors in the gathering dusk she was followed at a respectful distance by the limping fugitive who might had he been seen have been supposed some messenger or perhaps some person employed about the house or gardens coming to her ladyship for instructions 
No one saw them, however, and they gained the dressing room and thence the alcove in complete safety. There, whilst Richard, allowing his exhaustion at last to conquer him, sank heavily down upon one of his sister's many trunks, recking nothing of the havoc wrought in its priceless contents, her ladyship all a-tremble collapsed limply upon another. But there was no rest for her. Richard's wound required attention, and he was faint for want of meat and drink. So having procured him the wherewithal to wash and dress his hurt, a nasty knife slice which had penetrated to the bone of his thigh, the very sight of which turned her ladyship sick and faint, she went to forage for him in a haste increased by the fact that time was growing short. On the dining-room sideboard from the remains of dinner, she found and furtively abstracted what she needed. Best part of a roast chicken, a small loaf and a half-flask of the Calares. Mullins, the butler, would no doubt be exercised presently when he discovered the abstraction. Let him blame one of the footmen, Sir Terence's orderly or the cat. It mattered nothing to Lady O'Moy. Having devoured the food and consumed the wine, Richard's exhaustion assumed the form of a lethargic torpor. To sleep was now his overmastering desire. She fetched him rugs and pillows, and he made himself a couch upon the floor. She had demurred, of course, when he himself had suggested this. She could not conceive of anyone sleeping anywhere but in a bed. But Dick made short work of that illusion. Haven't I been in hiding for the last six weeks? he asked her. And haven't I been thankful to sleep in a ditch? And wasn't I campaigning before that? I tell you I couldn't sleep in a bed. It's a habit I've lost entirely. Convinced, she gave way. We'll talk tomorrow, Una. He promised her, as he stretched himself luxuriously upon that hard couch. But meanwhile, on your life, not a word to anyone. You understand? Of course I understand, my poor Dick. She stooped to kiss him, but he was fast asleep already. She went out and locked the door, and when, on the point of setting out for Count Redondo's, she returned the bunch of keys to Bridget, the key of the alcove was missing. I shall require it again in the morning, Bridget, she explained lightly, and then added kindly, as it seemed, Don't wait for me, child. Get to bed. I shall be late in coming home, and I shall not want you. End of chapter 5 Read by Peter Strom in Lima, Peru On February 19th, 2019 Chapter 6 of The Snare by Raphael Sabatini This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Miss Armitage's Pearls Lady O'Moy and Miss Armitage drove alone together into Lisbon. The adjutant, still occupied, would follow as soon as he possibly could, whilst Captain Tremaine would go on directly from the lodgings which he shared in Alcantara with Major Carruthers, also of the adjutant's staff, whither he had ridden to dress some twenty minutes earlier. "'Are you ill, Una?' had been Sylvia's concerned greeting of her cousin when she came within the range of the carriage lamps. "'You are pale as a ghost.' To this her ladyship had replied mechanically that a slight headache troubled her. But now that they sat side by side in the well-upholstered carriage, Miss Armitage became aware that her companion was trembling. Una, dear, whatever is the matter? Had it not been for the dominant fear that the shedding of tears would render her countenance unsightly, Lady O'Moy would have yielded to her feelings and wept heroically in the cause of her own flawless beauty she conquered the almost overmastering inclination i-i have been so troubled about richard she faltered it is preying upon my mind poor dear in sheer motherliness miss armitage put an arm about her cousin and drew her close we must hope for the best now, if you have understood anything of the character of Lady O'Moy, you will have understood that the burden of a secret was the last burden that such a nature was capable of carrying. 
It was because Dick was fully aware of this that he had so emphatically and repeatedly impressed upon her the necessity for saying not a word to any one of his presence. She realized in her vague way, or rather she believed it since he had assured her, that there would be grave danger to him if he were discovered. But discovery was one thing, and the sharing of a confidence as to his presence another. That confidence must certainly be shared. Lady O'Moy was in an emotional maelstrom that swept her towards a cataract. The cataract might inspire her with dread, standing as it did for death and disaster. But the maelstrom was not to be resisted. She was helpless in it, unequal to breasting such strong waters. She, who in all her futile, charming life, had been born snugly in safe crafts that were steered by others, remained but to choose her confidant. Nature suggested Terence, but it was against Terence in particular that she had been warned. Circumstance now offered Sylvia Armitage, but pride, or vanity if you prefer it, denied her here. Sylvia was an inexperienced young girl, as she herself had so often found occasion to remind her cousin. Moreover, she fostered the fond illusion that Sylvia looked to her for precept, that upon Sylvia's life she exercised a precious guiding influence. How, then, should the supporting lean upon the supported? Yet since she must, there and then lean upon something, or succumb instantly and completely. She chose a middle course, a sort of temporary assistance. I have been imagining things, she said. It may be a premonition, I don't know. Do you believe in premonitions, Sylvia? Sometimes, Sylvia humored her. I have been imagining that if Dick is hiding a fugitive, he might naturally come to me for help. I am fanciful, perhaps, she added hastily, lest she should have said too much. But there it is. All day the notion has clung to me, and I have been asking myself desperately what I should do in such a case. Time enough to consider it when it happens, Una, after all. I know, her ladyship interrupted on that ever-ready note of petulance of hers. I know, of course, but I think I should be easier in my mind if I could have found an answer to my doubt, if I knew what to do, to whom to appeal for assistance, for I am afraid that I should be very helpless myself. There is Terence, of course, but I am a little afraid of Terence. He has got Dick out of so many scrapes, and he is so impatient of poor Dick. I am afraid he doesn't understand him, and so I should be a little frightened of appealing to Terence again. No, said Sylvia gravely. I shouldn't go to Terence. Indeed, he is the last man to whom I should go. You say that, too? exclaimed her ladyship. Why? quoth Sylvia sharply. Who else has said it? There was a brief pause in which Lady O'Moy shuddered. She had been so near to betraying herself. How very quick and shrewd Sylvia was. She made, however, a good recovery. Myself, of course. It is what I have thought myself. There is Count Samoval. He promised that if ever any such thing happened, he would help me. And he assured me I could count upon him. I think it may have been his offer that made me fanciful. I should go to Sir Terence before I went to Count Samoval, by which I mean I should not go to Count Samoval at all under any circumstances. I do not trust him. You said so once before, dear, said Lady O'Moy, and you assured me that I spoke out of the fullness of my ignorance and inexperience. Ah, forgive me. There is nothing to forgive. No doubt you were right, but remember that instinct is most alive in the ignorant and inexperienced, and that instinct is often a surer guide than reason. Yet if you want reason, I can supply that too. Count Samoval is the intimate friend of the Marquis of Minas, who remains a member of the government, and who next to the principal Sousa was, and no doubt is, the most bitter opponent of the British policy in Portugal. 
yet Count Samoval, one of the largest landowners in the north, and the nobleman who has perhaps suffered most severely from that policy, represents himself as its most vigorous supporter. Lady O'Moy listened in growing amazement. Also she was a little shocked. It seemed to her almost indecent that a young girl should know so much about politics, so much of which she herself, a married woman and the wife of the adjutant general, was completely in ignorance. Save us, child, she ejaculated. You are so extraordinarily informed. I have talked to Captain Tremaine, said Sylvia. He has explained all this. Extraordinary conversation for a young man to hold with a young girl, pronounced her ladyship. Terence never talked of such things to me. Terence was too busy making love to you, said Sylvia and there was the least suspicion of regret in her almost boyish voice. "'That may account for it,' her ladyship confessed, and fell for a moment into consideration of that delicious and rather amusing past when O'Moy's ferocious hesitancy and flaming jealousy had delighted her with the full perception of her beauty's power. With a rush, however, the present forced itself back upon her notice." but i still don't see why count samoval should have offered me assistance if he did not intend to grant it when the time came sylvia explained that it was from the portuguese government that the demand for justice upon the violator of the nunnery at tavora emanated and that samoval's offer might be calculated to obtain him information of butler's whereabouts when they became known so that he might surrender him to the government my dear Lady O'Moy was shocked almost beyond expression. How you must dislike the man to suggest that he could be such a... such a Judas. I do not suggest that he could be. I warn you never to run the risk of testing him. He may be as honest in this matter as he pretends. But if ever Dick were to come to you for help, you must take no risk. The phrase was a happier one than Sylvia could suppose. It was almost the very phrase that Dick himself had used, and its reiteration by another bore conviction to her ladyship. "'To whom, then, should I go?' she demanded plaintively, and Sylvia, speaking with knowledge, remembering the promise that Tremaine had given her, answered readily, "'There is but one man whose assistance you could safely seek, indeed i wonder you should not have thought of him in the first instance since he is your own as well as dick's lifelong friend ned tremaine her ladyship fell into thought do you know i am a little afraid of ned he is so very sober and cold you do mean ned don't you whom else should i mean but what could he do my dear how should I know, but at least I know, for I think I can be sure of this, that he will not lack the will to help you, and to have the will, in a man like Captain Tremaine, is to find a way. The confident, almost respectful tone in which she spoke arrested her ladyship's attention. It promptly sent her off at a tangent. You like Ned, don't you, dear? I think everyone likes him. Sylvia's voice was now studiously cold. Yes, but I don't mean quite in that way. And then, before the subject could be further pursued, the carriage rolled to a standstill in a flood of light from gaping portals, scattering a mob of curious sightseers, intersprinkled with chairmen, footmen, linkmen, and all the valet tale that hovers about the functions of the great world. The carriage door was flung open, and the steps let down, a brace of footmen plump as capons, in gorgeous liveries, bowed powdered heads and proffered scarlet arms, to assist the ladies to alight. Above in the crowded spacious colonnaded vestibule, at the foot of the great staircase they were met by Captain Tremaine, who had just arrived with Major Carruthers, both resplendent in full dress and Captain Marcus Glenny of the Telemachus, in blue and gold. Together they ascended the great staircase, lined with chatting groups, 
and ablaze with uniforms military naval and diplomatic british and portuguese to be welcomed above by the count and countess of redondo lady o'moy's entrance of the ballroom produced the effect to which custom had by now inured her soon she found herself the centre of assiduous attentions cavalrymen in blue riflemen in green scarlet officers of the line regiments winged light infantrymen rakishly policed gold-braided hussars and all the smaller fry of court and camp fluttered insistently about her it was no novelty to her who had been the recipient of such homage since her first ball five years ago at dublin castle and yet the wine of it had gone ever to her head a little but to-night she was rather pale and listless her rose-petal loveliness emphasized thereby perhaps an unusual air of indifference clung about her as she stood there amid this throng of martial jostlers who craved the honor of a dance and at whom she smiled a thought mechanically over the top of her slowly moving fan the first quadrille impended and the senior service had carried off the prize from under the noses of the landsmen as she was swept away by captain glenny she came face to face with tremaine who was passing with sylvia on his arm she stopped and tapped his arm with her fan you haven't asked to dance ned she reproached him with reluctance i abstained but i don't intend that you shall i have something to say to you he met her glance and found it oddly serious most oddly serious for her responding to its entreaty he murmured a promise in courteous terms of delight at so much honor but either he forgot the promise or he did not conceive its redemption to be an urgent matter for the quadrille being done he sauntered through one of the crowded anti-rooms with miss armitage and brought her to the cool of a deserted balcony above the garden beyond this was the river agleam with the lights of the british fleet that rode at anchor on its placid bosom una will be waiting for you miss armitage reminded him she was leaning on the sill of the balcony standing erect beside her he considered the graceful profile sharply outlined against a background of gloom by the light from the windows behind them a heavy curl of her dark hair lay upon a neck as flawlessly white as the rope of pearls that swung from it with which her fingers were now idly toying it were difficult to say which most engaged his thoughts the profile the lovely line of her neck or the rope of pearls these latter were of price such things as it might seldom and then only by sacrifice lie within the means of captain tremaine to offer to the woman whom he took to wife he so lost himself upon that train of thought that she was forced to repeat her reminder una will be waiting for you captain tremaine scarcely as eagerly he answered as others will be waiting for you she laughed amusedly a frank boyish laugh i thank you for not saying as eagerly as i am waiting for others miss armitage i have ever cultivated truth but we are dealing with surmise oh no surmise at all i speak of what i know and so do i and yet again she repeated una will be waiting for you he sighed and stiffened slightly of course if you insist said he and made ready to reconduct her she swung round as if to go but checked and looked him frankly in the eye why will you forever be misunderstanding me she challenged perhaps it is the inevitable result of my over-anxiety to understand then begin by taking me more literally and do not read into my words more meaning than i intend to give them when i say una is waiting for you i state a simple fact not a command that you shall go to her indeed i want first to talk to you if i might take you literally now should i have suffered you to bring me here if i did not i beg your pardon he said contrite and something shaken out of his imperturbability sylvia he ventured very boldly 
and there checked, so terrified as to be a shame to his brave scarlet gold-faced uniform. Yes, she said. She was leaning upon the balcony again, and in such a way now that he could no longer see her profile. But her fingers were busy at the pearls once more, and this he saw, and seeing, recovered himself. You have something to say to me? he questioned in his smooth, level voice. He had not looked away as he spoke. He might have observed that her fingers tightened their grip of the pearls almost convulsively, as if to break the rope. It was a gesture slight and trivial, yet arguing perhaps vexation. But Tremaine did not see it, and had he seen it, it is odds it would have conveyed no message to him. There fell a long pause, which he did not venture to break. At last she spoke, her voice quiet and level as his own had been. It is about Una. I had hoped, he spoke very softly, that it was about yourself. She flashed round upon him almost angrily. Why do you utter these set speeches to me? she demanded. And then before he could recover from his astonishment, to make any answer, she had resumed a normal manner, and was talking quickly. She told him of Una's premonitions about Dick, told him in short what it was that Una desired to talk to him about. "'You bade her come to me,' he said. "'Of course, after your promise to me.' He was silent and very thoughtful for a moment. "'I wonder that Una needed to be told that she had in me a friend,' he said slowly. "'I wonder to whom she would have gone on her own impulse.' "'To Count Samoval, Miss Armitage informed him. "'Samoval? He rapped the name out sharply. He was clearly angry. "'That man? I can't understand why Amoy should suffer him about the house so much. "'Terence, like everybody else, will suffer anything that Una wishes. "'Then Terence is more of a fool than I ever suspected.' "'There was a brief pause. "'If you were to fail Una in this,' said Miss Armitage presently. I mean that unless you yourself give her the assurance that you are ready to do what you can for Dick, should the occasion arise, I am afraid that in her present foolish mood she may still avail herself of Count Samoval. That would be to give Samoval a hold upon her, and I tremble to think what the consequences might be. That a man is a stink, a horror the frankness with which she spoke was to tremaine full evidence of her anxiety he was prompt to allay it she shall have that assurance this very evening he promised i at least have not pledged my word to anything or to any one even so he added slowly the chances of my services being ever required grow more slender every day una may be full of premonitions about Dick, but between premonition and event there is something of a gap. Again a pause, and then... I am glad, said Miss Armitage, to think that Una has a friend, a trustworthy friend, upon whom she can depend. She is so incapable of depending upon herself. All her life there has been someone at hand to guide her, and screen her from unpleasantness, until she has remained just a sweet dear child, to be taken by the hand in every dark lane of life. But she has you, Miss Armitage. Me, Miss Armitage spoke depreciatingly. I don't think I am a very able or experienced guide. Besides, even such as I am, she may not have me very long now. I had letters from home this morning. Father is not very well and mother writes that he misses me. I am thinking of returning soon. But, but you have only just come. She brightened and laughed at the dismay in his voice. Indeed, I have been here six weeks. She looked out over the shimmering moonlight waters of the Tagus, and the shadowy ghostly ships of the British fleet that rode at anchor there, and her eyes were wistful her fingers, with that little gesture peculiar to her in moments of constraint, were again entwining themselves in her rope of pearls. 
Yes, she said almost musingly. I think I must be going soon. He was dismayed. He realized that the moment for action had come. His heart was sounding the charge within him. And then that cursed rope of pearls, emblem of the wealth and luxury in which she had been nurtured, stood like an impassable abatis across his path. You, you will be glad to go, of course, he suggested. Hardly that. It has been very pleasant here, she sighed. We shall miss you very much, he said gloomily. The house at Monsanto will not be the same when you are gone. Una will be lost and desolate without you. It occurs to me sometimes, she said slowly, that the people about Una think too much of Una and too little of themselves. It was a cryptic speech. In another it might have signified a spitefulness unthinkable in Sylvia Armitage. Therefore it puzzled him very deeply. He stood silent, wondering what precisely she might mean. And thus in silence they continued for a spell. Then slowly she turned, and the blaze of light from the windows fell about her irradiantly. She was rather pale, and her eyes were of a suspiciously excessive brightness. And again she made use of the phrase, Una will be waiting for you. Yet, as before, he stood silent and immovable, considering her, questioning himself, searching her face and his own soul. All he saw was that rope of shimmering pearls. And after all, as yourself suggested, it is possible that others may be waiting for me, she added presently. Instantly he was crestfallen and contrite. I sincerely beg your pardon, Miss Armitage, and with a pang of which his imperturbable exterior gave no hint, he proffered her his arm. She took it, barely touching it with her fingertips, and they re-entered the anteroom. When do you think that you will be leaving? he asked her gently. There was a note of harshness in the voice that answered him. I don't know, but very soon. The sooner the better, I think. And then the sleek and courtly Samoval, detaching from, seeming to materialize out of the glittering throng they had entered, was bowing low before her, claiming her attention. Knowing her feelings, Tremaine would not have relinquished her, but to his infinite amazement she herself slipped her fingers from his scarlet sleeve to place them upon the black one that Samoval was gracefully proffering and greeted Samoval with a gay raillery as oddly in contrast with her grave demeanor towards the captain, as with her recent avowal of detestation for the Count. Stricken and half-angry, Tremaine stood looking after them as they receded towards the ballroom. To increase his chagrin came a laugh from Miss Armitage, sharp and rather strident, floating towards him, and Miss Armitage's laugh was wont to be low and restrained. Samoval, no doubt, had resources to amuse a woman, even a woman who instinctively disliked him, resources of which Captain Tremaine himself knew nothing. And then someone tapped him on the shoulder, a very tall, hawk-faced man in a scarlet coat and tightly strapped blue trousers stood beside him. It was Colquhoun Grant, the ablest intelligence officer in Wellington's service. "'Why, Colonel!' cried Tremaine, holding out his hand. I didn't know you were in Lisbon. I arrived only this afternoon. The keen eyes flashed after the disappearing figures of Sylvia and her cavalier. Tell me, what is the name of the irresistible gallant who has so lightly ravished you of your quite delicious companion? Count Samoval, said Tremaine shortly, Grant's face remained inscrutable. Really? He said softly. So that is Geronimo de Samoval, eh? How very interesting. A great supporter of the British policy. Therefore an altruist, since himself he is a sufferer by it. And I hear that he has become a great friend of Omoy's. He is at Monsanto a good deal, certainly, Tremaine admitted. Most interesting. Grant was slowly nodding. 
and a faint smile curled his thin, sensitive lips. But I'm keeping you, Tremaine, and no doubt you would be dancing. I shall perhaps see you tomorrow. I shall be coming up to Monsanto. And with a wave of the hand, he passed on and was gone. End of chapter 6 Recorded by Peter Strom in Lima, Peru, February 19th. 2019
Since the privilege must be postponed, said he, suppose that we seek supper. I have always found that a man can best heal in his stomach the wounds taken by his heart. His fleshy bulk afforded a certain prima facie confirmation of the dictum. With a roll more suggestive of the quarter-deck than the saddle, the great man bore off O'Moy in quest of material consolation. Yet as they went, the adjutant's eyes raked the ballroom in quest of his wife. That quest, however, was unsuccessful, for his wife was already in the garden. I want to talk to you most urgently, Ned. Take me somewhere where we can be quite private. She had begged the captain. Somewhere where there is no danger of being overheard. Her agitation, now uncontrolled, suggested to Tremaine the matter might be far more serious and urgent than Miss Armitage had represented it. He thought first of the balcony where he had lately been, but then the balcony opened immediately from the anteroom, and was likely at any moment to be invaded. So, since the night was soft and warm, he preferred the garden. Her ladyship went to find a wrap. Then arm in arm they passed out, and were lost in the shadows of an avenue of palm trees. It is about Dick, she said breathlessly. I know, Miss Armitage told me. What did she tell you? That you had a premonition that he might come to you for assistance. A premonition, her ladyship laughed nervously. It is more than a premonition, Ned. He has come. The captain stopped in his stride and stood quite still. Come, he echoed. Dick? Shh, she warned him, and sank her voice from very instinct. He came to me this evening, half an hour before we left home. I have put him in an alcove adjacent to my dressing room for the present. You have left him there? He was alarmed. Oh, there's no fear. No one ever goes there except Bridget, and I have locked the alcove. He's fast asleep. He was asleep before I left. The poor fellow was so worn and weary. Followed details of his appearance and a recital of his wanderings so far as he had made them known to her. And he was so insistent that no one should know, not even Terence. Terence must not know, he said gravely. You think that, too? If Terence knows, well, you will regret it all the days of your life, Una. He was so stern, so impressive that she begged for explanation. He afforded it. You would be doing Terence the utmost cruelty if you told him. You would be compelling him to choose between his honor and his concern for you, and since he is the very soul of honor, he must sacrifice you and himself, your happiness and his own, everything that makes life good for you both, to his duty. She was aghast. For all that, she was far from understanding. But he went on relentlessly to make his meaning clear, for the sake of O'Moy as much as for her own, for the sake of the future of these two people who were perhaps his dearest friends. He saw in what danger of shipwreck their happiness now stood, and he took the determination of clearly pointing out to her every shoal in the water through which she must steer her course. Since this has happened, Una, you must be told the whole truth. You must listen, and above all be reasonable. I am Dick's friend, as I am your own and Terence's. Your father was my best friend, perhaps, and my gratitude to him is unbounded, as I hope you know. You and Dick are almost as brother and sister to me. In spite of this, indeed because of this, I have prayed for news that Dick was dead. Her grasp interrupted him and he felt the tightening clutch of her hands upon his arm in the gloom. I have prayed this for Dick's sake, and more than all for the sake of your happiness and Terence's. If Dick has taken the choice before Terence is a tragic one, you will realize it when I tell you that duty forced him to pledge his word to the Portuguese government that Dick should be shot when found. Oh! 
It was a gasp of horror, of incredulity. She loosed his arm and threw away from him. It is infamous. I can't believe it. I can't. It is true. I swear it to you. I was present and I heard. And you allowed it? What could I do? How could I interfere? Besides, the minister who demanded that undertaking knew nothing of the relationship between O'Moy and this missing officer. But, but he could have been told. That would have made no difference unless it were to create fresh difficulties. She stood there, ghastly white against the gloom. A dry sob broke from her. Terence did that. Terence did that, she moaned, and then in a surge of anger. I shall never speak to Terence again. I shall not live with him another day. It was infamous, infamous. It was not infamous. It was almost noble, almost heroic. He amazed her. Listen, Una, and try to understand. He took her arm again and drew her gently on down that avenue of moonlight fretted darkness. Oh, I understand, she cried bitterly. I understand perfectly. He has always been hard on Dick. He has always made mountains out of molehills where Dick was concerned. He forgets that Dick is young, a mere boy. He judges Dick from the standpoint of his own sober middle age. Why, he's an old man, a wicked old man. Thus her rage hurling at O'Moy, what an insolence of her youth seemed the last insult. You are very unjust, Una. You are even a little stupid, he said, deeming the punishment necessary and salutary. Stupid? I stupid? I have never been called stupid before. But you have undoubtedly deserved to be, he assured her with perfect calm. It took her aback by its directness, and for a moment left her without an answer. Then, I think you had better leave me, she told him frostily. You forget yourself. Perhaps I do, he admitted. That is because I am more concerned to think of Dick and Terence and yourself. Sit down, Una. They had reached a little circle by a piece of ornamental water facing which a granite-hewn seat had been placed. She sank to it obediently, if sulkily. It may perhaps help you to understand what Terence has done when I tell you that in his place, loving Dick as I do, I must have pledged myself precisely as he did, or else despise myself forever, and being pledged I must keep my word or go in the same self-contempt. He elaborated his argument by explaining the full circumstances under which the pledge had been exacted. But be in no doubt about it, he concluded. If Terence knows of Dick's presence at Monsanto, he has no choice. He must deliver him up to a firing party, or to a court-martial, which will inevitably sentence him to death. No matter what the defense that Dick may urge, he is a man prejudged, foredoomed by the necessities of war. And Terence will do this, although it will break his heart and ruin all his life. Understand me, then, that in enjoining you never to allow Terence to suspect that Dick is present. I am pleading not so much for you or for Dick, but for Terence himself, for it is upon Terence that the hardest and most tragic suffering must fall. Now do you understand? I understand that men are very stupid, was her way of admitting it. And you see that you were wrong in judging Terence as you did. I, I suppose so. She didn't understand it all, but since Tremaine was so insistent, she supposed there must be something in his point of view. She had been brought up in the belief that Ned Tremaine was common sense incarnate, and although she often doubted it, as you may doubt the dogmas of a religion in which you have been bred, yet she never openly rebelled against that inculcated faith. Above all, she wanted to cry. She knew that it would be very good for her. She had often found a singular relief in tears when vexed by things beyond her understanding, but she had to think of that flock of gallants in the ballroom waiting to pay court to her, and of her duty towards them of preserving her beauty, unimpaired, 
by the ravages of vented sorrow. Tremaine sat down beside her. So now that we understand each other on that score, let us consider ways and means to dispose of Dick. All at once she was uplifted and became all eagerness. Yes, yes, you will help me, Ned. You can depend upon me to do all in human power. He thought rapidly, and gave voice to some of his thoughts. If I could, I would take him to my lodgings at Alcantara, but Carothers knows him and would see him there, so that is out of the question. Then again it is dangerous to move him about. At any moment he might be seen and recognized. Hardly recognized, she said. His beard disguises him, and his dress. She shuddered at the very thought of the figure he had cut. He, the jaunty dandy Richard Butler. That is something, of course, he agreed, and then asked, How long do you think that you could keep him hidden? I don't know. You see, there's Bridget. She is the only danger, as she has charge of my dressing room. It may be desperate, but can you trust her? Oh, I am sure I can. She is devoted to me. She would do anything. She must be bought as well. Devotion and gain, when linked together, will form an unbreakable bond. Don't let us be stingy, Una. Take her into your confidence boldly, and promise her a hundred guineas for her silence, payable on the day that Dick leaves the country. But how are we to get him out of the country? I think I know a way. I can depend on Marcus Glenny. I may tell him the whole truth and the identity of our man, or I may not. I must think about that, but whatever I decide, I am sure I can induce Glenny to take our fugitive home in the Telemachus, and land him safely somewhere in Ireland, where he will have to lose himself for a while. Perhaps for Glenny's sake it will be safer not to disclose Dick's identity. Then, if there should be trouble later, Glenny, having known nothing of the real facts, will not be held responsible. I will talk to him tonight. Do you think he will consent? She asked in strained anxiety, anxiety to have her anxieties dispelled. I am sure he will. I can almost pledge my word on it. Marcus would do anything to serve me. Oh, set your mind at rest. Consider the thing done. Keep Dick safely hidden for a week or so until the telematches is ready to sail. He mustn't go on board until the last moment, for several reasons, and I will see to the rest. Under that confident promise, her troubles fell from her, as lightly as they ever did. You are very good to me, Ned. Forgive me what I said just now, and I think I understand about Terence. Poor dear old Terence. Of course you do. Moved to comfort her as he might have been moved to comfort a child, he flung his arm along the seat behind her and patted her shoulder. I knew you would understand and not a word to Terence, not a word that could so much as awaken his suspicions. Remember that. Oh, I shall. Fell a step upon the patch behind them, crunching the gravel. Captain Tremaine, his arm still along the back of the seat, and seeming to envelop her ladyship, looked over her shoulder. A tall figure was advancing briskly. He recognized it even in the gloom, by its height and gait, and swing for O'Moy's. Why, here is Terence, he said easily, so easily, with such frank and obvious honesty of welcome, that the anger in which O'Moy came wrapped fell from him on the instant, to be replaced by shame. I have been looking for you everywhere, my dear, he said to Una. Marshal Beresford is anxious to pay you his respects before he leaves and you have been so hedged about by gallants all the evening that it's devil a chance he's had of approaching you. There was a certain constraint in his voice, for a man may not recover instantly from such feelings as those which had fetched him hot foot down that path at sight of those two figures sitting so close and intimate, the young man's arms so proprietorily about the lady's shoulders, as it seemed. Lady O'Moy sprang up at once, with a little silvery laugh that was singularly carefree, for had not Tremaine lifted the burden entirely from her shoulders? 
you should have married it down she mocked him then you'd have found her more easily accessible instead of finding her dallying in the moonlight with my secretary he rallied back between good and ill humor and he turned to tremaine damned indiscreet of you ned he added more severely suppose you had been seen by any of the scandal-mongering old wives of the garrison a nice thing for una and a nice thing for me begad to be made the subject of fly-blown talk over the teacups tremaine accepted the rebuke in the friendly spirit in which it appeared to be conveyed sorry o'moy he said you're quite right we should have thought of it everybody isn't to know what our relations are and again he was so manifestly honest and so completely at his ease that it was impossible to harbor any thought of evil, and Amoy felt again the glow of shame, of suspicion so utterly unworthy and dishonoring. End of chapter 7 Read by Peter Strom In Ayacucho, Peru On February twenty second, 2019《Chapter Eight of the Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, The Intelligence Officer. In a small room of Count Redondo's palace, a room that had been set apart for cards, sat three men about a card table. They were Count Samoval, the elderly Marquis of Minas, lean, bald and vulturine of aspect with a deep-set eye that glared fiercely through a single eyeglass and tortoise shell and a gentleman still on the fair side of middle age with a clear-cut face and iron-gray hair who wore the dark green uniform of a major of cacadores considering his portuguese uniform it is odd that the low-toned earnest conversation among them should have been conducted in french there were cards on the table but there was no pretense of play you might have conceived them a group of players who wearied of their game have relinquished it for conversation they were the only tenants of the room which was small cedar panelled and lighted by a girandole of sparkling crystal through the closed door came faintly from the distant ballroom the strains of the dance music perhaps the single exception of the principal souza the british policy had no more bitter opponent in portugal than the marquis of minas once a member of the council of regency before souza had been elected to that body he had quitted it in disgust at the british measures his chief ground of umbrage had been the appointment of british officers to the command of the portuguese regiments which formed the division under Marshal Beresford. In this he saw a deliberate insult and slight to his country and his countrymen. He was a man of burning and blinded patriotism, to whom Portugal was the most glorious nation in the world. He lived in his country's splendid past, refusing to recognize that the days of Henry the Navigator, of Vasco de Gama, of Manuel the Fortunate, days in which portugal had been great among the nations of the old world were gone and done with he respected britons as great merchants and industrious traders but after all merchants and traders are not the peers of fighters on land and sea of navigators conquerors and civilizers such as his countrymen had been such as he believed them still to be that the descendants of gamas Cunhas, Magalhães, and Albuquerques, men whose names were indelibly written upon the very face of the world, should be passed over, whilst alien officers had been brought in to train and command the Portuguese legions, was an affront to Portugal, which Minas could never forgive. It was thus that he had become a rebel, withdrawing from a government whose supineness he could not condone. For a while his rebellion had been passive, until the principal Souza had heated him in the fire of his own rage, and fashioned him into an intriguing instrument of the first power. He was listening intently now, 
to the soft, rapid speech of the gentleman in the major's uniform. Of course, rumors had reached the prince of this policy of devastation, he was saying, but his highness has been disposed to treat these rumors lightly, unable to see, as indeed are we all, what useful purpose such a policy could finally serve. He does not underrate the talents of my lord Wellington as a commander. He does not imagine that he would pursue such operations out of pure wantonness. Yet if such operations are indeed being pursued, what can they be but wanton? A moment, Count. He stayed Samoval, who was about to interrupt. His mind and manner were authoritative. We know most positively from the Emperor's London agents that the war is unpopular in England. We know that public opinion is being prepared for the British retreat, for the driving of the British into the sea, as must inevitably happen once Monsieur le Prince decides to launch his bolt. Here in the Tagus the British fleet lies ready to embark the troops, and the British cabinet itself, he spoke more slowly and emphatically, expects that embarkation to take place at latest in September which is just about the time the French offensive should be at its height and the French troops under the very walls of Lisbon. I admit that by this policy of devastation, if indeed it be true, added to a stubborn contesting of every foot of ground, the French advance may be retarded, but the process will be costly to Britain in lives and money. And more costly still to Portugal, croaked the Marquis of Minas. And as you say, Monsieur le Marquis, more costly still to Portugal, let me for a moment show you another side of the picture. The French administration, so sane, so cherishing, animated purely by ideas of progress, enforcing wise and beneficial laws, making ever for the prosperity and well-being of conquered nations, knows how to render itself popular wherever it is established. This Portugal knows already, or at least some part of it, there was the administration of salt in Oporto, so entirely satisfactory to the people that it was no inconsiderable party was prepared, subject to the emperor's consent to offer him the crown and settle down peacefully under his rule. There was the administration of Juno in Lisbon. I ask you, when was Lisbon better governed? Contrast for a moment with these the present British administration, for it amounts to an administration Consider the burning grievances that must be left behind by this policy of laying the country waste, of pauperizing a million people of all degrees, driving them homeless from the lands on which they were born, after compelling them to lend a hand in the destruction of all that their labor has built up through long years. If any policy could better serve the purposes of France, I know it not. The people from here to Biera should be ready to receive the French with open arms and to welcome their deliverance from this most costly and bitter British protection. Do you, messieurs, detect a flaw in these arguments? Both shook their heads. Bien, said the major of Portuguese calcadores. Then we reach one or two only possible conclusions. Either these rumors of a policy of devastation, which have reached the prince of Esslingen, are as utterly false as he believes them to be, or, to my cost, I know them to be true. As I have already told you, Samoval interrupted bitterly. Or, the major persisted, raising a hand to restrain the count, or there is something further that has not been yet discovered, a mystery the enucleation of which will shed light upon all the rest. Since you assure me, Monsieur le Comte, that my lord Wellington's policy is beyond doubt as reported to Monsieur le Marechal, it but remains to address ourselves to the discovery of the mystery underlying it. What conclusions have you reached? You, Monsieur de Somerval, have had exceptional opportunities of observation, I understand. I am afraid my opportunities have been none so exceptional as you suppose, replied Samoval with a dubious shake of his sleek dark head. At one time I founded great hopes in Lady O'Moy. But Lady O'Moy is a fool, and does not enjoy her husband's confidence in official matters. What she knows, I know. Unfortunately, it does not amount to very much. 
One conclusion, however, I have reached. Wellington is preparing in Portugal a snare for Messina's army. A snare? Hum. The major pursed his full lips into a smile of scorn. There cannot be a trap with two exits, my friend. Messina enters Portugal at Almeida and marches to Lisbon and the open sea. He may be inconvenienced or hampered in his march, but its goal is certain. Where then can lie the snare? Your theory presupposes an impassable barrier to arrest the French when they are deep in the country and an overwhelming force to cut off their retreat when that barrier is reached. The overwhelming force does not exist and cannot be manufactured. As for the barrier, no barrier that it lies within human power to construct lies beyond French power to overstride. I should not make too sure of that, Samoval warned him. And you have overlooked something. The major glanced at the count sharply and without satisfaction. He accounted himself, trained as he had been under the very eye of the great emperor, of some force in strategy and tactics a player too well versed in the game to overlook the possible moves of an opponent ha he said with the ghost of a sneer for instance monsieur le comte the overwhelming force exists said samoval where is it then whence has it been created if you refer to the united british and portuguese troops you will be good enough to bear in mind that they will be retreating before the prince they cannot at once be before and behind him. The man's cool assurance and cooler contempt of Samoval's views stung the Count into some sharpness. Are you seeking information, sir, or are you bestowing it? He inquired. Ah, your pardon, Monsieur le Comte, I inquire, of course. I put forward arguments to anticipate conditions that may possibly be erroneous. Samoval waved the point. There is another force behind the British and Portuguese troops that you have left out of your calculations. And that? The Major was still faintly incredulous. You should remember that Wellington obviously remembers that a French army depends for its sustenance upon the country it is invading. That is why Wellington is stripping the French line of preparation as bare of sustenance as this card table. If we assume the existence of the barrier, an impassable line of fortifications encountered within many marches of the frontier, we may also assume that starvation will be the overwhelming force that will cut off the French retreat. The other's keen eyes flickered. For a moment his face lost its assurance, and it was Samoval's turn to smile. But the major made a sharp recovery. He slowly shook his iron-gray head. You have no right to assume an impassable barrier. That is an inadmissible hypothesis. There is no such thing as a line of fortifications impassable to the French. You will pardon me, major but it is yourself have no right to your own assumptions. Again, you overlook something. I will grant that technically what you say is true. No fortifications can be built that cannot be destroyed, given adequate power, with which it is yet to prove that Messina, not knowing what may await him, will be equipped. But let us for a moment take so much for granted and now consider this. Fortifications are unquestionably building in the region of Torres Vedras, and Wellington guards the secret so jealously that not even the British, either here or in England, are aware of their nature. That is why the cabinet in London takes for granted an embarkation in September. Wellington has not even taken his government into his confidence. That is the sort of man he is. Now these fortifications have been building since last October. Best part of eight months have already gone in their construction. It may be another two or three months before the French army reaches them. I do not say that the French cannot pass them, given time. But how long will it take the French 
to pull down what it will have taken ten or eleven months to construct, and if they are unable to draw sustenance from a desolate wasted country, what time will they have at their disposal? It will be with them a matter of life or death. Having come so far, they must reach Lisbon or perish, and if the fortifications can delay them by a single month, then, granted, that all Lord Wellington's other dispositions have been fully carried out, perish they must. It remains, Monsieur le Major, for you to determine whether, with all their energy, with all their genius, and all their valor, the French can, in an ill-nourished condition, destroy in a few weeks the considered labor of nearly a year. The major was aghast. He had changed color, and through his eyes, wide and staring, his stupid faction glared forth at them. Minus uttered a cr dry cough under cover of his hand, and screwed up his eyeglass to regard the major more attentively. You do not appear to have considered all that, he said. But my dear Marquis, was the half-indignant answer, why was I not told all this to begin with? You represented yourself as but indifferently informed, Monsieur de Samoval, whereas... So I am, my dear Major, as far as information goes. If I did not use these arguments before, it was because it seemed to me an impertinence to offer what, after all, are no more than the conclusions of my own constructive and deductive reasoning to one so well versed in strategy as yourself. The major was silenced for a moment. I congratulate you, Count, he said. Monsieur le Maréchal shall have your views without delay. Tell me, he begged. You say these fortifications lie in the region of Torres Vedras. Can you be more precise? I think so. But again I warn you that I can tell you only what I infer. I judge they will run from the sea, somewhere near the mouth of the Zizandre in a semicircle to the Tagus, somewhere to the south of Santarum. I know that they do not reach as far north as San, because the roads there are open, whereas all the roads to the south, where I am assuming that the fortifications lie, are closed and closely guarded. Why do you suggest a semicircle? Because that is the formation of the hills, and presumably the line of heights would be followed. Yes, the major approved slowly, and the distance then would be some thirty or forty miles. Fully. The major's face relaxed its gravity. He even smiled. You will agree, Count, that in a line of that extent a uniform strength is out of the question. It must perforce present many weak, many vulnerable places. Oh, undoubtedly. Plans of these lines must be in existence. Again, undoubtedly, Sir Terence O'Moy will have plans in his possession showing their projected extent. Colonel Fletcher, who is in charge of the construction, is in constant communication with the adjutant, himself an engineer, and as I partly imagine, partly infer from odd phrases that I have overheard, especially entrusted by Lord Wellington, with the supervision of the works. Two things, then, are necessary, said the Major promptly. The first is that the devastation of the country should be retarded, and as far as possible hindered altogether. That, said Minus, you may safely leave to myself and Susan's other friends, the northern noblemen who have no intention of becoming the victims of British disinclination to pitched battles. The second, and this is more difficult, is that we should obtain by hook or by crook a plan of the fortifications. And he looked directly at Samoval. The Count nodded slowly, but his face expressed doubt. I am quite alive to the necessity. I always have been. But, to a man of your resource and intelligence, an intelligence of which you have just given such very signal proof, the matter should be possible. He paused a moment. Then, if I understand you correctly, Monsieur de Semival, your fortunes have suffered deeply, and you are almost ruined by this policy of Wellington's. You are offered the opportunity of making a magnificent recovery. 
the emperor is the most generous paymaster in the world, and he is beyond measure impatient at the manner in which the campaign in the peninsula is dragging out. He has spoken of it as an ulcer that has drained the empire of its resources, for the man who could render him the service of disclosing the weak spot in the armor, the Achilles heel of the British, there would be a reward beyond all your possible dreams. Obtain the plans, then, and... He checked abruptly. The door had opened, and in a Venetian mirror facing him upon the wall, the major caught the reflection of a British uniform, the stiff gold collar surmounted by a bronzed hawk face with which he was acquainted. I beg your pardon, gentlemen, said the officer in Portuguese. I was looking for... His voice became indistinct, so that they never knew who it was that he had been seeking when he intruded upon their privacy. The door had closed again, and the reflection had vanished from the mirror, but there were beads of perspiration on the major's brow. It is fortunate, he muttered, breathlessly, that my back was towards him. I would as soon meet the devil face to face. I didn't dream he was in Lisbon. Who is he? asked Minus. Colonel Grant, the British intelligence officer. Phew, name of a name. What an escape. The major mopped his brow with a silk handkerchief. Beware of him, Monsieur de Samoval. He rose. He was obviously shaken by the meeting. If one of you will kindly make sh quite sure that he is not about, I think that I had better go. If we should meet, everything might be ruined. Then, with a change of manner, he stayed Samoval, who was already on his way to the door. We understand each other, then, he questioned them. I have my papers, and at dawn I leave Lisbon. I shall report your conclusions to the prince, and in anticipation I may already offer you the expression of his profoundest gratitude. Meanwhile, you know what is to do. Opposition to the policy and the plans of the fortifications. Above all the plans, he shook hands with them, and having waited until Samoval assured him that the corridor outside was clear, he took his departure, and was soon afterwards driving home, congratulating himself upon his most fortunate escape from the hawk eye of Colquhoun Grant. But when in the dead of that night he was awakened to find a British sergeant with a halberd and six redcoats with fixed bayonets surrounding his bed, it occurred to him belatedly that what one man can see in a mirror is also visible to another, and that Marshal Massena, Prince of Esslingen, waiting for information beyond Ciudad Rodrigo, would never enjoy the advantages of a report of Count Samoval's masterly constructive and deductive reasoning. Read by Peter Strom in Peru on February 23rd, 2019. Chapter 9 of The Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The General Order. Sir Terence sat alone in his spacious, severely furnished private room in the official quarters at Monsanto. On the broad carved writing table before him, there was a mass of documents relating to the clothing and accoutrements of the forces, to leaves of absence, to staff appointments. There were returns from the various divisions of the sick and wounded in hospital, from which a complete list was to be prepared for the Secretary of State for War at Home. There were plans of the lines at Torres Vedras, just received, indicating the progress of the works at various points and there were documents and communications of all kinds concerned with the adjutant general's multifarious and arduous duties, including an urgent letter from Colonel Fletcher suggesting that the commander-in-chief should take an early opportunity of inspecting in person the inner lines of fortification. Sir Terence, however, sat back in his chair, his work neglected, his eyes dreamily gazing through the open window, but seeing nothing of the sun-drenched landscape beyond, a heavy frown darkening his bronzed and rugged face. His mind was very far from his official duties and the mass of reminders before him. This Augean stable of arrears, he was lost in thought of his wife and Tremaine. 
Five days had elapsed since the ball at Count Redondo's, where Sir Terence had surprised the pair together in the garden, and his suspicions had been fired by the compromising attitude in which he had discovered them. Tremaine's frank, easy bearing, so unassociable with guilt, had, as we know, gone far to reassure him, and had even shamed him so that he had trampled his suspicions underfoot. But other things had happened since to revive his bitter doubts. Daily, constantly, had he been coming upon Tremaine and Lady O'Moy alone together in intimate, confidential talk, which was ever silenced on his approach. The two had taken to wandering by themselves in the gardens at all hours, a thing that had never been so before, and O'Moy detected, or imagined that he detected, a closer intimacy between them, a greater warmth towards the captain on the part of her ladyship. Thus matters had reached a pass in which peace of mind was impossible to him. It was not merely what he saw, it was his knowledge of what was, it was his ever-present consciousness of his own age and his wife's youth. It was the memory of his antinuptial jealousy of Tremaine, which had been awakened by the gossip of those days, a gossip that pronounced Tremaine Una Butler's poor suitor, too poor either to declare himself or to be accepted if he did. The old wound which that gossip had dealt him then was reopened now. He thought of Tremaine's manifest concern for Una. He remembered how in that very room some six weeks ago, when Butler's escapade had first been heard of, it was from avowed concern for Una that Tremaine had urged him to befriend and rescue his rascally brother-in-law. He remembered, too, with increasing bitterness, that it was Una herself had induced him to appoint Tremaine to his staff. There were moments when the conviction of Tremaine's honesty, the thought of Tremaine's unanswering friendship for himself, would surge up to combat and abate the fires of his devastating jealousy. But evidence would kindle those fires anew, until they flamed up to scorch his soul with shame and anger. He had been a fool, and that he had married a woman of half his years, a fool in that he had suffered her former lover to be thrown into close association with her. Thus he assured himself, but he would abide by his folly, and so must she, and he would see to it that whatever fruits that folly yielded, dishonor should not be one of them. Through all his darkening rage there beat the light of reason. To avert, he bethought him, was better than to avenge nor were such stains to be wiped out by vengeance. A cuckold remains a cuckold, though he take the life of the man who has reduced him to that ignominy. Tremaine must go before the evil, transcended reparation. Let him return to his regiment and do his work of sapping and mining elsewhere than in Omoy's household. Eased by that resolve, he rose, a tall martial figure, youth and energy in every line of it for all his six-and-forty years. A while he paced the room in thought. Then suddenly, with hands clenched behind his back, he checked by the window. Checked on a horrible question that had flashed upon his tortured mind. What if already the evil should be irreparable? What proof had he that it was not so? The door opened, and Tremaine himself came in quickly. Here's the very devil to pay, sir, he announced with that odd mixture of familiarity towards his friend and deference to his chief. O'Moy looked at him in silence with smoldering, questioning eyes, thinking of anything but the trouble which the captain's air and manner heralded. Captain Stanhope has just arrived from headquarters with messages for you. A terrible thing has happened, sir. The dispatches from home by the thunderbolt, which we forwarded from here three weeks ago, reached Lord Wellington only the day before yesterday. Sir Terence became instantly alert. Garfield, who carried them, came into collision at Pinalva with an officer of Anson's brigade. There was a meeting, and Garfield was shot through the lung. He lay between life and death for a fortnight, with the result that the dispatches were delayed until he recovered sufficiently to remember them, and to have them forwarded by other hands. But you had better see Stanhope himself. The aide-de-camp came in. He was splashed from head to foot in witness of the fury with which he had ridden. His hair was caked with dust, and his face haggard, but he carried himself with soldierly uprightness, and his speech was brisk. He repeated what Tremaine had already stated, 
with some few additional details. This wretched fellow sent Lord Wellington a letter dictated from his bed, in which he swore that the duel was forced upon him, and that his honour allowed him no alternative. I don't think any feature of the case has so deeply angered Lord Wellington as this stupid plea. He mentioned that when Sir John Moore was in Herreris, in the course of his retreat upon Karuna, he sent forward instruction to the, for the leading division to halt at Lugo, where he designed to deliver battle if the enemy would accept it. That dispatch was carried to Sir David Baird by one of Sir John's aides, but Sir David forwarded it by the hand of a trooper who got drunk and lost it. That, says Lord Wellington, is the only parallel so far as he is aware of the present case, with this difference, that whilst a common trooper might so far fail to appreciate the importance of his mission, no such lack of appreciation can excuse Captain Garfield. I am glad of that, said Sir Terence, who had been bristling. For a moment I imagined that it was to be implied I had been as indiscreet in my choice of a messenger as Sir David Baird. No, no, Sir Terence, I merely repeated Lord Wellington's words, that you may realize how deeply angered he is. If Garfield recovers from his wound, he will be tried by court-martial. He is under open arrest. Meanwhile, as is his opponent in the duel, a Major Sykes of the 23rd Dragoons, that they will both be broke is beyond doubt. But that is not all. This affair, which might have such grave consequences, coming so soon upon Major Berkeley's business, has driven Lord Wellington to a step regarding which this letter will instruct you. Sir Terence broke the seal, the letter pinned by a secretary, but bearing Wellington's own signature ran as follows. The bearer, Captain Stanhope, will inform you of the particulars of this disgraceful business of Captain Garfield's. The affair following so soon upon that of Major Berkeley has determined me to make it clearly understood to the officers in His Majesty's service that they have been sent to the peninsula to fight the French, and not each other or members of the civilian population. While this campaign continues, and as long as I am in charge of it, I am determined not to suffer upon any plea whatever the abominable practice of dueling among those under my command. I desire you to publish this immediately in general orders, enjoining upon officers of all ranks, without exception, the necessity to postpone the settlement of private quarrels at least until the close of this campaign and to add force to this instruction you will make it known that any infringement of this order will be considered as a capital offence that any officer hereafter either sending or accepting a challenge will if found guilty by a general court-martial be immediately shot sir terence nodded slowly very well he said the measure is most wise although i doubt if it will be popular but then unpopularity is the fate of wise measures. I am glad the matter has not ended more seriously. The dispatches in question, so far as I can recollect, were not of great urgency. There is something more, said Captain Stanhope. The dispatches bore signs of having been tampered with. Tampered with? It was a question from Tremaine, charged with incredulity. But who would have tampered with them? There were signs, that is all. Garfield was taken to the house of the parish priest, where he lay lost, until he recovered sufficiently to realize his position for himself. No doubt you will have a schedule of the contents of the dispatch, Sir Terence. Certainly, it is in your possession, I think, Tremaine. Tremaine turned to his desk, in a brief search in one of its well-ordered drawers, brought to light an oblong strip of paper, folded and endorsed. He unfolded and spread it on Sir Terence's table, whilst Captain Stanhope, producing a note with which he came equipped, stooped to check off the items, and finally placed his finger under one of the lines of Tremaine's schedule, carefully studying his own note for a moment. Ha! Huh, he said quietly at last. What's this? And he read, Notes from Lord Liverpool of reinforcements to be embarked for Lisbon in June or July. He looked at the adjutant and the adjutant secretary. That would appear to be the most important document of all, indeed the only document of any vital importance, and it was not included in the dispatch as it reached Lord Wellington. The three looked gravely at one another in silence. Have you a copy of the note, sir? inquired the aide-de-camp. 
not a copy but a summary of its contents the figures it contained are penciled there on the margin tremaine answered allow me sir said stanhope and taking up a quill from the adjutant's table he rapidly copied the figures lord wellington must have this memorandum as soon as possible the rest sir terence is of course a manner for yourself you will know what to do meanwhile i shall report to his lordship what has occurred i had best set out at once if you will rest for an hour and give my wife the pleasure of your company at luncheon i shall have a letter ready for lord wellington replied sir terence perhaps you'll see to it tremaine he added without waiting for captain stanhope's answer to an invitation which amounted to a command thus stanhope was led away and sir terence all other matters forgotten for the moment sat down to write his letter later in the day after captain stanhope had taken his departure the duty fell to tremaine of framing the general order and seeing to the dispatch of a copy to each division i wonder he said to sir terence who will be the first to break it why the fool who's most anxious to be broke himself answered sir terence there appeared to be reservations about it in tremaine's mind it's a devilish stringent regulation he criticized but very salutary and very necessary oh quite tremaine's agreement was unhesitating but i shouldn't care to feel the restraint of it and i thank heaven i have no enemy thirsting for my blood sir terence's brow darkened his face was turned away from his secretary how can a man be confident of that he wondered oh a clean conscience i suppose laughed tremaine and he gave his attention to his papers frankness honesty and light-heartedness rang so clear in the words that they sowed in sir terence's mind fresh doubts of the galling suspicion he had been harboring do you boast a clean conscience eh ned he asked a not without a lurking shame at this deliberate sly searching of the other's mind yet he strained his ears for the answer almost clean said tremaine temptation doesn't stain when it's resisted does it sir terence trembled but he controlled himself nay now that's a question for the casuists they might answer you that it depends upon the temptation and he asked point blank what's tempting you tremaine was in a mood for confidences and sir terence was his friend but he hesitated his answer to the question was an irrelevance it's just hell to be poor omoy he said the adjutant turned to stare at him tremaine was sitting with his head resting on one hand the fingers thrusting through the crisp fair hair and there was gloom in his clear-cut face a dullness in the usually keen gray eyes is there anything on your mind quoth sir terence temptation was the answer it's an unpleasant thing to struggle against but you spoke of poverty to be sure if i weren't poor i could put my fortunes to the test and make an end of the matter one way or the other there was a pause sure i hope i'm the last man to force a confidence ned said o'moy but you certainly seem as if it would do you good to confide tremaine shook himself mentally i think we had better deal with the matter of this dispatch that was tampered with at penalva so we will to be sure but it can wait a minute sir terence pushed back his chair and rose he crossed to his secretary's side what's on your mind ned he asked with abrupt solicitude and ned could not suspect that it was the matter on sir terence's own mind that was urging him but urging him hopefully captain tremaine looked up with a rueful smile i thought you boasted that you never forced a confidence and then he looked away sylvia armitage tells me that she is thinking of returning to england for a moment the words seemed to sir terence a fresh irrelevance another attempt to change the subject then quite suddenly a light broke upon his mind shedding a relief so great and joyous that he sought to check it almost in fear it is more than she has told me he answered steadily but then no doubt you enjoy her confidence tremaine flashed him a wry glance and looked away again alas he said and fetched a sigh and is sylvia the temptation ned tremaine was silent for a while little dreaming how sir terence hung upon his answer 
how impatiently he awaited it. Of course, he said at last, isn't it obvious to anyone? And he grew rhapsodical. How can a man be daily in her company without succumbing to her loveliness, to her matchless grace of body and of mind, without perceiving that she is incomparable, peerless, as much above other women, as an angel perhaps might be above herself, before his glum solemnity, and before something else that Tremaine could not suspect. Sir Terence exploded into laughter. Of the immense and joyous relief in it, his secretary caught no hint. All he heard was its sheer amusement, and this galled and shamed him, for no man cares to be laughed at for such feelings as Tremaine had been led into betraying. You think it's something to laugh at, he said tartly. Laugh, is it? spluttered Sir Terence. God grant I don't burst a blood vessel. Tremaine reddened. When you've indulged in your humor, sir, he said stiffly, perhaps you'll consider the matter of this dispatch. But Sir Terence laughed more uproariously than ever. He came to stand beside Tremaine and slapped him heartily on the shoulder. You'll kill me, Ned, he protested. For God's sake, not so glum. If that makes you ridiculous. I'm sorry you find me ridiculous. Nay, then, it's glad you ought to be, by my soul. If Sylvia tempts you, man, why the devil don't you just succumb and have done with it? She's handsome enough and well set up with her air of an Amazon, and she rides uncommon straight the gad. Indeed, it's a broth of a girl she is in the hunting field, the ballroom, or at the breakfast table, although riper acquaintance may discover her not to be quite all that you imagine her at present. Let your temptation lead you, then, entirely, and good luck to you, my boy. Didn't I tell you, O'Moy? answered the captain, mollified a little by the sympathy and good feeling peeping through the adjutant's boisterousness. That poverty is just hell. It's my poverty that's in the way. And is that all? Then it's thankful you should be that Sylvia Armitage has got enough for two. That's just it. Just what? The obstacle. I could marry a poor woman, but Sylvia... Have you spoken to her? Tremaine was indignant. How do you suppose I could? It'll not have occurred to you that the lady may have feelings which, having aroused, you ought to be considering? A wry smile and a shake of the head was Tremaine's only answer, and then Carothers came in fresh from Lisbon, where he had been upon business connected with the commissariat, and to Tremaine's relief the subject was perforce abandoned. Yet he marveled several times that day that the hilarity he should have awakened in Sir Terence continued to cling to the adjutant and that despite the many vexatious matters claiming attention, he should preserve an irrepressible and almost boyish gaiety. Meanwhile, however, the coming of Carothers had brought the adjutant a moment's seriousness, and he reverted to the business of Captain Garfield. When he had mentioned the missing note, Carothers very properly became grave. He was a short, stiffly built man with a round, good-humored, rather florid face. The matter must be probed at once, sir he ventured. We know that we move in a tangle of intrigues and espionage, but such a thing as this has never happened before. Have you anything to go upon? Captain Stanhope gave us nothing, said the adjutant. It would be best, perhaps, to get Grant to look into it, said Tremaine. If he is still in Lisbon, said Sir Terence. I passed him in the street an hour ago, replied Carothers. Then by all means let a note be sent to him asking him if he will step up to Monsanto as soon as he conveniently can. You might see to it, Tremaine. End of chapter 9 Read by Peter Strom in Peru On February 23rd, 2019this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. The Stifled Quarrel It was noon of the next day before Colonel Grant came to the house at Monsanto, from whose balcony floated the British flag, and before whose portal stood a sentry in the tall bearskin of the grenadiers. He found the adjutant alone in his room, and apologized for the delay in responding to his invitation 
pleading the urgency of other matters that he had in hand. A wise enactment, this of Lord Wellington's, was his next comment. I mean this prohibition of dueling. It may be resented by some of our young bloods as an unwarrantable interference with their privileges, but it will do a deal of good, and no one can deny that there is ample cause for the measure. It's on the subject of the cause that I'm wanting to consult you, said Sir Terence, offering his visitor a chair. Have you been informed of the details? No. Let me give you them. And he related how the dispatch bore signs of having been tampered with, and how the only document of any real importance came to be missing from it. Colonel Grant, sitting with his saber across his knee, listened gravely and thoughtfully. In the end he shrugged his shoulders, the keen hawk face unmoved. The harm is done, and cannot very well be repaired. The information obtained, no doubt on behalf of Massena, will by now be on its way to him. Let us be thankful that the matter is not more grave, and thankful, too, that you were able to supply a copy of Lord Liverpool's figures. What do you want me to do? Take steps to discover the spy whose existence is disclosed by this event. Calcuhon Grant smiled. That is precisely the matter which has brought me to Lisbon. How? Sir Terence was amazed. You knew. Oh, not that this had happened but that the spy, or rather a network of espionage, existed. We move here in a web of intrigue, wrought by ill-will, self-interest, vindictiveness, and every form of malice, whilst the great bulk of the Portuguese people and their leaders are cooperating with us. There is a strong party opposing us, which would prefer even to see the French prevail. Of course you are aware of this. The heart and brain of all this is, as I gather, the principal Sousa. Wellington has compelled his retirement from the government, but if by doing so he has restricted the man's power for evil, he has certainly increased his will for evil and his activities. You tell me that Garfield was cared for by the parish priest at Penalva. There you are. Half the priesthood of the country are on Sousa's side, since the patriarch of Lisbon himself is little more than a tool of Sousa's. What happens? This priest discovers that the British officer, whom he has so charitably put to bed in his house, is the bearer of dispatches. A loyal man would instantly have communicated with Marshal Beresford at Thomar. This fellow, instead, advises the intriguers in Lisbon. The captain's dispatches are examined, and the only document of real value is abstracted. Of course it would be difficult to establish a case against the priest, and it is always vexatious and troublesome to have dealings with that class, as it generally means trouble with the peasantry. But the case is as clear as crystal. But the intriguers here, can you not deal with them? I have them under observation replied the colonel. I already knew the leaders, Sousa's lieutenants in Lisbon, and I can put my hand upon them at any moment. If I have not already done so, it is because I find it more profitable to leave them at large. It is possible, indeed, that I may never proceed to extremes against them. Conceive that they have enabled me to seize La Fleche, the most dangerous, insidious, and skilful of all Napoleon's agents. I found him at Redondo's ball last week in the uniform of a Portuguese major, and through him I was able to track down Sousa's chief instrument. I discovered them closeted with him in one of the card rooms. And you didn't arrest them? Arrest them? I apologized for my intrusion and withdrew. La Fleche took his leave of them. He was to have left Lisbon at dawn, equipped with a passport, countersigned by yourself, my dear adjutant. What's that? A passport for Major Vieira, of the Portuguese Cacadores. Do you remember it? Major Vieira. Sir Terence frowned thoughtfully. Suddenly he recollected. 
but that was countersigned by me at the request of Count Samoval, who represented himself a personal friend of the Major's. So, indeed, he is. But the Major in question was La Fleche, nevertheless. And Samoval knew this? Sir Terence was incredulous. Colonel Grant did not immediately answer the question. He preferred to continue his narrative. That night I had the false major arrested very quietly. I caused him to disappear for the present. His Lisbon friends believe him to be on his way to Messena, with the information they no doubt supplied him. Messena awaits his return at Salamanca, and will continue to wait. Thus, when he fails to be seen or heard of, there will be a good deal of mystification on all sides, which is the proper state of mind in which to place your opponents. Lord Liverpool's figures, let me add, were not among the interesting notes found upon him, possibly because at that date they had not yet been obtained. And you say that Samoval was aware of the man's real identity? insisted Sir Terence, still incredulous. Aware of it? Colonel Grant laughed shortly. Samoval is Sousa's principal agent, the most dangerous man in Lisbon, and the most subtle. His sympathies are French through and through. Sir Terence stared at him in frank amazement, in utter unbelief. Oh, impossible, he ejaculated at last. I saw Samoval for the first time, said Colonel Grant by way of answer, in a porto at the time of Soult's occupation. He did not call himself Samoval just then, any more than I called myself Colquhoun Grant. He was very active there in the French interest. I should indeed be more precise and say in Bonaparte's interest, for he was the man instrumental in disclosing to Soult the Bourbon conspiracy which was undermining the Marshal's army. You do not know, perhaps, that French sympathy runs in Samoval's family. You may not be aware that the Portuguese Marquis of Alorna, who holds a command in the Emperor's army, and is at present with Messena at Salamanca, is Samoval's cousin. But, faltered Sir Terence, Count Samoval has been a regular visitor here for the past three months. So I understand, said Grant Cooley. If I had known it before, I should have warned you. But as you are aware, I have been in Spain on other business. You realize the danger of having such a man about the place, scraps of information. Oh, as to that, Sir Terence interrupted, I can assure you that none have fallen from my official table. Never be too sure, Sir Terence. Matters here must ever be under discussion. There are your secretaries, and the ladies, and Samoval has a great way with the women. What they know you may wager that he knows. They know nothing. That is a great deal to say. Little odds and ends now. A hint at one time. A word dropped at another. These things picked up naturally by feminine curiosity, and retailed thoughtlessly under Samoval's charming suasion and display of Britannic sympathies, and Samoval has the devil's own talent for bringing together the pieces of a puzzle. Take the lines now. You may have parted with no details, but mention of them will surely have been made in this household. However, he broke off abruptly. That is all past and done with. I am as sure as you are that any real indiscretions in this household are unimaginable and so we may be confident that no harm has yet been done. But you will gather from what I have now told you that Samoval's visits here are not a mere social waste of time, that he comes, acquires familiarity, and makes himself the friend of the family with a very definite aim in view. He does not come again, said Sir Terence, rising. That is more than I should have ventured to suggest but it is a very wise resolve. It will need tact to carry it out, for Samoval is a man to be handled carefully. I'll handle him carefully, devil of fear, said Sir Terence. You can depend upon my tact. Colonel Grant rose. 
In this matter of Penalva, I will consider further, but I do not think there is anything to be done now. The main thing is to stop up the outlets through which information reaches the French, and that is my chief concern. How is the stripping of the country proceeding now? It was more active immediately after Sousa left the government, but the last reports announce a slackening again. They are at work in that too, you see. Sousa will not slumber while there's vengeance and self-interest to keep him awake and he held out his hand to Lee. "'You'll stay to luncheon,' said Sir Terence. "'It is about to be served.' "'You are very kind, Sir Terence.' They descended to find luncheon served already in the open under the trellis vine, and the party consisted of Lady O'Moy, Miss Armitage, Captain Tremaine, Major Carruthers, and Count Samoval, of whose presence this was the adjutant's first intimation. As a matter of fact, the Count had been at Monsanto for the past hour, the first half of which he had spent most agreeably on the terrace with the ladies. He had spoken so eulogistically of the genius of Lord Wellington and the valor of the British soldier, and particularly of the Irish soldier, that even Sylvia's instinctive distrust and dislike of him had been lulled a little for the moment. And they must prevail, he had exclaimed in a glow of enthusiasm his dark eyes flashing it is inconceivable that they should ever yield to the french although the odds of numbers may lie so heavily against them are the odds of numbers so heavy said lady o'moy in surprise opening wide those almost childish eyes of hers alas anything from three to five to one Ah, but why should we despond on that account? And his voice vibrated with renewed confidence. The country is a difficult one, easy to defend, and Lord Wellington's genius will have made the best of it. There are, for example, the fortifications at Torres Vedras. Ah, yes, I have heard of them. Tell me about them, Count. Tell you about them, dear lady. Shall I carry perfumes to the rose? What can I tell you that you do not know, so much better than myself? Indeed, I know nothing. Sir Terence is ridiculously secretive, she assured him, with a little frown of petulance. She realized that her husband did not treat her as an intelligent being to be consulted upon these matters. She was his wife, and he had no right to keep secrets from her. In fact, she said so. Indeed, no, Samoval agreed and I find it hard to credit that it should be so. Then you forget, said Sylvia, that these secrets are not Sir Terence's own. They are the secrets of his office. Perhaps so, said the unabashed Samoval. But if I were Sir Terence, I should desire above all to allay my wife's natural anxiety. For I am sure you must be anxious, dear Lady O'Moy, Naturally, she agreed, whose anxieties never transcended the fit of her gowns or the suitability of a coiffure. But Terence is like that. Incredible, the Count protested, and raised his dark eyes to heaven as if invoking its punishment upon so unnatural a husband. Do you tell me that you have never so much as seen the plans of these fortifications? The plans, Count. She almost laughed. Ah, he said, I dare swear, then, that you do not even know of their existence. He was jocular now. I am sure that she does not, said Sylvia, who instinctively felt that the conversation was following an undesirable course. Then you are wrong, she was assured. I saw them once a week ago in Sir Terence's room. Why, how would you know them if you saw them? quoth Sylvia, seeking to cover what might be an indiscretion. Because they bore the name, lines of Torres Vedras, I remember. And this unsympathetic Sir Terence did not explain them to you? laughed Samoval. Indeed he did not. In fact, I could swear that he locked them away from you at once. The Count continued on a jocular note. Not at once, but he certainly locked them away soon after. 
and whilst I was still there. In your place, then, said Samoval, ever on the same note of banter, I should have been tempted to steal the key. Not so easily done, she assured him. It never leaves his person. He wears it on a gold chain round his neck. What, always? Always, I assure you. Too bad, protested Samoval. Too bad indeed. What, then, should you have done, Miss Armitage? It was difficult to imagine that he was drawing information from them. So bantering and frivolous was his manner. More difficult still to conceive that he had obtained any. Yet you will observe that he had been placed in possession of two facts, that the plans of the lines of Taurus Vedras were kept locked up in Sir Terence's own room, in the strong box, no doubt, and that Sir Terence always carried the key on a gold chain worn round his neck. Miss Armitage laughed. Whatever I might do, I should not be guilty of prying into matters that my husband kept hidden. Then you admit a husband's right to keep matters hidden from his wife? Why not? Madame, Samoval bowed to her, your future husband is to be envied on yet another count. And thus the conversation drifted, Samoval conceiving that he had obtained all the information of which Lady O'Moy was possessed, and satisfied that he had obtained all that for the moment he required. How to proceed now was a more difficult matter, to be very seriously considered. How to obtain from Sir Terence the key in question, and reach the plans so essential to Marshal Massena? He was at table with them, as you know, when Sir Terence and Colonel Grant arrived. He and the colonel were presented to each other, and bowed with a gravity quite cordial on the part of Samoval, who was by far the more subtle dissembler of the two. Each knew the other perfectly for what he was, yet each was in complete ignorance of the extent of the other's knowledge of himself, and certainly neither betrayed anything by his manner. At table the conversation was led naturally enough by Tremaine to Wellington's general order against doing. This was inevitable when you consider that it was a topic of conversation that morning at every table to which British officers sat down. Tremaine spoke of the measure in terms of warm commendation, thereby provoking a sharp disagreement from Samoval. The deep and almost instinctive hostility between these two men, which had often been revealed in momentary flashes, was such that it must invariably lead them to take opposing sides in any matter admitting of contention in my opinion it is a most arbitrary and degrading enactment said samoval i say so without hesitation notwithstanding my profound admiration and respect for lord wellington and all his measures degrading echoed grant looking across at him in what can it be degrading count in that it reduces a gentleman to the level of the clod, was the prompt answer. A gentleman must have his quarrels, however sweet his disposition, and a means must be afforded him of settling them. He can always thrash an impudent fellow, opined the adjutant. Thrash, echoed Samoval, his sensitive lip curled in disdain to use your hands upon a man. He shuddered in sheer disgust. To one of my temperament it would be impossible, and men of my temperament are plentiful, I think. But if you were thrashed yourself, Tremaine asked him, and the light in his gray eyes almost hinted at a dark desire to be himself the executioner. Samoval's dark handsome eyes considered the captain steadily, to be thrashed myself he questioned my dear captain the idea of having hands laid upon me soiling me brutalizing me is so nauseating so repugnant that i assure you i should not hesitate to shoot the man who did it just as i should shoot any other wild beast that attacked me indeed the two instances are exactly parallel, and my country's court would uphold in such a case 
the justice of my conduct. Then you may thank God, said O'Moy, that you are not under British jurisdiction. I do, snapped Samoval, to make an instant recovery, at least so far as the matter is concerned. And he elaborated, I assure you, sirs, it will be an evil day for the nobility of any country when its government enacts against the satisfaction that one gentleman has the right to demand from another who offends him. Isn't the conversation rather too bloodthirsty for a luncheon table? wondered Lady O'Moy, and tactlessly she added, thinking with flattery to mollify Samoval and cool his obvious heat. You are yourself such a famous swordsman, Count. And then Tremaine's dislike of the man betrayed him into his deplorable phrase. At the present time Portugal is in urgent need of her famous swordsman to go against the French, and not to increase the disorders at home. A silence, complete and ominous, followed the rash words. And Samoval, white to the lips, pondered the imperturbable captain with a baleful eye. I think, he said at last, speaking slowly and softly, and picking his words with care, I think that is unuendo. I should be relieved, Captain Tremaine, to hear you say that it is not. Tremaine was prompt to give him the assurance. No innuendo at all, a plain statement of fact. The innuendo I suggested lay in the application of the phrase, do you make it personal to myself? Of course not. Of course not, said Sir Terence, cutting in and speaking sharply. What an assumption! I am asking Captain Tremaine, the Count insisted with grim firmness, notwithstanding his deferential smile to Sir Terence. I spoke quite generally, sir, Tremaine assured him, partly under the suasion of Sir Terence's interposition, partly out of consideration for the ladies, who were looking scared. Of course, if you choose to take it to yourself, sir, that is a matter for your own discretion. I think, he added, also with a smile, that the ladies find the topic tiresome. Perhaps we may have the pleasure of continuing it when they are no longer present. Oh, as you please, was the indifferent answer. Carithers, may I trouble you to pass the salt? Lady O'Callaghan was complaining the other night of the abuse of salt in Portuguese cookery. It is an abuse I have never yet detected. I can't conceive Lady O'Callaghan complaining of too much salt in anything, begad, quoth O'Moy with a laugh. If you had heard the story she told me about— Terence, my dear, his wife checked him, her fine brows raised, her stare rigid. Faith, we go from bad to worse, said Carithers. Will you try to improve the tone of the conversation, Miss Armitage? It stands in urgent need of it. With a general laugh, breaking the ice of the restraint that was in danger of settling about the table, a semblance of ease was restored, and this was maintained until the end of the repast. At last the ladies rose, and leaving the men at table, they sauntered off towards the terrace. But under the archway, Sylvia checked her cousin. Una she said gravely. You had better call Captain Tremaine and take him away for the present. Una's eyes opened wide. Why? she inquired. Miss Armitage was almost impatient with her. Didn't you see? Resentment is only slumbering between those men. It will break out again now that we have left them unless you can get Captain Tremaine away. Una continued to look at her cousin and then, her mind fastening ever upon the trivial, to the exclusion of the important, her glance became arch. "'For whom is your concern, for Count Samoval or Ned?' she inquired, and added with a laugh. "'You needn't answer me. It is Ned you are afraid for.' "'I am certainly not afraid for him,' was the reply on a faint note of indignation. She had reddened slightly." but I should not like to see Captain Tremaine or any other British officer embroiled in a duel. You forget Lord Wellington's order which they were discussing and the consequences of infringing it. Lady O'Moy became scared. You don't imagine. Sylvia spoke quickly. 
I am certain that unless you take Captain Tremaine away, and at once, there will be serious trouble. And now behold Lady O'Moy thrown into a state of alarm that bordered upon terror. She had more reason than Sylvia could dream, more reason she conceived than Sylvia herself, to wish to keep Captain Tremaine out of trouble just at present. Instantly, agitatedly, she turned and called to him. Ned! floated her silvery voice across the enclosed garden, and again, Ned, I want you at once, please. Captain Tremaine rose. Grant was talking briskly at the time, his intention being to cover Tremaine's retreat, which he himself desired. Count Samoval's smoldering eyes were upon the captain, and full of menace, but he could not be guilty of the rudeness of interrupting Grant, or of detaining Captain Tremaine, when a lady called him. End of chapter 10 Read by Peter Strom in Peru On February 23rd, 2019Chapter 11 of The Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Challenge. Rebuke awaited Captain Tremaine at the hands of Lady O'Moy, and it came as soon as they were alone together sauntering in the thicket of pine and cork oak on the slope of the hill below the terrace. How thoughtless of you, Ned! to provoke Count Samoval at such a time as this. Did I provoke him? I thought it was the Count himself who was provoking. Tremaine spoke lightly. But suppose anything were to happen to you. You know the man's dreadful reputation. Tremaine looked at her kindly. This apparent concern for himself touched him. My dear Una, I hope I can take care of myself, even against so formidable a fellow. And after all, a man must take his chances, a soldier especially. But what of Dick? she cried. Do you forget that he is depending entirely upon you? That if you should fail him, he will be lost? And there was something akin to indignation in the protesting eyes she turned upon him. For a moment, Tremaine was so amazed that he was at a loss for an answer. Then he smiled. Indeed, his inclination was to laugh outright. The frank admission that her concern, which he had fondly imagined to be for himself, was all for Dick, betrayed a state of mind that was entirely typical of Una. Never had she been able to command more than one point of view of any question, and that point of view invariably of her own interest. All her life she had been accustomed to sacrifices, great and small, made by others on her own behalf until she had come to look upon such sacrifices her absolute right. I am glad you reminded me, he said with an irony that never touched her. You may depend upon me to be discreetness itself, at least until after Dick has been safely shipped. Thank you, Ned. You are very good to me. They sauntered a little way in silence. Then, when does Captain Glenny sail? she asked him. Is it decided yet? Yes, I have just heard from him, that the telematches will put to sea on Sunday morning at two o'clock. At two o'clock in the morning. What an uncomfortable hour. Tides, as King Canute discovered, are beyond mortal control. The telematches goes out with the ebb, and after all, for our purposes, surely no hour could be more suitable. If I come for Dick at midnight tomorrow, that will give us time to get him snugly aboard before she sails. I have made all arrangements with Glenny. He believes Dick to be what he has represented himself. One of Beersley's overseers named Jenkinson, who is a friend of mine, and who must be got out of the country quietly. Dick should thank his luck for a good deal. My chief anxiety was lest his presence here should be discovered by anyone. Beyond Bridget, not a soul knows that he is here, not even Sylvia. You have been the soul of discreetness. Haven't I? she purred, delighted to have him discover a virtue so unusual in her. Thereafter they discussed details, or rather Tremaine discussed them. He would come up to Monsanto at twelve o'clock tomorrow night in a curricle in which he would drive Dick down to the river at a point where a boat would be waiting to take him out to the telemachus. She must see that Dick was ready in time. The rest she could safely leave to him. 
he would come in through the official wing of the building. The guard would admit him without question, accustomed to seeing him come and go at all hours. Nor would it be remarked that he was accompanied by a man in civilian dress when he departed. Dick was to be let down from her ladyship's balcony to the quadrangle by a rope ladder with which Tremaine would come equipped, having procured it for the purpose from the telematches. She hung upon his arm, overwhelming him now with her gratitude, her parasol sheltering them both from the rays of the sun as they emerged from the thicket into the meadowland in full view of the terrace, where Count Samoval and Sir Terence were at that moment talking earnestly together. You will remember that O'Moy had undertaken to provide that Count Samoval's visits to Monsanto should be discontinued. About this task he had gone with all the tact of which he had boasted himself master to Colquhoun Grant. You shall judge of the tact for yourself. No sooner had the colonel left for Lisbon, and Carothers to return to his work, than, finding himself alone with the count, Sir Terence considered the moment a choice one in which to broach the matter. "'I take it you are fond of walking, Count,' had been his singular opening move. They had left the table by now, and were sauntering together on the terrace. "'Walking,' said Samoval. "'I detest it.' "'And is that so? Well, well, of course it's not so very far from your place at Bispo.' "'Not more than half a league, I should say.' "'Just so,' said O'Moy. "'Half a league there and half a league back. A league.' It's nothing at all. Of course, yet for a gentleman who detests walking, it's a devilish long tramp for nothing. For nothing? Samoval checked and looked at his host in faint surprise. Then he smiled very affably. But you must not say that, Sir Terence. I assure you that the pleasure of seeing yourself and Lady O'Moy cannot be spoken of as nothing. You are very good. Sir Terence was the very quintessence of courtliness, of concern for the other. But if there were not that pleasure, then, of course, it would be different. Samoval was beginning to be slightly intrigued. That's it, said Sir Terence. That's just what I'm meaning. Just what you're meaning. But, my dear General, you are assuming circumstances which fortunately do not exist. Not at present, perhaps, but they might. Again Samoval stood still and looked at O'Moy. He found something in that bronzed, rugged face that was unusually sardonic. The blue eyes seemed to have become hard, and yet there were wrinkles about their corners suggestive of humor that might be mockery. The Count stiffened, but beyond that he preserved his outward calm whilst confessing that he did not understand Sir Terence's meaning. "'It's this way,' said Sir Terence. "'I've noticed that you're not looking so very well lately, Count.' "'Really, you think that?' The words were mechanical. The dark eyes continued to scrutinize that bronzed face suspiciously. "'I do, and it's sorry I am to see it. But I know what it is. It's this walking backwards and forwards between here and Bispo that's doing the mischief. Better give it up, Count.' Better not come toiling up here any more. It's not good for your health. Why, man, you're as white as a ghost this minute. He was, indeed, having perceived at last the insult intended. To be denied the house at such a time was to checkmate his designs, to set a term upon his crafty and subtle espionage, precisely in the season when he hoped to reap its harvest. But his chagrin sprang not at all from that. His cold anger was purely personal. He was a gentleman, of the fine flower, as he would have described himself, of the nobility of Portugal, and that a probably upstart Irish soldier, himself from Samoval's point of view, a guest in that country, should deny him his house, and choose such terms of ill-considered jocularity in which to do it, was an affront beyond all endurance. For a moment passion blinded him, and it was only by an effort that he recovered and kept his self-control. But keep it he did. You may trust your practiced duelist for that when he comes face to face with the necessity to demand satisfaction. And soon the mist of passion clearing from his keen wits, he sought swiftly for a means to fasten the quarrel upon Sir Terence 
in Sir Terence's own coin of galling mockery. Instantly he found it. Indeed, it was not far to seek. O'Moy's jealousy, which was almost a byword, as we know, had been apparent more than once to Samoval. Remembering it now, it discovered to him at once Sir Terence's most vulnerable spot, and cunningly Samoval proceeded to gall him there. A smile spread gradually over his white face, a smile of immeasurable malice. I am having a very interesting and instructive morning in this atmosphere of Irish boorishness, said he. First, Captain Tremaine. Now don't be after blaming old Ireland for Tremaine's shortcomings. Tremaine's just a clumsy-mannered Englishman. I am glad to know there is a distinction. Indeed, I might have perceived it for myself. In motives, of course, that distinction is great indeed, and I hope that I am not slow to discover it, and in your case, to excuse it. I quite understand, and even sympathize with your feelings, General. I am glad of that now, said Sir Terence, who had understood nothing of all this naturally naturally the count pursued on a smooth level note of amiability when a man himself no longer young commits the folly of taking a young and charming wife he is to be forgiven when a natural anxiety drives him to links which in another might be resented he bowed before the empurpling sir terence "'You're a damned coxcomb, it seems,' was the answering roar. "'Of course you would assume it. It was to be expected. I condone it with the rest. And because I condone it, because I sympathize with what, in a man of your age and temperament, must amount to an affliction, I hasten to assure you upon my honor that so far as I am concerned, there are no grounds for your anxiety.' "'And who the devil asks for your assurances? "'It's stark mad ye are to suppose that I ever needed them.' "'Of course you must say that,' Samoval insisted, "'with a confident and superior smile. "'He shook his head, his expression one of amused sorrow. "'Sir Terence, Sir Terence, you have knocked at the wrong door. "'You are youthful, at least, in your impulsiveness.' but you are surely as blind as old pantaloon in the comedy or you would see where your industry would be better employed in shielding your wife's honour and your own goaded to fury his blue eyes aflame now with passion sir terence considered the sleek and subtle gentleman before him and it was in that moment that the count's subtlety soared to its finest heights in a flash of inspiration he perceived the advantages to be drawn by himself from conducting this quarrel to extremes. This is not mere idle speculation. Knowledge of the real motives actuating him rests upon the evidence of a letter which Samoval was to write that same evening to La Fleche, afterwards to be discovered, wherein he related what had passed, how deliberately he had steered the matter, and what he meant to do. His object was no longer the punishing of an affront, that would happen as a mere incident, a thing done, as it were, in passing. His real aim now was to obtain the keys of the adjutant's strong-box, which never left Sir Terence's person, and so become possessed of the plans of the lines of Torres Vedras. When you consider in the light of this the manner in which Semival proceeded, now you will admire with me at once the opportunism and the subtlety of the man. "'You'll be after telling me exactly what you mean,' Sir Terence had said. It was in that moment that Tremaine and Lady O'Moy came arm in arm into the open on the hillside, half a mile away, very close and confidential. They came most opportunely to the Count's need, and he flung out a hand to indicate them to Sir Terence, a smile of pity on his lips. "'You need but to look.' to take the answer for yourself, said he. Sir Terence looked and laughed. He knew the secret of Ned Tremaine's heart, and could laugh now with relish at that which hitherto had left him darkly suspicious. And who shall blame Lady O'Moy? 
Count Samoval pursued. A lady so charming and so courted must seek her consolation for the almost unnatural union fate has imposed upon her. Captain Tremaine is of her own age, convenient to her hand, and for an Englishman not ill-looking. He smiled at O'Moy with insolent compassion, and O'Moy, losing all his self-control, struck him, slapped him resoundingly upon the cheek. "'You're a dirty liar, Samoval, a muckrake,' said he. Samoval stepped back, breathing hard, one cheek red, the other white. Yet by a miracle he still preserved his self-control. "'I have proved my courage too often,' said he, "'to be under the necessity of killing you for this blow. "'Since my honor is safe, "'I will not take advantage of your overwrought condition.' "'You'll take advantage of it whether you like it or not,' "'blazed Sir Terence at him. "'I mean you to take advantage of it. "'Do you think I'll suffer any man to cast a slur upon Lady O'Moy? "'I'll be sending my friends to wait on you today, Count. "'And by God, Tremaine shall be one of them.' Thus did the hot-headed fellow deliver himself into the hands of his enemy. Nor was he warned when he saw the sudden gleam in Samoval's dark eyes. Ha! Huh, said the Count. It was a little exclamation of wicked satisfaction. You are offering me a challenge, then. If I may make so bold, and as I've a mind to shoot you dead. Shoot, did you say? Samoval interrupted gently. I said shoot, and it shall be at ten paces, or across a handkerchief, or any damn distance you please. The Count shook his head. He sneered. I think not, not shoot. And he waved the notion aside with a hand white and slender as a woman's. That is too English, or too Irish, the pistol, I mean, appropriately a fool's weapon and he explained himself, explained at last his extraordinary forbearance under a blow. If you think I have practiced the small sword every day of my life for ten years to suffer myself to be shot at like a rabbit in the end, oh, really, he laughed aloud, you have challenged me, I think, Sir Terence, because I feared the predilection you have discovered. I was careful to wait until the challenge came from you. The choice of weapon lies, I think, with me. I shall instruct my friends to ask for swords. Sorry a difference will it make to me, said Sir Terence. Anything from a horsewhip to a howitzer. And then recollection descending like a cold hand upon him, chilled his hot rage, struck the fine Irish arrogance all out of him, and left him suddenly limp. "'My God!' he said. It was almost a groan. He detained Samoval, who had already turned to depart. "'A moment, Count,' he cried. "'I, I had forgotten. There is the general order. Lord Wellington's enactment.' "'Awkward, of course,' said Samoval, who had never for a moment been oblivious of that enactment, and who had been carefully building upon it. But you should have considered it before committing yourself so irrevocably. Sir Terence steadied himself. He recovered his truculence. Irrevocable or not, it will just have to be revocable. The meeting's impossible. I do not see the impossibility. I am not surprised you should shelter yourself behind an enactment. But you will remember this enactment does not imply to me, who am not a soldier. But it applies to me, who am not only a soldier, but the adjutant general here, the man chiefly responsible for seeing the order carried out. It would be a fine thing if I were the first to disregard it. I am afraid it is too late. You have disregarded it already, sir. How so? The letter of the law is against sending or receiving a challenge, I think. O'Moy was distracted. Samoval, he said, drawing himself up. I will admit that I have been a fool, 
I will apologize to you for the blow and for the word that accompanied it. The apology would imply that my statement was a true one, and that you recognized it. If you mean that... I mean nothing of that kind, damn me. I've a mind to horsewhip you and leave it at that. Do you think I want to face a firing party on your account? I don't think there is the remotest likelihood of any such contingency, replied Samoval. But Omoy went headlong on. And another thing. Where will I be finding a friend to meet your friends? Who will dare to act for me in view of that enactment? The Count considered. He was grave now. Of course that is a difficulty, he admitted, as if he perceived it now for the first time. Under the circumstances, Sir Terence, and entirely to accommodate you, I might consent to dispense with seconds. Dispense with seconds? Sir Terence was horrified at the suggestion. You know that that is irregular, that a charge of murder would lie against the survivor. Oh, quite so, but it is for your own convenience that I suggest it, though I appreciate your considerate concern on the score of what may happen to me afterwards, should it come to be known that I was your opponent. Afterwards? After what? After I have killed you. And is it like that? cried O'Moy, his countenance inflaming again, his mind casting all prudence to the winds. It followed, of course, that without further thought for anything but the satisfaction of his rage, Sir Terence became as wax in the hands of Samoval's desires. Where do you suggest that we meet? he asked. There is my place at Bispo. We should be private in the gardens there. As for time, the sooner the better. Though for secrecy's sake, we had better meet at night. Shall we say at midnight? But Terence would agree to none of this. Tonight is out of the question for me. I have an engagement that will keep me until late. Tomorrow night, if you will, I shall be at your service. And because he did not trust Samoval, he added, as Samoval himself had almost reckoned, But I should prefer not to come to Bispo. I might be seen going or returning. Since there are no such scruples on my side, I am ready to come to you, here, if you prefer it. It would suit me better. Then expect me promptly at midnight, tomorrow, provided that you can arrange to admit me without my being seen. You will perceive my reasons. Those gates will be closed, said O'Moy, indicating the now gaping massive doors that closed the archway at night. But if you knock, I shall be waiting for you and I will admit you by the wicket. Excellent, said Samoval suavely. Then, until tomorrow night, General. He bowed with almost extravagant submission, and turning walked sharply away, energy and suppleness in every line of his slight figure, leaving Sir Terence to the unpleasant, almost desperate thoughts that reflection must usher in as his anger faded. End of chapter 11 Read by Peter Strom, in the Cusco Valley, Peru, on February 23rd, 2019. Chapter 12 of The Snare by Raphael Sabatini This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 The Duel it was a time of stress and even of temptation for Sir Terence. Honor and pride demanded that he should keep the appointment made with Samoval. Common sense urged him at all costs to avoid it. His frame of mind, you see, was not at all enviable. At moments he would consider his position as adjutant general, the enactment against dueling, the irregularity of the meeting arranged, and consequently the danger in which he stood on every score. At others he could think of nothing but the unpardonable affront that had been offered him, and the venomously insulting manner in which it had been offered, and his rage welled up to blot out every consideration other than that of punishing Samoval. For two days and a night he was a sort of shuttlecock, tossed between these alternating moods, 
and he was still the same when he paced the quadrangle with bowed head and hands clasped behind him, awaiting Samoval at a few minutes before twelve on the following night. The windows that looked down from the four sides of that enclosed garden were all in darkness. The members of the household had withdrawn over an hour ago and were asleep by now. The official quarters were closed. The rising moon had just mounted above the eastern wing, and its white light fell upon the upper half of the façade of the residential site. The quadrangle itself remained plunged in gloom. Sir Terence pacing there was considering the only definite conclusion he had reached. If there were no way even now of avoiding this duel, at least it must remain secret. Therefore it could not take place here in the enclosed garden of his own quarters, as he had so rashly consented. It should be fought upon neutral ground, where the presence of the body of the slain would not call for explanations by the survivor. From distant Lisbon on the still air came softly the chimes of midnight, and immediately there was a sharp rap upon the little door set in one of the massive gates that closed the archway. Sir Terence went to open the wicket, and Samoval stepped quickly over the sill. He was wrapped in a dark cloak. A broad-brimmed hat obscured his face. Sir Terence closed the door again. The two men bowed to each other in silence, and as Samoval's cloak fell open, he produced a pair of dueling swords, swathed together in a skin of leather. "'You are very punctual, sir,' said O'Moy. I hope I shall never be so discourteous as to keep an opponent waiting. It is a thing of which I have never yet been guilty, replied Samoval with deadly smoothness in that reminder of his victorious past. He stepped forward and looked about the quadrangle. I am afraid the moon will occasion us some delay, he said. It were perhaps better to wait some five or ten minutes. By then the light in here should have improved. We can avoid the delay by stepping out into the open, said Sir Terence. Indeed, it is what I had to suggest in any case. There are inconveniences here which you may have overlooked. But Samoval, who had purposes to serve of which this duel was but a preliminary, was of a very different mind. We are quite private here, your household being a bed, he answered, whilst outside one can never be sure, even at this hour of avoiding witnesses and interruptions. Then again the turf is smooth as a table on that patch of lawn, and the ground well known to both of us. That, I can assure you, is a very necessary condition in the dark, and one not to be found haphazard in the open. But there is yet another consideration, sir. I prefer that we engage on neutral ground so that the survivor shall not be called upon for explanations that might be demanded if we fought here. Even in the gloom Sir Terence caught the flash of Samoval's white teeth as he smiled. You trouble yourself unnecessarily on my account, was the smooth and ironic answer. No one has seen me come, and no one is likely to see me depart. You may be sure that no one shall, by God, snapped O'Moy, "'stung by the sly insolence of the other's assurance. "'Shall we set to work, then?' Samoval invited. "'If you're set on dying here, I suppose I must be after humoring you, "'and make the best of it. As soon as you please, then.' "'Omoy was very fierce. "'They stepped to the patch of lawn in the middle of the quadrangle, "'and there Samoval threw off altogether his cloak and hat. "'He was closely dressed in black.' which in that light rendered him almost invisible. Sir Terence, less practiced and less calculating in these matters, wore an undress uniform, the red coat of which showed grayish. Samoval observed this rather with contempt than with satisfaction in the advantage it afforded him. Then he removed the swathing from the swords, and crossing them, presented the hilts to Sir Terence. The adjutant took one, and the count retained the other, which he tested, thrashing the air with it so that it hummed like a whip. That done, however, he did not immediately fall on. "'In a few minutes the moon will be more obliging,' he suggested. 
if you would prefer to wait. But it occurred to Sir Terence that in the gloom the advantage might lie slightly with himself, since the other's superior sword-play would perhaps be partly neutralized. He cast a last look round at the dark windows. "'I find it light enough,' he answered. Samoval's reply was instantaneous. "'On guard, then!' he cried, and on the words, without giving Sir Terence so much as time to comply with the invitation, he whirled his point straight and deadly at the grayish outline of his opponent's body. But a ray of moonlight caught the blade, and its livid flash gave Sir Terence warning of the thrust so treacherously delivered. He saved himself by leaping backwards, just saved himself with not an inch to spare, and threw up his blade to meet the thrust. "'Ye murderous villain!' he snarled under his breath, as steel ground on steel, and he flung forward to the attack. But from the gloom came a little laugh to answer him and his angry lunge was foiled by an enveloping movement that ended in a riposte. With that they settled down to it, Sir Terence in a rage upon which that assassin stroke had been fresh fuel, the Count cool and unhurried, delaying until the moonlight should have crept a little farther, so as to enable him to make quite sure that his stroke, when delivered, should be final. Meanwhile he pressed Sir Terence towards the side where the moonlight would strike first, until they were fighting close under the windows of the residential wing, Sir Terence with his back to them, Samoval facing them. It was fate that placed them so, the fate that watched over Sir Terence even now when he felt his strength failing him, his sword arm turning to lead under the strain of an unwanted exercise. He knew himself beaten, realized the dexterous ease, the masterly economy of vigor, and the deadly sureness of his opponent's play. He knew that he was at the mercy of Samoval. He was even beginning to wonder why the Count should delay to make an end of the situation of which he was so completely master. And then, quite suddenly, even as he was returning thanks that he had taken the precaution of putting all his affairs in order, something happened. A light showed, it flared up suddenly, to be as suddenly extinguished, and it had its source in the window of Lady Omoy's dressing-room, which Samoval was facing. That flash, drawing off the Count's eyes for one instant and leaving them blinded for another, had revealed him clearly at the same time to Sir Terence. Sir Terence's blade darted in, driven by all that was left of his spent strength, and Samoval, his eyes unseen, in that moment had fumbled widely and failed to find the other's steel until he felt it sinking through his body, searing him from breast to back. His arms sank to his sides, quite nervelessly. He uttered a faint exclamation of astonishment, almost instantly interrupted by a cough. He swayed there a moment, the cough increasing until it choked him. Then, suddenly limp, he pitched forward upon his face and lay clawing and twitching at Sir Terence's feet. Sir Terence himself, scarcely realizing what had taken place, for the whole thing had happened within the time of a couple of heartbeats, stood quite still, amazed and awed in a half-crouching attitude, looking down at the body of the fallen man, and then from above, ringing upon the deathly stillness, he caught a sibilant whisper. What was that? Shh! He stepped back softly and flattened himself instinctively against the wall, thence profoundly intrigued and vaguely alarmed on several scores. He peered up at the window of his wife's room. The sound had come, whence the sudden light had come, which, as he now realized, had given him the victory in that unequal contest. Looking up at the balcony in whose shadow he stood concealed, he saw two figures there, his wife's and another's, and at the same time, he caught sight of something black that dangled from the narrow balcony, and peered more closely to discover a rope ladder. He felt his skin roughening, bristling like a dog's. He was conscious of being cold from head to foot, as if the flow of his blood had been suddenly arrested, and a sense of sickness overcame him, and then to turn that horrible doubt of his into still more horrible certainty came a man's voice, subdued, yet not so subdued but that he recognized it for Ned Tremaine's. 
There's someone lying there. I can make out the figure. Don't go down. For pity's sake, come back. Come back and wait, Ned. If anyone should come and find you, we shall be ruined. Thus hoarsely whispering, vibrating with terror, the voice of his wife reached Omoy to confirm him the unsuspecting blind cuckold that Samoval had dubbed him to his face, for which Samoval, warning the guilty pair with his last breath even as he had earlier so mockingly warned Sir Terence, had coughed up his soul on the turf of that enclosed garden. Crouching there for a moment longer, a man bereft of movement and of reason, stood Omoy, conscious only of pain, in an agony of mind and heart that at one and the same time froze his blood and drew the sweat from his brow. Then he was for stepping out into the open and giving flow to the rage and surging violence that followed, calling down the man who had dishonored him and slain him there under the eyes of that troll who had brought him to this shame. But he controlled the impulse, or else Satan controlled it for him. That way, whispered the tempter, was too straight and simple. He must think. He must have time to readjust his mind to the horrible circumstances so suddenly revealed. Very softly and silently, keeping well within the shadow of the wall, he sidled to the door which he had left ajar. Soundlessly he pushed it open, passed in, and as soundlessly closed it again. For a moment he stood leaning heavily against its timbers, his breath coming in short panting sobs. Then he steadied himself, and turning, made his way down the corridor to the little study which had been fitted up for him in the residential wing, and where sometimes he worked at night. He had been riding there that evening ever since dinner, and he had quitted the room only to go to his assignation with Samoval, leaving the lamp burning on the open desk. He opened the door, but before passing in, he paused a moment, straining his ears to listen for sounds overhead. His eyes, glancing up and down, were arrested by a thin blade of light under a door at the end of the corridor. It was the door of the butler's pantry, and the line of light announced that Mullins had not yet gone to bed. At once Sir Terence understood that, knowing him to be at work, the old servant had himself remained below, in case his master should want anything before retiring. Continuing to move without noise, Sir Terence entered his study, closed the door, and crossed to his desk. Wearily he dropped into the chair that stood before it, his face drawn and ghastly, his smoldering eyes staring vacantly ahead. On the desk before him lay the letters that he had spent the past hours in writing, one to his wife, another to Tremaine, another to his brother in England, another to his brother in Ireland, and several others connected with his official duties, making provision for their uninterrupted continuance in the event of his not surviving the encounter. Now it happened that amongst the latter there was one that was destined hereafter to play a considerable part. It was a note for the commissary general upon a matter that demanded immediate attention, and the only one of all those letters that need now survive. It was marked most urgent, and had been left by him for delivery first thing in the morning. He pulled open a drawer, and swept into it all the letters he had written save that one. He locked that drawer, then unlocked another, and took thence a case of pistols. With shaking hands he lifted out one of the weapons to examine it, and all the while, of course, his thoughts were upon his wife and Tremaine. He was considering how well-founded had been his every twinge of jealousy, how wasted, how senseless the reactions of shame that had followed them, how insensate his trust in Tremaine's honesty, and above all, with that crafty, treacherous subtlety Tremaine had drawn, a red herring across the trail of his suspicions, by pretending to an unutterable passion for Sylvia Armitage. It was perhaps that piece of duplicity, worthy, he thought, of the Iscariot himself, that galled Sir Terence now most sorely, that in the memory of his own silly credulity. He had been such a ready dupe. How those two together must have laughed at him. Oh, Tremaine had been very subtle. He had been the friend, the quasi-brother, parading his affection for the Butler family to excuse the familiarities with Lady O'Moy, which he had permitted himself under Sir Terence's very eyes. O'Moy thought of them as he had seen them in the garden on the night of Redondo's ball, 
remembering the air of transparent honesty by which that damned hypocrite, when discovered, had deflected his just resentment. Oh, there was no doubt that the treacherous blackguard had been subtle. But by God, subtlety should be repaid with subtlety. He would deal with Tremaine as cruelly as Tremaine had dealt with him, and his wanton wife, too, should be repaid in kind. He beheld the way clear. In a flash of wicked inspiration, he put back the pistol, slapped down the lid of the box, and replaced it in its drawer. He rose, took up the letter to the commissary general, stepped briskly to the door, and pulled it open. "'Mullins!' he called sharply. "'Are you there, Mullins?' came the sound of a scraping chair, and instantly that door at the end of the corridor was thrown open, and Mullins stood silhouetted against the light behind him. A moment he stood there, then came forward. "'You called Sir Terence?' "'Yes?' Sir Terence's voice was miraculously calm. His back was to the light, and his face in shadow, so that its drawn, haggard look was not perceptible to the butler. "'I am going to bed. But first I want you to step across to the sergeant of the guard with this letter for the commissary general. Tell him that it is of the utmost importance, and ask him to arrange to have it taken into Lisbon first thing in the morning.' Mullins bowed, venerable as an archdeacon in aspect and bearing, as he received the letter from his master. "'Certainly, Sir Terence.' As he departed, Sir Terence turned and slowly paced back to his desk, leaving the door open. His eyes had narrowed. There was a cruel and almost evil smile on his lips. Of the generous, good-humoured nature imprinted upon his face, every sign had vanished. His countenance was a mask of ferocity, restrained by intelligence, cold and calculating. Oh, he would pay the score that lay between himself and those two who had betrayed him. They should receive treachery for treachery, mockery for mockery, and for dishonored death. They had deemed him an old fool. What was the expression that Samoval had used? Pantaloon in the comedy. Well, well, he had been pantaloon in the comedy so far. But now they should find him pantaloon in the tragedy. Nay, not pantaloon at all, but polichinelle, the sinister jester, the cynical clown who laughs in murdering, and in anguish silence should they bear the punishment he would mete out to them, or else in no less anguish speech themselves proclaim their own dastardy to the world. His wife he beheld now in a new light. It was out of vanity and greed that she had married him, because of the position in the world that he could give her. Having done so, at least she might have kept faith. She might have been honest and abided by the bargain. If she had not done so, it was because honesty was beyond her shallow nature. He should have seen before what he now saw so clearly. He should have known her for a lovely empty husk, a silly fluttering butterfly, a toy, a thing of vanities, emotions, and nothing else. Thus Sir Terence, cursing the day that he had mated with a fool, thus Sir Terence, whilst he stood, there, waiting for the outcry from Mullins that should proclaim the discovery of the body, and afford him a pretext for having the house searched for the slayer, nor had he long to wait. "'Sir Terence! Sir Terence! For God's sake! Sir Terence!' He heard the voice of his old servant. Came the loud crash of the door thrust back until it struck the wall and quick steps along the passage. Sir Terence stepped out to meet him. "'Why, what the devil!' He was beginning in his bluff, normal tones, when the servant, showing a white, scared face, cut him short. "'A terrible thing, Sir Terence! Oh, the saints protect us! A dreadful thing! This way, sir, there's a man killed! Count Samoval, I think it is!' "'What? Where?' "'Out yonder in the quadrangle, sir!' "'But!' Sir Terence checked. "'Count Samoval, did you say? Impossible!' And he went out quickly, followed by the butler." In the quadrangle he checked. In the few minutes that were sped since he had left the place, the moon had overtopped the roof of the opposite wing, so that the full upon the enclosed garden fell, now its white light, illumining and revealing. There lay the black still form of Samoval supine, his white face staring up into the heavens, and beside him knelt Tremaine, whilst in the balcony above leaned her ladyship. The rope ladder Sir Terence's swift glance observed, had disappeared. He halted in his advance, standing at gaze a moment, 
He had hardly expected so much. He had conceived the plan of causing the house to be searched immediately upon Mullins' discovery of the body. But Tremaine's rashness in adventuring down in this fashion spared him even that necessity. True, it set up other difficulties, but he was not sure that the matter would not be infinitely more interesting thus. He stepped forward and came to a standstill between the two, his dead enemy and his living one. End of chapter 12 Recorded by Peter Strom in the Cusco Valley, Peru on February 23rd, 2019「Polichinelle」Why, Ned, he asked gravely, what has happened? It is Samoval, was Tremaine's quiet answer. He is quite dead. He stood up as he spoke, and Sir Terence observed with terrible inward mirth that his tone had the frank and honest ring, his bearing the imperturbable ease which more than once before had imposed upon him as the outward signs of an easy conscience. This secretary of his was a cool scoundrel. "'Samoval, is it?' said Sir Terence, and went down on one knee beside the body to make a perfunctory examination. Then he looked up at the captain. "'And how did this happen?' "'Happen?' echoed Tremaine, realizing that the question was being addressed particularly to himself. "'That is what I am wondering. I found him here in this condition.' "'Oh, you found him here in this condition. Curious.' Over his shoulder he spoke to the butler. "'Mullins, you had better call the guard.' He picked up the slender weapon that lay beside Samoval. A dueling sword. Then he looked searchingly about him until his eyes caught the gleam of the other blade near the wall, where himself he had dropped it. Ah, he said, and went to pick it up. Very odd. He looked up at the balcony, over the parapet of which his wife was leaning. Did you see anything, my dear? he asked, and neither Tremaine nor she detected the faint note of wicked mockery in the question. There was a moment's pause before she answered him falteringly. N no I saw nothing. Sir Terence's straining ears caught no faintest sound of the voice that had prompted her urgently from behind the curtained windows. How long have you been there? he asked her. A, a moment only, she replied again after a pause. I, I thought I heard a cry, and and I came to see what had happened. Her voice shook with terror. What she beheld would have been quite enough to account for that. The guard filed in through the doors from the official quarters. A sergeant with a halberd in one hand and a lantern in the other, followed by four men, and lastly by Mullins. They halted and came to attention before Sir Terence, and almost at the same moment there was a sharp rattling knock on the wicket, in the great closed gates through which Samoval had entered. Startled, but without showing any signs of it, Sir Terence bade Mullins go open, and in a general silence all waited to see who it was that came. A tall man, bowing his shoulders to pass under the low lintel of that narrow door, stepped over the sill and into the courtyard. He wore a cocked hat, and as his great cavalry cloak fell open, the yellow rays of the sergeant's lantern gleamed faintly on the British uniform. Presently, as he advanced into the quadrangle, he disclosed the aquiline features of Colquhoun Grant. "'Good evening, General. Good evening, Tremaine.' He greeted one and the other. Then his eyes fell upon the body lying between them. "'Samoval, eh? So I am not mistaken. In seeking him here, I have had him under very close observation during the past day or two, and when one of my men brought me word to-night that he had left his place at Bispo on foot and alone, going along the upper Alcantara road, if I had a notion that he might be coming to Monsanto 
and I followed. But I hardly expected to find this. How has it happened? That is what I was just asking Tremaine, replied Sir Terence. Mullins discovered him here, quite by chance, with the body. Oh, said Grant, and turned to the captain. Was it you, then? I, interrupted Tremaine with sudden violence. He seemed now to become aware for the first time of the gravity of his position. Certainly not, Colonel Grant. I heard a cry, and I came out to see what it was. I found Samoval here, already dead. I see, said Grant. You were with Sir Terence, then, when this— Nay, Sir Terence interrupted. I have been alone since dinner, clearing up some arrears of work. I was in my study there when Mullins called me to tell me what he had discovered. It looks as if there had been a duel. Look at these swords. Then he turned to his secretary. I think, Captain Tremaine, he said gravely, that you had better report yourself under arrest to your colonel. Tremaine stiffened suddenly. Report myself under arrest, he cried. My God, Sir Terence, you don't believe that I— Sir Terence interrupted him. The voice in which he spoke was stern, almost sad, but his eyes gleamed with fiendish mockery the while. It was Polichinelle that spoke, Polichinelle that mocks what time he slays. What were you doing here? he asked, and it was like moving the checkmating piece. Tremaine stood stricken and silent. He cast a desperate upward glance at the balcony overhead. The answer was so easy, but it would entail delivering Richard Butler to his death. Colonel Grant, following his upward glance, beheld Lady O'Moy for the first time. He bowed, swept off his cocked hat, and— Perhaps her ladyship, he suggested to Sir Terence, may have seen something. I have already asked her, replied O'Moy and then she herself was feverishly assuring Colonel Grant that she had seen nothing at all, that she had heard a cry, and had come out onto the balcony to see what was happening. "'And was Captain Tremaine here when you came out?' asked O'Moy, the deadly jester. Y yes she faltered. "'I was only a moment or two before yourself.' "'You see,' said Sir Terence heavily to Grant, and Grant with pursed lips nodded. His eyes moved from O'Moy to Tremaine. "'But, Sir Terence,' cried Tremaine, "'I give you my word. I swear to you that I know absolutely nothing of how Samoval met his death.' "'What were you doing here?' O'Moy asked again, and this time the sinister, menacing note of derision vibrated clearly in the question. Tremaine, for the first time in his honest, upright life, found himself deliberately choosing between truth and falsehood, the truth would clear him, since with that truth he would produce witnesses to it, establishing his movements completely. But the truth would send a man to his death, and so for the sake of that man's life he was driven into falsehood. I was on my way to see you, he said. At midnight? cried Sir Terence on a note of grim doubt. To what purpose? Really, Sir Terence, if my word is not sufficient— I refuse to submit to cross-examination. Sir Terence turned to the sergeant of the guard. How long is it since Captain Tremaine arrived? He asked. The sergeant stood to attention. Captain Tremaine, sir, arrived rather more than half an hour ago. He came in a curricle, which is still waiting at the gates. Half an hour ago, eh? Said Sir Terence, and from Colquhoun Grant there was a sharp and audible intake of breath expressive either of understanding or surprise or both the adjutant looked at tremaine again as my questions seem only to entangle you farther he said i think you had better do as i suggest without more protests report yourself under arrest to colonel fletcher in the morning sir still tremaine hesitated for a moment then drawing himself up he saluted curtly very well sir he replied "'But Terence!' cried her ladyship from above. "'Ah!' said Sir Terence, and he looked up. "'You would say?' he encouraged her, but she had broken off abruptly, checked again, although none below could guess it, 
by the one behind who prompted her. Couldn't you, couldn't you wait? She was faltering, compelled to it by his question. Certainly, but for what? quoth he, grimly sardonic. Wait until you have some explanation, she concluded lamely. That will be the business of the court-martial, he answered. My duty is quite clear and simple. I think you needn't wait, Captain Tremaine. And so, without another word, Tremaine turned and departed. The soldiers, in compliance with the short command issued by Sir Terence, took up the body and bore it away to a room in the official quarters, and in their wake went Colonel Grant. After taking his leave of Sir Terence, her ladyship vanished from the balcony and closed her windows, and finally Sir Terence, followed by Mullins, slowly, with bowed head and dragging steps, re-entered the house. In the quadrangle, flooded now by the cold white light of the moon, all was peace once more. Sir Terence turned into his study, sank into the chair by his desk, and sat there a while, staring into vacancy, a diabolical smile upon his handsome, mobile mouth. Gradually the smile faded, and horror overspread his face. Finally he flung himself forward and buried his head in his arms. There were steps in the hall outside, a quick mutter of voices, and then the door of his study was flung open, and Miss Armitage came sharply to rouse him. Terence, what has happened to Captain Tremaine? He sat up stiffly as she sped across the room to him. She was wrapped in a blue quilted bedgown. Her dark hair hung in two heavy plates, and her bare feet had been hastily thrust into slippers. Sir Terence looked at her with eyes that were dull and heavy, and that yet seemed to search her white, startled face. She set a hand on his shoulder, and looked down into his ravaged, haggard countenance. He seemed suddenly to have been stricken into an old man. "'Mullins has just told me that Captain Tremaine has been ordered under arrest for—for for killing Count Samoval. Is it true? Is it true?' she demanded wildly. "'It is true,' he answered her, and there was a heavy, sneering curl on his upper lip. "'But,' she looked as if she would stifle, she sank to her knees beside him and caught his hand in both her own that were trembling. "'Oh, you can't believe it. Captain Tremaine is not the man to do a murder.' "'The evidence points to a duel,' he answered dully. "'A duel?' She looked at him, and then, remembering what had passed that morning between Tremaine and Samoval, remembering, too, Lord Wellington's edict. "'Oh, God!' she gasped. "'Why did you let them take him?' "'They didn't take him. I ordered him under arrest. He will report himself to Colonel Fletcher in the morning.' "'You ordered him. You. You, his friend. Anger, scorn, reproach, and sorrow.' all blending in her voice, bore him a clear message. He looked down at her most closely, and gradually compassion crept into his face. He set his hands on her shoulders, she suffering it passively, insensibly. "'You care for him, Sylvia,' he said, between inquiry and wonder. "'Well, well, we are both fools together, child. The man is a dastard, a blackguard.' a judas to be repaid with betrayal for betrayal forget him girl believe me he isn't worth a thought terence she looked in her turn into that distorted face are you mad she asked him very nearly he answered with a laugh that was horrible to hear she drew back and away from him bewildered and horrified Slowly she rose to her feet. She controlled with difficulty the deep emotion swaying her. "'Tell me,' she said slowly, speaking with obvious effort, "'what will they do to Captain Tremaine?' "'What will they do to him?' He looked at her. He was smiling. "'They will shoot him, of course.' "'And you wish it?' She denounced him in a whisper of horror. "'Above all things,' he answered. A more poetic justice never overtook a blackguard. Why do you call him that? 
What do you mean? I will tell you afterwards, after they have shot him, unless the truth comes out before. What truth do you mean? The truth of how Samoval came by his death? Oh, no, that matter is quite clear. The evidence complete. I mean, oh, I will tell you afterwards what I mean. It may help you bear your trouble, thankfully. She approached him again. Won't you tell me, now? She begged him. No, he answered, rising, and speaking with finality. Afterwards, if necessary, afterwards. And now get back to bed, child, and forget the fellow. I swear to you that he isn't worth a thought. Later I shall hope to prove it to you. That you never will, she told him fiercely. He laughed, and again his laugh was harsh and terrible in its bitter mockery. Yet another trusting fool, he cried. The world is full of them. It is made up of them with just a sprinkling of knaves to batten on their folly. Go to bed, Sylvia, and pray for understanding of men. It is a possession beyond riches. I think you are more in need of it than I am, she told him, standing by the door. Of course you do. You trust, which is why you are a fool. Trust, he said, speaking the very language of Polichinelli, is the livery of fools. She went without answering him and toiled upstairs with dragging feet. She paused a moment in the corridor above, outside Una's door. She was in such need of communion with someone that for a moment she thought of going in. But she knew beforehand the greeting that would await her, the empty platitudes, the obvious small change of verbiage which her ladyship would dole out. The very thought of it restrained her, and so she passed on to her own room and a sleepless night in which to piece together the puzzle which the situation offered her, the amazing enigma of Sir Terence's seeming access of insanity. The only conclusion that she reached was that intertwined with the death of Samoval there was some other circumstance which had aroused in the adjutant an unreasoning hatred of his friend, converting him into Tremaine's bitterest enemy, intent, as he had confessed, upon seeing him shot for that night's work and because she knew them both for men of honor, above all, the enigma was immeasurably deepened. Had she but obeyed the transient impulse to seek Lady O'Moy, she might have discovered all the truth at once, for she would have come upon her ladyship in a frame of mind almost as distraught as her own, and she might, had she penetrated to the dressing-room where her ladyship was, have come upon Richard Butler at the same time. Now, in view of what had happened, her ladyship, ever impulsive, was all for going there and then to her husband to confess the whole truth, without pausing to reflect upon the consequences to other than Ned Tremaine. As you know, it was beyond her to see a thing from two points of view at one and the same time. It was also beyond her brother. The failing, as I think I have told you, was a family one and her brother saw this matter only from the point of view of his own safety. "'A single word to Terence," he had told her, putting his back to the door of the dressing-room to bar her intended egress, "'and you realize that it will be a court-martial and a firing party for me.' That warning effectively checked her, yet certain stirrings of conscience made her think of the man who had imperiled himself for her sake and her brother's. "'But, Dick, what is to become of Ned?' she had asked him. Oh, Ned will be all right. What is the evidence against him, after all? Men are not shot for things they haven't done. Justice will out, you know. Leave Ned to shift for himself for the present. Anyhow, his danger isn't grave, nor is it immediate, and mine is. Helplessly distraught, she sank to an ottoman. The night had been a very trying one for her ladyship. She gave way to tears. It is all your fault, Dick she reproached him. Naturally you would blame me, he said with resignation, the complete martyr. If only you had been ready at the time, as he told you to be, there would have been no delays, and you would have gotten away before any of this happened. Was it my fault that I should have reopened my wound, bad luck to it, in attempting to get down that damned ladder? he asked her. Is it my fault that I am neither an ape nor an acrobat? 
Tremaine should have come up at once to assist me, instead of waiting until he had come up to help me bandage my leg again. Then time would not have been lost, and very likely my life with it. He came to a gloomy conclusion. Your life? What do you mean, Dick? Just that. What are my chances of getting away now? He asked her. Was there ever such infernal luck as mine? The telematches will sail without me, and the only man who could and would have helped me to get out of this damned country is under arrest. It's clear I shall have to shift for myself again, and I can't even do that for a day or two with my leg in this state. I shall have to go back into that stuffy store cupboard of yours till God knows when. He lost all self-control at the prospect and broke into imprecations of his luck. She attempted to soothe him, but he wasn't easy to soothe. And then, he grumbled on, you have so little sense that you want to run straight off to Terence and explain to him what Tremaine was doing here. You might at least have the grace to wait until I am off the premises and give me the mercy of a start before you set the dogs on my trail. Oh, Dick, Dick, you are so cruel, she protested. How can you say such things to me? whose only thought is for you, to save you. Then don't talk any more about telling Terence, he replied. I won't, Dick, I won't. She drew him down beside her on the ottoman, and her fingers smoothed his rather tumbled red hair, just as her words attempted to smooth the ruffles in his spirit. You know I didn't realize, or I should have thought of it even. I was so concerned for Ned for the moment. Don't. I tell you there's not the need he assured her. Ned will be safe enough, devil a doubt. It's for you to keep to what you told them from the balcony, that you heard a cry, went out to see what was happening, and saw Tremaine there bending over the body. Not a word more, and not a word less, or it will be all over with me. End of chapter 13 Read by Peter Strom at Lake Titicaca On February 25th, 2019《Chapter Fourteen of the Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen The Champion. With the possible exception of her ladyship, I do not think that there was much sleep that night at Monsanto for any of the four chief actors in this tragic comedy. Each had his own preoccupations. Sylvia's, we know. Mr. Butler found his leg troubling him again, and the pain of the reopened wound must have prevented him from sleeping even had his anxieties about his immediate future not sufficed to do so. As for Sir Terence, his was the most deplorable case of all. This man who had lived a life of simple and downright honesty in great things and in small, a man who had never stooped to the slightest prevarication, found himself suddenly launched upon the most horrible and infamous course of duplicity to encompass the ruin of another. The offense of that other against himself might be of the most foul and hideous, a piece of treachery that only treachery could adequately avenge. Yet this consideration was not enough to appease the clamors of Sir Terence's self-respect. In the end, however, the primary desire for vengeance, and vengeance of the bitterest kind, proved master of his mind. Captain Tremaine had been led by his villainy into a coil that should presently crush him, and Sir Terence promised himself an infinite balm for his outraged honor in the entertainment which the futile struggles of the victim should provide. With Captain Tremaine lay the cruel choice of submitting in tortured silence to his fate, or of turning craven and saving his miserable life by proclaiming himself a seducer and a betrayer. It should be interesting to observe how the captain would decide, and his punishment was certain, whatever the decision that he took. Sir Terence came to breakfast in the open, gray-faced and haggard, but miraculously composed for a man who had so little studied the art of concealing his emotions. Voice and glance were calm, as he gave a good morning to his wife, and to Miss Armitage. 
"'What are you going to do about Ned?' was one of his wife's first questions. It took him aback. He looked askance at her, marveling at the steadiness with which she bore his glance, until it occurred to him that effrontery was an essential part of the equipment of all harlots. "'What am I going to do?' he echoed. "'Why, nothing. The matter is out of my hands. I may be asked to give evidence. I may be even be called to sit upon the court-martial that will try him. My evidence can hardly assist him. My conclusions will naturally be based upon the evidence that is laid before the court.' Her teaspoon rattled in her saucer. "'I don't understand you, Terence. Ned has always been your best friend.' He has certainly shared everything that was mine. And you know, she went on, that he did not kill Samoval. Indeed. His glance quickened a little. How should I know that? Well, I know it anyway. He seemed moved by that statement. He leaned forward with an odd eagerness, behind which there was something terrible that went unperceived by her. Why did you not say so before? How do you know? What do you know? I am sure that he did not. Yes, yes, but what makes you so sure? Do you possess some knowledge that you have not revealed? He saw the color slowly shrinking from her cheeks under his burning gaze. So she was not quite shameless then, after all. There were limits to her effrontery. What knowledge should I possess? she filtered. That is what I am asking. She made a good recovery. I possess the knowledge that you should possess yourself, she told him. I know Ned for a man incapable of such a thing. I am ready to swear that he could not have done it. I see evidence as to character. He sank back into his chair and thoughtfully stirred his chocolate. It may weigh with the court, but I am not the court and my mere opinions can do nothing for Ned Tremaine. Her ladyship looked at him wildly. The court, she cried. Do you mean that I shall have to give evidence? Naturally, he answered. You will have to say what you saw. But, but I saw nothing. Something, I think. Yes, but nothing that can matter. Still, the court will wish to hear it, and perhaps to examine you upon it. Oh, no, no. In her alarm she half rose, then sank again to her chair. You must keep me out of this, Terence. I couldn't. I really couldn't. He laughed with an affection of indulgence, masking something else. Why, he said, you would not deprive Termaine of any of the advantages to be derived from your testimony. Are you not ready to bear witness as to his character? To swear that from your knowledge of the man... You are sure he could not have done such a thing? That he is the very soul of honor, a man incapable of anything base or treacherous or sly? And then at last, Sylvia, who had been watching them and seeking to apply to what she heard the wild expressions that Sir Terence had used to herself last night, broke into the conversation. Why do you apply these words to Captain Tremaine? she asked. He turned sharply to meet the opposition he detected in her. I don't apply them. On the contrary, I say that, as Una knows, they are not applicable. Then you make an unnecessary statement, a statement that has nothing to do with the case. Captain Tremaine has been arrested for killing Count Samoval in a duel. A duel may be a violation of the law, as recently enacted by Lord Wellington. But it is not an offence against honour, and to say that a man cannot have fought a duel because a man is incapable of anything base or treacherous or sly is just to say a very foolish and meaningless thing. Oh, quite so, the adjutant admitted. But if Tremaine denies having fought, if he shelters himself behind a falsehood and says that he has not killed Samoval, then I think the statement assumes some meaning. Does Captain Tremaine say that? she asked him sharply. 
It is what I understood him to say last night when I ordered him under arrest. Then, said Sylvia, with full conviction, Captain Tremaine did not do it. Perhaps he didn't, Sir Terence admitted. The court will no doubt discover the truth. The truth, you know, must prevail. And he looked at his wife again, marking the fresh signs of agitation she betrayed. Mullins coming to set fresh covers, the conversation was allowed to lapse. Nor was it ever resumed, for at that moment, with no other announcement save such as was afforded by his quick step and click-click of his spurs, a short, slight man entered the quadrangle from the doorway of the official wing. The adjutant, turning to look, caught his breath suddenly in an exclamation of astonishment. "'Lord Wellington!' he cried, and was immediately on his feet. At the exclamation the newcomer checked and turned. He wore a plain gray undress frock and white stock, buckskin breeches and lacquered boots, and he carried a riding crop tucked under his left arm. His features were bold and sternly handsome, his fine eyes singularly piercing and keen in their glance, and the sweep of those eyes now took not in merely the adjutant, but the spread table, and the lady seated before it. He halted a moment, then advanced quickly, swept his cocked hat from a brown head that was but very slightly touched with gray, and bowed with a mixture of stiffness and courtliness to the ladies. Since I have intruded so unwittingly, I had best remain to make my apologies, he said. I was on my way to your residential quarters, O'Moy, not imagining that I should break in upon your privacy in this fashion. O'Moy, with a great deference, made haste to reassure him on the score of the intrusion, whilst the ladies themselves rose to greet him. He bore her ladyship's hand to his lips with perfunctory courtesy, then insisted upon her resuming her chair. Then he bowed ever with that mixture of stiffness and deference to Miss Armitage, upon her being presented to him by the adjutant. "'Do not suffer me to disturb you,' he begged them. "'Sit down, O oh boy. I am not pressed, and I shall be monstrous glad of a few moments' rest. You are very pleasant here.' And he looked about the luxuriant garden with approving eyes. Sir Terence placed the hospitality of his table at his lordship's disposal, but the latter declined graciously. A glass of wine and water, if you will. No more. I breakfasted at Torres Vedras with Fletcher. Then to the look of astonishment on the faces of the ladies he smiled. Oh, yes, he assured them. I was early astir, for time is very precious just at present which is why I drop unannounced upon you from the skies, O'Moy. He took the glass that Mullins proffered on a salver, sipped from it, and set it down. There is so much vexation, so much hindrance from these pestilential intriguers here in Lisbon, that I thought it as well to come in person and speak plainly to the gentlemen of the Council of Regency, he was peeling off his stout riding gloves as he spoke. If this campaign is to go forward at all, it will go forward as I dispose. Then, too, I wanted to see Fletcher and the works. By gad, O'Moy, he has performed miracles, and I am very pleased with him. Oh, and with you, too. He told me how ably you have seconded him and counseled him where necessary. You must have worked night and day, O'Moy. He sighed. I wish that I were as well served in every direction. And then he broke off abruptly. But this is monstrous tedious for your ladyship, and for you, Miss Armitage. Forgive me. Her ladyship protested the contrary, professing a deep interest in military matters, and inviting his lordship to continue. Lord Wellington, however, ignoring the invitation, turned the conversation upon life in Lisbon, inquiring hopefully whether they found the place afforded them adequate entertainment. 
Indeed, yes, Lady O'Moy assured him. We are very gay at times. There are private theatricals and dances, occasionally an official ball, and we are promised picnics and water parties, now that the summer is here. And in the autumn, ma'am, we may find you a little hunting, his lordship promised them. Plenty of foxes, a rough country, though. But what's that to an Irish woman? He caught the quickening of Miss Armitage's eye. The prospect interests you, I see. Miss Armitage admitted it, and thus they made conversation for a while. What time the great soldier sipped his wine and water to wash the dust of his morning ride from his throat. When at last he set down an empty glass, Sir Terence took this as the intimation of his readiness to deal with official matters, and rising, he announced himself entirely at his lordship's service. Lord Wellington claimed his attention for a full hour, with the details of several matters that are not immediately concerned with this narrative. Having done, he rose at last from Sir Terence's desk, at which he had been sitting, and took up his riding crop and cocked hat from the chair where he had placed them. "'And now,' he said, "'I think I will ride into Lisbon, and endeavour to come to an understanding with Count Redondo and Don Miguel Forges. Sir Terence advanced to open the door, but Wellington checked him with a sudden sharp inquiry. "'You published my order against dueling, did you not?' "'Immediately upon receiving it, sir.' "'Ha! It doesn't seem to have taken long for the order to be infringed, then.' His manner was severe, his eyes stern. Sir Terence was conscious of a quickening of his pulses. Nevertheless, his answer was calmly regretful. "'I am afraid not.' The great man nodded. "'Disgraceful! I heard of it from Fletcher.' this morning. Captain What's-His-Name had just reported himself under arrest. I understand, and Fletcher had received a note from you giving the grounds for this. The deplorable part of these things is that they always happen in the most troublesome manner conceivable. In Berkeley's case the victim was a nephew of the Patriarchs. Samoval now was a person of even greater consequence, a close friend of several members of the Council. His death will be deeply resented, and may set up fresh difficulties. It is monstrous, vexatious. And abruptly he asked, What did they quarrel about? O'Moy trembled, and his glance avoided the other's gimlet eye. The only quarrel that I am aware of between them, he said, was concerned with this very enactment of your lordships. Samoval proclaimed it infamous, and Tremaine resented the term. Hot words passed between them, but the altercation was allowed to go no further at the time by myself and others who were present. His lordship had raised his brows. By gad, sir, he ejaculated, there almost appears to be some justification for this captain. He was one of your military secretaries, was he not? He was. Ha, ah, pity, pity. His lordship was thoughtful for a moment. Then he dismissed the matter. But then orders are orders, and soldiers must learn to obey implicitly. British soldiers of all degrees seem to find the lesson difficult. We must inculcate it more sternly, that is all. O'Moy's honest soul was in torturing revolt against the falsehoods he had implied. And to this man of all men, to this man whom he reverenced above all others, who stood to him for the very fount of military honor and lofty principle. He was in such a mood that one more question on the subject from Wellington, and the whole ghastly truth must have come pouring from his lips. But no other question came. Instead, his lordship turned on the threshold and held out his hand. Not a step further, O'Moy. I've left you a mass of work, and you are short of a secretary so don't waste any of your time on courtesies. I shall hope still to find the ladies in the garden, so that I may take my leave, without inconveniencing them. And he was gone, stepping briskly, with clicking spurs, leaving O'Moy hunched now in his chair, his body, 
the very expression of the dejection that filled his soul. In the garden his lordship came upon Miss Armitage alone, still seated by the table under the trellis, from which the cloth had by now been removed. She rose at his approach, and in spite of gesture to her, to remain seated. "'I was seeking Lady O'Moy,' said he, "'to take my leave of her. I may not have the pleasure of coming to Monsanto again.' "'She is on the terrace, I think,' said Miss Armitage. "'I will find her for your lordship.' "'Let us find her together,' he said amiably, and so turned and went with her towards the archway. "'You said your name is Armitage, I think,' he commented. "'Sir Terence said so.' His eyes twinkled. "'You possess an exceptional virtue,' said he. "'To be truthful is common. To be accurate rare. "'Well, then, Sir Terence said so. "'Once I had a great friend of the name of Armitage. "'I have lost sight of him these many years. "'We were at school together in Brussels. "'At Monsieur Gobert's.' she surprised him by saying that would be john armitage my uncle god bless my soul ma'am he ejaculated but i gathered you were irish and jack armitage came from yorkshire my mother is irish and we live in ireland now i was born there but father none the less was john armitage's brother he looked at her with increased interest marking the straight supple lines of her and the handsome high-bred face his lordship remember never lacked an appreciative eye for a fine woman so you're jack armitage's niece give me news of him my dear she did so jack armitage was well and prospering had made a rich marriage and retired from the blues many years ago to live at northampton he listened with interest and thus out of his boyhood friendship for her uncle which of late years he had had no opportunity to express, sprang there and then a kindness for the niece. Her own personal charms may have contributed to it, for the great soldier was intensely responsive to the appeal of beauty. They reached the terrace. Lady O'Moy was nowhere in sight, but Lord Wellington was too much engrossed in his discovery to be troubled. "'My dear,' he said, if I can serve you at any time, both for Jack's sake and your own, I hope that you will let me know of it. She looked at him a moment, and he saw her color come and go, arguing a sudden agitation. You tempt me, sir, she said with a wistful smile. Then yield to the temptation, child, he urged her kindly. Those keen, penetrating eyes of his, perceiving trouble here, it isn't for myself she responded yet there is something i would ask you if i dare something i had intended to ask you in any case if i could find the opportunity to be frank that is why i was waiting there in the garden just now it was to waylay you i hoped for a word with you well well he encouraged her it should be the easier now since in a sense we find that we are old friends he was so kind, so gentle, despite that stern, strong face of his, that she melted at once to his persuasion. "'It is about Lieutenant Richard Butler,' she began. "'Ah,' said he lightly, "'I feared as much when you said it was not for yourself you had a favor to ask.' But looking at him, she instantly perceived how he had understood her. "'Mr. Butler,' she said, is the officer who is guilty of the affair at Tavora. He knit his brows in thought. Butler, Tavora, he muttered questioningly. Suddenly his memory found what it was seeking. Oh, yes, the violated nunnery. His thin lips tightened. The sternness of his face increased. Yes, he inquired, but the tone was now forbidding. Nevertheless, she was not deterred. Mr. Butler is Lady O'Moy's brother, she said. He stared a moment, taken aback. Good God, you don't say so, child. Her brother, O'Moy's brother-in-law. And O'Moy never said a word to me about it. What should he say? Sir Terence himself pledged his word to the Council of Regency that Mr. Butler would be shot when taken. Did he, Agad? 
he was still further surprised out of his sternness. Something of a Roman, this O'Moy, in his conception of duty. Hum, the council no doubt demanded this. So I understand, my lord. Lady O'Moy, realizing her brother's grave danger, is very deeply troubled. Naturally, he agreed. But what can I do, Miss Armitage? What were the actual facts? Do you happen to know? She recited them, putting the case bravely for the scapegrace Mr. Butler, dwelling particularly upon the error under which he was laboring, that he had imagined himself to be knocking at the gates of a monastery of Dominican friars, that he had broken into the convent because denied admittance, and because he suspected some treasonous reason for that denial. He heard her out, watching her with those keen eyes of his the while. Hum! You make out so good a case for him that one might almost believe you instructed by the gentleman himself. Yet I gather that nothing has since been heard of him. Nothing, sir, since he vanished from Tavora nearly two months ago, and I have only repeated to your lordship the tale that was told by the sergeant and the troopers who reported the matter to Sir Robert Crawford on their return. He was very thoughtful, leaning on the balustrade, he looked out across the sunlit valley, turning his boldly chiseled profile to his companion. At last he spoke slowly, reflectively. But if this were really so, a mere blunder, I see no sufficient grounds to threaten him with capital punishment. His subsequent desertion, if he has deserted, I mean if nothing has happened to him, is really the graver matter of the two. I gathered, sir, that he was to be sacrificed to the Council of Regency, a sort of scapegoat. He swung round sharply, and the sudden blaze of his eyes almost terrified her. Instantly he was cold again and inscrutable. Ah, you are oddly well informed throughout, but of course you would be, he added with an appraising look into that intelligent face, in which he now caught a faint likeness of Jack Armitage. Well, well, my dear, I am very glad you have told me of this. If Mr. Butler is ever taken, and in danger, there will be a court-martial, of course. Send me word of it, and I will see what I can do, both for your sake and for the sake of strict justice. Oh, not for my sake, she protested, reddening slightly at the gentle imputation. Mr. Butler is nothing to me. That is to say, he is just my cousin. It is for Una's sake that I am asking this. Why then, for Lady O'Moy's sake, since you ask it, he replied readily. But, he warned her, say nothing of it until Mr. Butler is found. It is possible that he believed that Butler never would be found. And remember, I promise only to give the matter my attention. If it is as you represent it, I think you may be sure that the worst that will befall Mr. Butler will be dismissal from the service. He deserves that. But I hope I should be the last man to permit a British officer to be used as a scapegoat or a burnt offering to the mob or to any council of regency. By the way, who told you this about a scapegoat? Captain Tremaine. Captain Tremaine? Oh, the man who killed Samoval. He didn't, she cried. On that almost fierce denial, his lordship looked at her raising his eyebrows in astonishment. But I am told that he did, and he is under arrest for it this moment, for that and for breaking my order against dueling. You are not told the truth, my lord. Captain Germain says that he didn't, and if he says so, it is so. Oh, of course, Miss Armitage. He was a man of unparalleled valor and boldness, yet so fierce was she in that moment that for the life of him he dared not have contradicted her. Captain Tremaine is the most honorable man I know, she continued, and if he had killed Samoval, he would never have denied it. He would have proclaimed it to all the world. There is no need for all this heat, my dear, he assured her. The point is not one that can remain in doubt. The seconds of the duel will be forthcoming, and they will tell us who were the principals. There were no seconds, she informed him. No seconds, he cried in horror. Do you mean that they just fought a rough and tumble fight? 
I mean they never fought at all. As for this tale of a duel, I ask your lordship, had Captain Tremaine desired a secret meeting with Count Samoval, would he have chosen this of all places in which to hold it? This? This, the fight, whoever fought it, took place in the quadrangle there at midnight. He was overcome with astonishment, and he showed it. Upon my soul, he said, I do not appear to have been told any of the facts. Strange that O'Moy should never have mentioned that, he muttered, and then inquired suddenly. Where was Tremaine arrested? Here, she informed him. Here? He was here, then, at midnight? What was he doing here? I don't know, but whatever he was doing, can your lordship believe that he would have come here to fight a secret duel? It certainly puts a monstrous strain upon belief, said he. But what can he have been doing here? I don't know, she repeated. She wanted to add a warning of O'Moy. She was tempted to tell his lordship of the odd words that O'Moy had used to her last night concerning Tremaine. But she hesitated, and her courage failed her. Lord Wellington was so great a man, bearing the destinies of nations upon his shoulders, and already he had wasted upon her so much of the time that belonged to the world and history, that she feared to trespass further. And whilst she hesitated, came Colquhoun Grant clanking across the quadrangle, looking for his lordship. He had come up, he announced, standing straight and stiff before them, to see O'Moy, but hearing of Lord Wellington's presence, had preferred to see his lordship in the first instance. And indeed you arrive very opportunely, Grant, his lordship confessed. He turned to take his leave of Jack Armitage's niece. I'll not forget either Mr. Butler or Captain Tremaine, he promised her, and his stern face softened into a gentle, friendly smile. They are very fortunate in their champion. Recorded by Peter Strom in San Pedro de Atacama, Chile on March 1st, 2019. Chapter 15 of The Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 The Wallet. A queer, mysterious business, this death of Samoval, said Colonel Grant. So I was beginning to perceive, Wellington agreed, his brows dark. They were alone together in the quadrangle, under the trellis, through which the sun, already high, was dappling the table at which his lordship sat. It would be easier to read, if it were not for the dueling swords. Those and the nature of Samoval's wound certainly point unanswerably to a duel. Otherwise there would be considerable evidence that Samoval was a spy caught in the act and dealt with out of hand, as he deserved. How? Count Samoval, a spy? In the French interest, answered the colonel without emotion, acting upon the instructions of the Sousa faction, whose tool he had become. And Colonel Grant proceeded to relate precisely what he knew of Samoval. Lord Wellington sat a while in silence, cogitating, then he rose, and his piercing eyes looked up at the colonel, who stood a good head taller than himself. Is this the evidence of which you spoke? By no means, was the answer. The evidence I have secured is much more palpable. I have it here. He produced a little wallet of red morocco, bearing the initial S, surmounted by a coronet. Opening it, he selected from it some papers, speaking the while. I thought it was well, before I left last night, to make an examination of the body. This is what I found, and it contains, among other lesser documents, these to which I would draw your lordship's attention. First this. And he placed in Lord Wellington's hand a holograph, note, 
from the Prince of Esslingen, introducing the bearer, Monsieur de la Fleche, his confidential agent, who would consult with the Count, and thanking the Count for the valuable information already received from him. His lordship sat down again to read the letter. "'It is a full confirmation of what you have told me,' he said calmly. "'Then this,' said Colonel Grant, and he placed upon the table a note in French of the approximate number and disposition of the British troops in Portugal at the time. "'The handwriting is Samoval's own, as those who know it will have no difficulty in discerning. And now this, sir.' He unfolded a small sketch map, bearing the title also in French, Probable Position and Extent of the Fortifications North of Lisbon. The notes at the foot, he added, are in cipher, and it is the ordinary cipher employed by the French, which in itself proves how deeply Samoval was involved. Here is a translation of it and he placed before his chief a sheet of paper, on which Lord Wellington read, This is based upon my own personal knowledge of the country, odd scraps of information received from time to time, and my personal verification of the roads closed to traffic in that region. It is intended merely as a guide to the actual locale of the fortifications, an exact plan of which I hope shortly to obtain. His lordship considered it very attentively, but without betraying the least discomposure. For a man working upon such slight data as he himself confesses, was the quiet comment, he is damnably accurate. It is as well, I think, that this did not reach Marshal Messina. My own assumption is that he put off sending it, intending to replace it by the actual plan which he here confesses to the expectation of obtaining shortly. I think he died at the right moment. Anything else? Indeed, said Colonel Grant. I have kept the best for the last. And unfolding yet another document, he placed it in the hands of the commander-in-chief. It was Lord Liverpool's note of the troops to be embarked for Lisbon in June and July the note abstracted from the dispatch carried by Captain Garfield. His lordship's lips tightened as he considered it. His death was timely indeed, damned timely, and the man who killed him deserves to be mentioned in dispatches. Nothing else, I suppose. The rest is of little consequence, sir. Very well, he rose. You will leave these with me and the wallet as well, if you please. I am on my way to confer with the members of the Council of Regency, and I am glad to go armed with so stout a weapon as this. Whatever may be the ultimate finding of the court-martial, the present assumption must be that Samoval met the death of a spy caught in the act, as you suggested. That is the only conclusion the Portuguese government can draw when I lay these papers before it. They will effectively silence all protests. Shall I tell O'Moy? inquired the colonel. Oh, certainly, answered his lordship, instantly to change his mind. Stay, he considered, his chin in his hands, his eyes dreamy. Better not, perhaps. Better not tell anybody. Let us keep this to ourselves for the present. It has no direct bearing on the matter to be tried. By the way, when does the court-martial sit? I have just heard that Marshal Beresford has ordered it, to sit on Thursday here at Monsanto. His lordship considered. Perhaps I shall be present. I may be at Torres Vedras until then. It is a very odd affair. What is your own impression of it, Grant? Have you formed any? Grant smiled darkly. I have been piecing things together. The result is rather curious, and still very mystifying, still leaving a deal to be explained and somehow this wallet doesn't fit into the scheme at all. You shall tell me about it as we ride into Lisbon. I want you to come with me. Lady O'Moy must forgive me if I take French leave, since she has nowhere to be found. The truth was that her ladyship had purposely gone into hiding after the fashion of suffering animals that are denied expression of their pain, 
she had gone off with her load of sorrow and anxiety into the thicket on the flank of monsanto and there sylvia found her presently dejectedly seated by a spring on a bank that was thick with flowering violets her ladyship was in tears her mind swollen to bursting point by the secret which it sought to contain but felt itself certainly unable to contain much longer why una dear cried miss armitage kneeling beside her and putting a motherly arm about that full-grown child what is this her ladyship wept copiously the springs of her grief gushing forth in response to that sympathetic touch oh my dear i am so distressed i shall go mad i think i am sure i have never deserved all this trouble i have always been considerate of others you know i wouldn't give pain to any one and and dick has always been so thoughtless dick said miss armitage and there was less sympathy in her voice it is dick you are thinking about at present of course all this trouble has come through dick i mean she recovered that all my troubles began with this affair of dick's and now there is ned under arrest and to be court-martialed but what has captain tremaine to do with dick nothing of course her ladyship agreed with more than usual self-restraint but it's one more trouble on another oh it's more than i can bear i know my dear i know miss armitage said soothingly and her own voice was not so steady you don't know how can you it isn't your brother or your friend it isn't as if you cared very much for either of them if you did if you loved dick or ned you might realize what i am suffering miss armitage's eyes looked straight ahead into the thick green foliage and there was an odd smile half wistful half scornful on her lips yet i have done what i could she said presently i have spoken to lord wellington about them both lady o'moy checked her tears to look at her companion and there was dread in her eyes you have spoken to lord wellington yes the opportunity came and i took it and whatever did you tell him she was all a tremble now as she clutched miss armitage's hand miss armitage related what had passed how she had explained the true facts of dick's case to his lordship how she had protested her faith that tremaine was incapable of lying and that if he said he had not killed samoval it was certain that he had not done so and finally how his lordship had promised to bear both cases in his mind that doesn't seem very much her ladyship complained but he said that he would never allow a british officer to be made a scapegoat and that if things proved to be as i stated them he would see that the worst that happened to dick would be his dismissal from the army he asked me to let him know immediately if dick were found more than ever was her ladyship on the very edge of confiding a chance word might have broken down the last barrier of her will but that word was not spoken and so she was given the opportunity of first consulting her brother he laughed when he heard the story a trap to take me that's all he pronounced it my dear girl that stiff-necked marinette knows nothing of forgiveness for a military offence discipline is the god at whose shrine he worships and he afforded her anecdotes to illustrate and confirm his assertion of lord wellington's ruthlessness i tell you he concluded it's nothing but a trap to catch me and if you had been fool enough to yield and to have blabbed of my presence to sylvia you would have had it proved to you she was terrified and of course convinced for she was easy of conviction believing always the last person to whom she spoke she sat down on one of the boxes that furnished that cheerless refuge of mr butler's then what's to become of ned she cried oh i had hoped that we had found a way out at last he raised himself on his elbow on the camp bed they had fitted up for him be easy now he bade her impatiently they can't do anything to ned until they find him guilty and how are they going to find him guilty when he's innocent yes but appearances fiddlesticks he answered her and the expression chosen was mere concession to her sex 
and not at all what Mr. Butler intended. Appearances can't establish guilt. Do be sensible, and remember that they will have to prove that he killed Samoval, and you can't prove a thing to be what it isn't. You can't. Are you sure? Certain sure, he replied with emphasis. Do you know that I shall have to give evidence before the court? she announced resentfully. It was an announcement that gave him pause. Thoughtfully he stroked his abominable tuft of red beard. Then he dismissed the matter with a shrug and a smile. Well, and what of it? he cried. They are not likely to bully you or cross-examine you. Just tell them what you saw from the balcony. Indeed, you can't very well say anything else, or they will see that you are lying, and then heaven alone knows what may happen to you, as well as me. She got up in a pet. You're callous, Dick, callous, she told him. Oh, I wish you had never come to me for shelter. He looked at her and sneered. That's a matter you can soon mend, he told her. Call up Terence and the others and have me shot. I promise I shall make no resistance. You see, I'm not able to resist even if I would. Oh, how can you think it? She was indignant. Well, what is a poor devil to think? You blow hot and cold all in a breath. I'm sick and ill and feverish. He continued in self-pity. And now even you find me a trouble. I wish to God they'd shoot me and make an end. I'm sure it would be best for everybody. And now she was on her knees beside him, soothing him, protesting that he had misunderstood her, that she had meant. Oh, she did not know what she had meant. She was so distressed on his account. And there's never the need to be, he assured her. Surely you can be guided by me if you want to help me. As soon as ever my leg gets well again, I'll be after fending for myself, and trouble you no further. But if you want to shelter me until then, do it thoroughly, and don't give way to fear at every shadow without substance that falls across your path. She promised it, and on that promise left him, and believing him, she bore herself more cheerfully for the remainder of the day. But that evening, after they had dined, her fears and anxieties drove her at last to seek her natural and legal protector. Sir Terence had sauntered off towards the house, gloomy and silent, as he had been throughout the meal. She ran after him now and came tripping lightly at his side, up the steps. She put her arm through his. Terence, dear, you are not going back to work again, she pleaded. He stopped, and from his fine height looked down upon her with a curious smile. Slowly he disengaged his arm from the clasp of her own. I am afraid I must, he answered coldly. I have a great deal to do, and I am short of a secretary. When this inquiry is over, I shall have more time to myself, perhaps. There was something so repellent in his voice, in his manner of uttering these last words, that she stood rebuffed and watched him vanish into the building. Then she stamped her foot, and her pretty mouth trembled. Oaf, she said aloud. End of chapter 15 Read by Peter Strom on the coast of Chile On March 2nd, 2019《Chapter Sixteen of the Snare by Raphael Sabatini. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen: The Evidence. The board of officers convened by Marshal Beresford to form the court that was to try Captain Tremaine was presided over by General Sir Harry Stapleton, who was in command of the British troops quartered in Lisbon. It included, amongst others, the adjutant-general, Sir Terence O'Moy, Colonel Fletcher of the Engineers, who had come in haste from Torres Vedras, having first desired to be included in the board chiefly on account of his friendship for Tremaine, and Major Carruthers, the judge advocate's task of conducting the case against the prisoner, was deputed to the quartermaster of Tremaine's own regiment, Major Swan. The court sat in a long, cheerless hall, once the refectory of the Franciscans, who had been the first tenants of Monsanto. It was stone-flagged, the windows set at a height of some ten feet from the ground. 
the bare whitewashed walls hung with very wooden portraits of long departed kings and princes of portugal who had been benefactors of the order the court occupied the abbot's table which was set on a shallow dais at the end of the room a table of stone with a covering of oak over which a green cloth had been spread the officers twelve in number besides the president sat with their backs to the wall immediately under the inevitable picture of the last supper the court being sworn captain tremaine was brought in by the provost marshal's guard and given a stool placed immediately before and a few paces from the table perfectly calm and imperturbable he saluted the court and sat down his guards remaining some paces behind him he had declined all offers of a friend to represent him on the grounds that the court could not possibly afford him a case to answer the president a florid rather pompous man who spoke with a faint lisp cleared his throat and read the charge against the prisoner from the sheet with which he had been supplied the charge of having violated the recent enactment against dueling made by the commander-in-chief of his majesty's forces in the peninsula in so far as he had fought a duel with count geronimo de samoval and of murder in so far as that duel conducted in an irregular manner and without any witnesses had resulted in the death of the said count geronimo de samoval how say you then captain tremaine the judge advocate challenged him are you guilty of these charges or not guilty not guilty the president sat back and observed the prisoner with an eye that was officially benign tremaine's glance considered the court and met the concerned and grave regard of his colonel of his friend carruthers and of his two other friends of his own regiment the cold indifference of three officers of the fourteenth then stationed in lisbon with whom he was unacquainted and the utter inscrutability of o'moy's rather lowering glance which profoundly intrigued him and lastly the official hostility of major swan who was on his feet setting forth the case against him of the remaining members of the court he took no heed from the opening address it did not seem to captain tremaine as if this case which had been hurriedly prepared by major swan chiefly that same morning would amount to very much briefly the major announced his intention of establishing to the satisfaction of the court how on the night of the twenty eighth of may the prisoner in flagrant violation of an enactment in a general order of the twenty sixth of that same month had engaged in a duel with count geronimo de Semival, a peer of the realm of portugal followed a short statement of the case from the point of view of the prosecution an anticipation of the evidence to be called upon which the major thought rather sanguinely opined captain tremaine to convict the accused he concluded with an assurance that the evidence of the prisoner's guilt was as nearly direct as evidence could be in a case of murder the first witness called was the butler mullins he was introduced by the sergeant major stationed by the double doors at the end of the hall from the ante-room where the witnesses commanded to be present were in waiting mullins rather less venerable than usual as a consequence of agitation and affliction on behalf of captain tremaine to whom he was attached stated nervously the facts within his knowledge he was occupied with the silver in the pantry having remained up in case sir terence who was working late in his study should require anything before going to bed sir terence called him and at what time did sir terence call you asked the major it was ten minutes past twelve sir by the clock in my pantry are you sure that the clock was right quite sure sir i had put it right that same evening very well then sir terence called you at ten minutes past twelve pray continue he gave me a letter addressed to the commissary general take that says he to the sergeant of the guard at once and tell him to be sure that it is forwarded to the commissary general first thing in the morning 
I went out at once and on the lawn in the quadrangle. I saw a man lying on his back on the grass and another man kneeling beside him. I ran across to them. It was a bright moonlight night, bright as day it was, and you could see quite clear. The gentleman that was kneeling looks up at me, and I sees it was Captain Tremaine, sir. "'What's this, Captain, dear?' says I. "'It's Count Samoval, and he's killed,' says he. "'For God's sake, go and fetch somebody.' So I ran back to tell Sir Terence, and Sir Terence he came out with me, and mighty startled he was at what he found there. "'What's happened?' says he, and the captain answers him just as he had answered me. "'It's Count Samoval, and he's killed.' "'But how did it happen?' says Sir Terence. "'Sure, and that's just what I want to know,' says the captain. "'I found him here.' "'And then Sir Terence turns to me, and Mullins,' says he, "'just fetch the guard. "'And, of course, I went at once.' "'Was there anyone else present?' "'Not in the quadrangle, sir, "'but Lady O'Moy was on the balcony of her room at the time.' "'Well, then, you fetch the guard. "'What happened when you had returned?' "'Colonel Grant arrived, sir, and I understood him to say that he had been following Count Samoval.' "'Which way did Colonel Grant come?' put in the President. "'By the gate from the terrace.' "'Was it open?' "'No, sir. Sir Terence himself went to open the wicket when Colonel Grant knocked.' Sir Harry nodded, and Major Swan resumed the examination. "'What happened next?' Sir Terence ordered the captain under arrest. Did Captain Tremaine submit at once? Well, not quite at once, sir. He naturally made some bother. Good God, he says, you'll never be after thinking I killed him. I tell you, I just found him here like this. What were you doing here then, says Sir Terence? I was coming to see you, says the captain. What about, says Sir Terence? and with that the captain got angry and he refused to be cross-questioned and went off to report himself under arrest as he was bid that closed the butler's evidence and the judge advocate looked across at the prisoner have you any questions for the witness he inquired none replied captain tremaine he has given his evidence very faithfully and accurately Major Swan invited the court to question the witness in any manner it considered desirable. The only one to avail himself of the invitation was Carruthers, who, out of his friendship and concern for Tremaine, and a conviction of Tremaine's innocence, begotten chiefly by that friendship, desired to bring out anything that might tell in his favor. What was Captain Tremaine's bearing when he spoke to you and to Sir Terence? quite as usual sir he was quite calm and not at all perturbed devil a bit not until sir terence ordered him under arrest and then he was a little hot thank you mullins dismissed by the court mullins would have departed but that upon being told by the sergeant major that he was at liberty to remain if he chose he found a seat on one of the benches ranged against the wall the next witness was Sir Terence, who gave his evidence quietly from his place at the board immediately on the President's right. He was pale, but otherwise composed, and the first part of his evidence was no more than a confirmation of what Mullins had said, an exact and strictly truthful statement of the circumstances as he had witnessed them from the moment when Mullins had summoned him. "'You were present, I believe, Sir Terence,' said Major Swan at an altercation that arose on the previous day between Captain Tremaine and the deceased? Yes, it happened at lunch here at Monsanto. What was the nature of it? Count Samoval permitted himself to criticize adversely Lord Wellington's enactment against dueling, and Captain Tremaine defended it. They became a little heated, and the fact was mentioned that Samoval himself was a famous swordsman. Captain Tremaine made the remark that famous swordsmen were required by Count Samoval's country to save it from invasion. The remark was offensive to the deceased, and although the subject was abandoned out of regard for the ladies present, 
It was abandoned on a threat from Count Simoval to continue it later. Was it continued? Of that I have no knowledge. Invited to cross-examine the witness, Captain Tremaine again declined, admitting freely that all that Sir Terence had said was strictly true. Then Carothers, who appeared to be intent to act as the prisoner's friend, took up the examination of his chief. It is, of course, admitted that Captain Tremaine enjoyed free access to Monsanto, practically at all hours, in his capacity as your military secretary. Sir Terence? Admitted, said Sir Terence. And it is therefore possible that he might have come upon the body of the deceased, just as Mullins came upon it? It is possible, certainly. The evidence to come will no doubt determine whether it is in tenable opinion. Admitting this, then, the attitude in which Captain Tremaine was discovered would be a perfectly natural one. It would be natural that he should investigate the identity and hurt of the man he found there. Certainly. But it would hardly be natural that he should linger by the body of a man that he had himself slain, thereby incurring the risk of being discovered. That is a question for the court rather than for me. Thank you, Sir Terence. And as no one else desired to question him, Sir Terence resumed his seat, and Lady O'Moy was called. She came in very white and trembling, accompanied by Miss Armitage, whose admittance was suffered by the court, since she would not be called upon to give evidence. One of the officers of the 14th, seated on the extreme right of the table, made gallant haste to set a chair for her ladyship, which she accepted gratefully. The oath administered, she was invited gently by Major Swan to tell the court what she knew of the case before them. But, but I know nothing, she faltered in evident distress, and Sir Terence, his elbow leaning on the table, covered his mouth with his hand, that its movements might not betray him. His eyes glowered upon her with a ferocity that was hardly dissembled. If you will take the trouble to tell the court what you saw from your balcony, the major insisted, the court will be grateful. Perceiving her agitation, and attributing it to nervousness, moved also by that delicate loveliness of hers, and by deference to the adjutant general's lady, Sir Harry Stapleton intervened. Is Lady O'Moy's evidence really necessary? he asked. Does it contribute any fresh fact regarding the discovery of the body? No, sir, Major Swan admitted. It is merely a corroboration of what we have already heard from Mullins and Sir Terence. Then why unnecessarily distress the lady? Oh, for my own part, the prosecutor was submitting when Sir Terence cut in. I think that in the prisoner's interest, perhaps Lady O'Moy will not mind being distressed a little. It was at her he looked, and for her and Tremaine alone that he intended the cutting lash of sarcasm concealed from the rest of the court by his smooth accent. Mullins has said, I think, that her ladyship was on the balcony when he came into the quadrangle. Her evidence, therefore, takes us further back in point of time than does Mullins. Again the sarcastic double meaning was only for those two. Considering that the prisoner is being tried for his life, I do not think we should miss anything that may however slightly, affect our judgment. Sir Terence is right, I think, sir, the judge advocate supported. Very well, then, said the president. Proceed, if you please. Will you be good enough to tell the court, Lady O'Moy, how you came to be upon the balcony? Her pallor had deepened, and her eyes looked more than ordinarily large and childlike as they turned this way and that to survey the members of the court. Nervously, she dabbed her lips with a handkerchief before answering mechanically as she had been schooled. I heard a cry, and I ran out. You were in bed at the time, of course, quoth her husband, interrupting. What on earth has that to do with it, Sir Terence? The president rebuked him out of his earnest desire to cut this examination as short as possible. The question, sir, does not seem to me to be without point, replied O'Moy. He was judicially smooth and self-contained. It is intended to enable us 
to form an opinion as to the lapse of time between her ladyship's hearing the cry and reaching the balcony grudgingly the president admitted the point and the question was repeated yes came lady o'moy's tremulous faltering answer i was in bed but not asleep or were you asleep rapped o'moy again and in answer to the president's impatient glance again explained himself we should know whether perhaps the cry might not have been repeated several times before her ladyships heard it that is of value it would be more regular ventured the judge advocate if sir terence would reserve his examination of the witness until she has given her evidence very well grumbled sir terence and he sat back foiled for the moment in his deliberate intent to torture her into admissions that must betray her if made i was not asleep she told the court thus answering her husband's last question i heard a cry and ran to the balcony at once that that is all but what did you see from the balcony asked major swan it was dark and of course it it was dark she answered surely not dark lady o'moy there was a moon i think a full moon yes but but there was a good deal of shadow in the garden and i couldn't see anything at first but you did eventually oh eventually yes eventually her fingers were twisting and untwisting the handkerchief they held and her distressed loveliness was very piteous to see yet it seems to have occurred to none of them that this distress and the minor contradictions into which it led her were the result of her intent to conceal the truth of her terror lest it should nevertheless be wrung from her only o'moy watching her and reading into her every word and glance and gesture the signs of her falsehood knew the hideous thing she strove to hide even it seemed at the cost of her lover's life to his lacerated soul her torture was balm gloating he watched her then and watched her lover marvelling at the blackguard's complete self-mastery and impassivity even now major swan was urging her gently eventually then what was it you saw i saw a man lying on the ground and another kneeling over him and then almost at once mullins came out and i don't think we need to take this any further major swan the president again interposed we have heard what happened after mullins came out unless the prisoner wishes began the judge advocate by no means said tremaine composedly although outwardly impassive he had been watching her intently and it was his eyes that had perturbed her more than anything in that court it was she who must determine for him how to proceed how far to defend himself he had hoped that by now dick butler might have been got away so that it would have been safe to tell the whole truth although he began to doubt how far that could avail him how far indeed it would be believed in the absence of dick butler her evidence told him that such hopes as he may have entertained had been idle and that he must depend for his life simply upon the court's inability to bring the guilt home to him in this he had some confidence for knowing himself innocent it seemed to him incredible that he could be proven guilty failing that nothing short of the discovery of the real slayer of samoval could save him and that was a matter wrapped in the profoundest mystery the only man who could conceivably have fought samoval in such a place was sir terence himself but then it was utterly inconceivable that in that case sir terence who was the very soul of honour should not only keep silent and allow another man to suffer but actually sit here in judgment upon that other and besides there was no quarrel nor ever had been between sir terence and samoval there is major swan was saying just one other matter upon which i should like to question lady o'moy and thereupon he proceeded to do so your ladyship will remember that on the day before the event in which count samoval met his death he was one of a small luncheon party at your house here in monsanto yes she replied wondering fearfully what might be coming now would your ladyship be good enough to tell the court who were the other members of that party it it was hardly a party sir 
she answered with her unconquerable insistence upon trifles. "'You were just Sir Terence and myself, Miss Armitage, Count Samoval, Colonel Grant, Major Carruthers, and Captain Tremaine.' "'Can your ladyship recall any words that passed between the deceased and Captain Tremaine on that occasion? Words of disagreement, I mean.' She knew that there had been something, but in her benumbed state of mind she was incapable of remembering what it was. All that remained in her memory was Sylvia's warning after she and her cousin had left the table. Sylvia's insistence that she should call Captain Tremaine away to avoid trouble between himself and the Count. But search as she would, the actual subject of disagreement eluded her. Moreover, it occurred to her suddenly, and sowed fresh terror in her soul, that whatever it was, it would tell against Captain Tremaine. "'I am afraid I don't remember,' she faltered at last. "'Try to think, Lady O'Moy.' "'I I have tried, but I, I can't.' Her voice had fallen almost to a whisper. "'Need we insist?' put in the President compassionately. "'There were sufficient witnesses as to what passed on that occasion without further harassing her ladyship.' "'Quite so, sir,' the Major agreed in his dry voice. "'It only remains for the prisoner to question the witness if he so wishes.' Tremaine shook his head. It is quite unnecessary, sir, he assured the president, and never saw the swift, grim smile that flashed across Sir Terence's stern face. Of the court, Sir Terence was the only member who could have desired to prolong the painful examination of her ladyship. But he perceived from the president's attitude that he could not do so without betraying the vindictiveness actuating him, and so he remained silent for the president. He would have gone so far as to suggest that her ladyship should be invited to remain in court against the possibility of further evidence being presently required from her, but that he perceived there was no necessity to do so. Her deadly anxiety concerning the prisoner must in itself be sufficient to determine her to remain, as indeed it proved, accompanied and half supported by Miss Armitage, who was almost as pale as herself, but otherwise very steady in her bearing. Lady O'Moy made her way with faltering steps to the benches ranged against the sidewall, and sat there to hear the remainder of the proceedings. After the uninteresting and perfunctory evidence of the sergeant of the guard, who had been present when the prisoner was ordered under arrest, the next witness called was Colonel Grant. His testimony was strictly in accordance with the facts, which we know him to have witnessed. But when he was in the middle of his statement, an interruption occurred. At the extreme right of the dais on which the table stood, there was a small oaken door set in the wall, and giving access to a small anteroom that was known, rightly or wrongly, as the abbot's chamber. That anteroom communicated directly with what was now the guard room, which accounts for the newcomer being ushered in that way by the corporal at the time. At the opening of that door, the members of the court looked around in sharp annoyance suspecting here some impertinent intrusion. The next moment, however, this was changed to respectful surprise. There was a scraping of chairs, and they were all on their feet in token of respect for the slight man in the grey undress frock who entered. It was Lord Wellington. Saluting the members of the court with two fingers to his cocked hat, he immediately desired them to sit, peremptorily waving his hand, and requesting the president not to allow his entrance to interrupt or interfere with the course of the inquiry. "'A chair for me, if you please, sergeant,' he called, and when it was fetched, took his seat at the end of the table, with his back to the door through which he had come, and immediately facing the prosecutor. He retained his hat, but placed his riding crop on the table before him, and the only thing he would accept was an officer's notes of the proceedings, as far as they had gone which that officer himself was prompt to offer. With a repeated injunction to the court to proceed, Lord Wellington became instantly absorbed in the study of these notes. Colonel Grant, standing very straight and stiff in the originally red coat, which exposure to many weathers had faded to an autumnal brown, continued and concluded his statement of what he had seen and heard on the night of the 28th of May in the garden of Monsanto. 
The judge advocate now invited him to turn his memory back to the luncheon party at Sir Terence's on the 27th, and to tell the court of the altercation that had passed on that occasion between Captain Tremaine and Count Samoval. The conversation at table, he replied, turned, as it was perhaps quite natural, upon the recently published general order prohibiting dueling and making it a capital offense for officers in his majesty's service in the peninsula. Count Samoval stigmatized the order as a degrading and arbitrary one, and spoke in defense of single combat as the only honorable method of settling differences between gentlemen. Captain Tremaine dissented rather sharply and appeared to resent the term degrading applied by the Count to the enactment. Words followed, and then someone, Lady O'Moy, I think, and as I imagine with intent to soothe the feelings of Count Samoval, which appeared to be ruffled, appealed to his vanity by mentioning the fact that he was himself a famous swordsman. To this Captain Tremaine's observation was a rather unfortunate one, although I must confess that I was fully in sympathy with it at the time. He said, as nearly as I remember, that at the moment Portugal was in urgent need of famous swords to defend her from invasion, and not to increase the disorders at home. Lord Wellington looked up from the notes and thoughtfully stroked his high-bridged nose. His stern, handsome face was coldly impassive. His fine eyes rested upon the prisoner, but his attention all to what Colonel Grant was saying. It was a remark of which Samuel betrayed the bitterest resentment. He demanded of Captain Tremaine that he should be more precise, and Tremaine replied that whilst he had spoken generally, Samuel was welcome to the cap if he found it fitted him. To that he added a suggestion that, as the conversation appeared to be tiresome to the ladies, it would be better to change its topic. Count Samoval consented, but with the promise rather threateningly delivered that it should be continued at another time. That, sir, is all, I think. Have you any questions for the witness, Captain Tremaine? inquired the judge advocate. As before, Captain Tremaine's answer was in the negative, coupled with the now usual admission that Colonel Grant's statement accorded perfectly with his own recollection of the facts. The court, however, desired enlightenment on several subjects. Came, first of all, Carruthers' inquiries as to the bearing of the prisoner when ordered under arrest, eliciting from Colonel Grant a variant of the usual reply. It was not inconsistent with innocence, he said. It was an answer which appeared to startle the court, and perhaps Carruthers would have acted best in Tremaine's interest had he left the question there but having obtained so much, he eagerly sought for more. "'Would you say that it was inconsistent with guilt?' he cried. Colonel Grant smiled slowly, and slowly shook his head. "'I fear I would not go so far as that,' he answered, thereby plunging poor Carruthers into despair. And now Colonel Fletcher voiced a question agitating the minds of several members of the court. "'Colonel Grant,' he said, you have told us that on the night in question you had Count Samoval under observation, and that upon word being brought to you of his movements by one of your agents, you yourself followed him to Monsanto. Would you be good enough to tell the court why you were watching the deceased movements at the time? Colonel Grant glanced at Lord Wellington. He smiled a little reflectively and shook his head. I am afraid that the public interest will not allow me to answer your question. Since, however, Lord Wellington himself is present, I would suggest that you ask his lordship whether I am to give you the information you require. Certainly not, his lordship crisply, without waiting further question. Indeed, one of my reasons for being present is to ensure that nothing on that score shall transpire. There followed a moment's silence. Then the president ventured a question. May we ask, sir, at least, whether Colonel Grant's observation of Count Samoval resulted from any knowledge of, or expectation of, this duel was impending? Certainly you may ask that, Lord Wellington consented. It did not, sir, said Colonel Grant in answer to the question. What grounds had you, Colonel Grant, for assuming that Count Samoval was going to Monsanto? the president asked. Chiefly the direction taken. 
and nothing else. I think we are upon forbidden ground again, said Colonel Grant, and again he looked at Lord Wellington for direction. I do not see the point of the question, said Lord Wellington, replying to that glance. Colonel Grant has quite plainly informed the court that his observation of Count Samoval had no slightest connection with this duel, nor was inspired by any knowledge or suspicion on his part that any such duel was to be fought. With that I think the court should be content. It has been necessary for Colonel Grant to explain to the court his own presence at Monsanto at midnight on the 28th. It would have been better, perhaps, had he simply stated that it was fortuitous, although I can understand that the court might have hesitated to accept such a statement. That, however, is really all that concerns the matter. Colonel Grant happened to be there. That is all that the court need remember. Let me add the assurance that it would not in the least assist the court to know more, so far as the case under consideration is concerned. In view of that, the President notified that he had nothing further to ask the witness, and Colonel Grant saluted and withdrew to a seat near Lady O'Moy. There followed the evidence of Major Carruthers with regard to the dispute between Count Samoval and Captain Tremaine, which substantially bore out what Sir Terence and Colonel Grant had already said, notwithstanding that it manifested a strong bias in favor of the prisoner. The conversation which Samoval threatened to resume does not appear to have been resumed, he added in conclusion. How can you say that? Major Swan asked him. I state my opinion, sir, flashed Carruthers, his chubby face reddening. Indeed, sir, you may not, the President assured him. You are upon oath to give evidence of facts directly within your own personal knowledge. It is directly within my own personal knowledge that Captain Tremaine was called away from the table by Lady O'Moy, and that he did not have another opportunity of speaking with Count Samoval that day. I saw the Count leave shortly after, and at the time Captain Tremaine was still with her ladyship, as her ladyship can testify if necessary. He spent the remainder of the afternoon with me at work, and we went home together in the evening. We share the same lodging in Alcantara. There was still all the next day, said Sir Harry. Do you say that the prisoner was never out of your sight on that day, too? I do not, but I can't believe. I am afraid you are going to state opinions again, Major Swan interposed. It is evidence of a kind, insisted Carruthers with the tenacity of a bulldog. He looked as if he would make it a personal matter between himself and Major Swan if he were not allowed to proceed. I can't believe that Captain Tremaine would have embroiled himself further with Count Samoval. Captain Tremaine has too high a regard for discipline and for orders, and he is the least excitable man I have ever known. Nor do I believe that he would have consented to meet Samoval without my knowledge. Not perhaps unless Captain Tremaine desired to keep the matter secret in view of the general order, which is precisely what it is contended that he did. Falsely contended, then snapped Major Carruthers, to be instantly rebuked by the President. He sat down in a huff, and the judge advocate called Private Bates, who had been on sentry duty on the night of the 28th, to corroborate the evidence of the sergeant of the guard as to the hour at which the prisoner had driven up to Monsanto in his curricle. Private Bates having been heard, Major Swan announced that he did not propose to call any further witnesses, and resumed his seat. Thereupon, to the President's invitation, Captain Tremaine replied that he had no witnesses to call at all. "'In that case, Major Swan,' said Sir Harry, "'the court will be glad to hear you further.' And Major Swan came to his feet, again to address the court for the prosecution. End of chapter 16, read by Peter Strom, on the coast of Chile, on March 3, 2019.